States for the past several years. Witnesses include Mark Richard, the Deputy Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division, William Fahey, an Assistant U.S. Attorney and Chief of the Public Corruption and Government Fraud Section, and a former employee at the Northrop Corporation. Thanks, Joe. Subcommittee will come to order. This subcommittee has been investigating the activities of Northrop Corporation for over three years. During that time, the subcommittee has cataloged a list of misfeasance, malfeasance, and nonfeasance that staggers the imagination. The subcommittee has examined falsification of tests on the MX guidance system, the nuclear armed air launch cruise missile, the avionics of the Harrier aircraft, allegation of bribes in connection with the attempted sale of, of, of F-20 aircraft in Korea, and violation of a court-ordered SEC consent agreement by the chairman of the board of Northrop involving, amongst other things, questions of foreign bribes, falsification of cost, and schedule data on the B-2 stealth bomber program, falsification of tests on the electronics on the B-2 bombers, and Northrop's cheating the Customs Service when it managed and liquidated property seized by that service. The Northrop Corporation is currently the target of federal grand jury criminal investigations coast to coast, including ones in Honolulu, Hawaii, Macon, Georgia, Chicago, Illinois, Beaumont, Texas, Alexandria, Virginia, and a series of separate investigations by a Los Angeles grand jury. It has pled guilty to 34 counts of falsifications of tests on the nuclear-armed air launch cruise missile and the Harrier aircraft, and paid a $17 million criminal fine. The falsifications of the ALCM testing is so serious that three years after discovery, Neither the Justice Department nor Air Force internal documents offer any hope that the missile will work in combat. On March 13 of 1990, the United States Attorney General in Los Angeles wrote to the Air Force suspension and debarment official on Northrop and stated as follows, we are not aware of a more significant prosecution. This is the first time we are aware of in which a major defense contractor has been convicted of failing to conduct critical tests on a nuclear weapon system. If any case cries out for de debarment, this is the case. If ever the American people deserve to be protected from the type of reckless and potentially life-threatening conduct, this is it." End of quote. Northrop appears to be engaged in a continuing criminal enterprise of long standing. It is not clear why the Department of Justice has not viewed the company's behavior for what it is and charged it with violating RICO, the federal anti-racketeering law. In terms of continuing criminal enterprise, the abuses started at the very top. Mr. Thomas V. Jones, chairman of the board of Northrop, is a convicted felon who is admitted to such things as money laundering, illegal campaign contributions, providing hush money for Watergate burglars, perjury before a grand jury, and subordinating the testament, testimony of subordinates, as well as foreign bribery. Mr. Jones was invited to testify today, but he refused on grounds that one of his several attorneys in Africa. This is the fourth time that Mr. Jones has refused to testify before this subcommittee. In the past, he has claimed surgery on the day of the hearing, simply did not show up when he and the entire executive committee of the board of directors was invited to testimony, and on a third occasion submitted an affidavit to the subcommittee indicating that he would assert his Fifth Amendment rights to all questions. The new chief executive officer of Northrop, Mr. Kent Cressa, has refused to appear today claiming serious schedule conflicts. Despite its extraordinary record of fraud and incompetence in Pentagon contracting, what has happened to Northrop? It has flourished. In 1980, Northrop was a $1.6 billion corporation. By 1987, Northrop was a $6 billion corporation. During the years of the Reagan buildup, Northrop received over $35 billion in Pentagon contracts. Northrop uh, is currently building the nation's most expensive weapon system, indeed probably the most expensive weapon system in the history of mankind, the B-2 stealth bomber. It is now in competition for the most expensive contract of the 1990s, the Air Force's advanced tactical fighter. Over 92 percent of the income of the Northrop Corporation comes from U.S. taxpayers. Why is the U.S. government still doing business with Northrop? That's an interesting question. 
We hope the Department of Justice and the Pentagon can shed some light on that matter today. To protect the government's interest in the face of illegal or improper behavior by a defense contractor, the government can suspend or debar a company from future government business. This power is exercised constantly against small companies, but has almost never been exercised against major defense contractors. In 1988, several Northrop officials were indicted for falsifying the tests on the guidance system of the nuclear-armed air launch cruise missile. The Air Force, as required by government regulations, suspended a small division of Northrop involved in the falsification, but left the rest of the company to continue business as usual with the Pentagon, despite over a dozen ongoing criminal grand jury investigations of other divisions of Northrop. So many similar activities uh, were involved, including falsification on the tests on the B-2. Despite warnings from the Department of Justice, both the Navy and the Air Force, between the indictment and the trial, lowered the specifications for the falsified guidance systems that were the subject of the criminal grand jury investigation. In effect, allowing Northrop to meet the specifications by painting the target around the bullet hole. These actions literally tore the guts out of the government's prosecutor's case against Northrop. Immediately after Northrop pled guilty to 34 counts of falsification of tests on the air launch cruise missile and the Harrier, the Air Force lifted the suspension of even the small Northrop division. Justice, on the other hand, is strongly recommending debarment of the entire corporation. In a series of strong letters to the Air Force Suspension and Debarment Board in the spring and early summer of 1990, the Justice Department prosecutors were extraordinarily critical of the Air Force attempt to minimize the criminal behavior of the Northrop Corporation. The prosecutors provided evidence that Northrop was not a presently responsible corporation and clearly exhibited no, res no remorse for any of its criminal activity. It is clear from the correspondence that the Air Force Suspension and Debarment Board knew little, if anything, about Northrop's behavior during the grand jury investigations. The widespread criminal behavior within Northrop, the seriousness of the AC ALCM and Harrier cases, and the ongoing Department of Justice criminal investigations, which were revealing continuing and similar behavior on the part of Northrop, including falsification of testing on the B-2 program. The Air Force made no attempt to meet with the prosecutors, review the findings, to understand the extent of criminal behavior in the company, or to attempt to get access to the grand jury material developed over its two-year investigation. Under constant prodding by the Defense Department, or rather by the Justice Department prosecutors, the correspondence indicates that the Air Force Suspension and Debarment Board may be finally going to go to Los Angeles to meet with the prosecutors to review the evidence and get an understanding of the facts. The acquiescence of the military in a number of these Northrop fraud cases, withholding evidence from prosecutors by the Air Force, and granting of waivers of specifications in the middle of criminal prosecutions are inexcusable. The Air Force Suspension and Debarment Board's attempt to lift the suspension of Northrop quickly in the face of a serious conviction on a major nuclear weapon system is just another attempt by the Pentagon to coddle its favored contractors. The committee will inquire into these and other matters today, and the chair recognizes my good friend, the senior Republican member of this committee, Mr. Bliley of Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today, the subcommittee will hear testimony about problems with the Northrop Corporation. This hearing, as you have pointed out, Mr. Chairman, is not our first hearing involving Northrop. On October 28, 1987, the subcommittee investigated the problems that Northrop experienced trying to mass produce inertial measurement units for MX missiles. Again, on September 28, 1988, the subcommittee investigated allegations that Northrop had violated the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in its attempted sale of F-20 fighters to South Korea. So Northrop is no stranger to this subcommittee. Though I dare say that we have enjoyed their appearance before us more than they have. Today, however, Northrop has declined the subcommittee's invitation to appear before us. To put it as mildly as I may, I find it disappointing for a company like Northrop, which has received over 36 billion taxpayers' dollars since 1980, to decline the invitation of the subcommittee to testify. The declination of Kent Kresser, Northrop's president and chief executive officer, actually states quite clearly why Northrop ought to be here. In a letter dated July 19, 1990, Mr. Kresser stated that he would not attend 
without a, quote, refinement or narrowing of the issues, unquote, or a, quote, clarification process, unquote. I, too, wish that we could clarify, refine, and narrow issues. But with Northrop, where does one begin? Shall we focus on Northrop's mismanagement of the cost schedule control system in its B-2 bomber program? Shall we focus on Northrop's guilty plea to 34 counts of making false statement to the government in its manufacture of crucial components for the Harrier jet fighter or the air launch cruise missile? Shall we examine Northrop's latest setback in its effort to establish that the uncontrolled transfer of $6.25 million to the Hong Kong branch of a Korean bank was an investment to build a hotel and not part of a scheme to bribe Korean officials to buy F-20 fighter planes? I, too, wish we could refine, narrow, and clarify those issues. But I suggest that clarification Refinement and narrowing could be more expeditiously carried out if Northrop was here. Before closing, I want to call the subcommittee's attention to the fact that over four years ago, Chairman Dingell became concerned that the special access programs of the Department of Defense were not being properly overseen or audited. At the time, the Pentagon assured us that those programs, if anything, were the best managed programs in the Department. Yet the Department of Justice declination memo in the False Claims Act lawsuit brought by several Northrop ex-employees states that Air Force surveillance has been virtually non-existent in the case of the B-2 bomber. It is now clear that you, Mr. Chairman, were right and that the Department of Defense was wrong in characterizing the oversight of this special access program. And I ask unanimous consent that your letter of January 16, 1986, be made a part of the record of this hearing. Without a, objection, so ordered. A prophet may be without honor in his own country, but he ought not be without honor in his own subcommittee. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, <laughs> I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today and continuing to pursue this matter vigorously. And I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for extending the invitation to our colleague from Connecticut, uh, Mr. Shays, to sit with us on this, ma on this matter, and I, too, would like to welcome him to the subcommittee this morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sure, thanks, my good friend. The uh, chair recognizes now the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Bratt. I have no statement. Chair recognizes the gentleman from uh, Minnesota, Mr. Skorsky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just briefly, I want to associate myself with uh, your comments and those of uh, Mr. Bliley of Virginia. Uh, it, it's clear from the, uh, the facts that are before us, not the opinions, the facts before us, that the uh, uh, debarment of Northrop is reasonable, it's responsible, in fact, required. The falsification of tests alone, putting American servicemen and women in jeopardy, and the American public in jeopardy. We got falsification of tests on the Harrier aircraft, on the uh, on the uh, uh, nuclear armed air launch cruise missile and on the B-2 bomber both affect the servicemen and women who are in the field and the American public in, in, uh, in times of nuclear crisis. I think it's beyond uh, debarment. I think it's appropriate to embrace the stricter criminal penalties for defense contractors, especially who falsify tests. We have a lot of people in Congress who love to talk about the death penalty, especially when it affects people who are poor and people of color. But when it comes to white-collar criminals in white country clubs who pose for contributions to charity with the checks at hand, but then involve themselves in criminal conduct of the nature that actually jeopardizes the lives of American servicemen and women, they, they are all, all of a sudden uh, silent. And finally, I think it's appropriate that we look at expansion of RICO, uh, the use of RICO for people who work for the federal government in the Air Force who close their eyes to this kind of repeated, callous criminal behavior. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, uh 
Mr. Shea, the, uh, it is not the regular practice of the committee, but do you have brief comments? No, I don't. Just to time? thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to be here today. Thank you, sir. Well, we uh, we're aware of your very real interest in these matters, and we thank you for being present with us today. Our first panel is a panel composed of Mr. Mark M. Richard, Deputy Assistant Attorney General, Criminal Division, U.S. Department of Justice. Mr. William F. Fahey, Assistant United States Attorney, Chief for the Public Corruption and Government Fraud Section, Central District of California. Gentlemen, you have come here uh, at considerable inconvenience to yourself, and we thank you for your assistance to the committee. Uh, you are aware of the practices of this committee, which uh, require that all witnesses testify under oath. This goes back on to the days of Sam Rayburn when he first set this committee up in 1958. Do you have any objection to so doing? No, sir. Gentlemen, it is, as you know, your rights when you appear before a committee under oath to be advised by counsel. If you so desire, um, it, it is the committee's duty to see, see to it that you can do so. Do you desire to be represented or advised by counsel? No, sir. Gentlemen, the, uh, for your information, to inform you of the rules of the committee, the House and the subcommittee, as well as your rights and the limitations on the powers of the committee thereunder, there are copies of the rules of those three bodies available to you there at the committee table. If you have no objection then, gentlemen, to testifying under oath, would you please each rise and raise your right hand. Gentlemen, do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? I do. Gentlemen, you may consider yourself recognized. We will receive your testimony in such order as you deem appropriate. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. My name is Mark Richard. I'm a Deputy Assistant Attorney General with the Criminal Division, Department of Justice. I've been with the Department some 23 years now. I was formerly head of the Fraud Section of the Criminal Division. And I now, as Deputy Assistant Attorney General, up until last week, had supervisory responsibility over our Fraud Section, including our Defense Procurement uh, unit within that section. On my left is Mr. William Fahey, who is Chief of the Government Fraud and Public Corruption um, Unit within the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Central District of California, and has been with the Department as a prosecutor for the last 10 years. Mr. Chairman, with your permission, uh, I would uh, uh, submit my complete statement for the record and merely summarize it uh, at this time. That would be appropriate without objection, so order. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to appear here today to discuss the recent conviction of the Northrop Corporation by the Department of Justice, as well as our recent experiences in defense procurement fraud investigations. As members of the subcommittee are aware, combating defense procurement fraud is one of the top priorities of the Department and has been so for some time. Our efforts in recent years have been very successful, working closely with the Department of Defense and its various investigative components, including and especially the Inspector General's Office. The Department has successfully prosecuted a wide range of procurement fraud cases, many of which involve some of the largest and most prominent defense contractors. The Department's priorities in this area include bribery and corruption, defective products, mischarging, and defective pricing. Between 1988 and the first half of 1990, 23 of the top 100 DOD contractors have been convicted of defrauding the United States, and some more than once. The fiscal year 1988 and 1989, total civil fraud recoveries rose from $176 million to $225 million. Procurement fraud, specifically cases involving defective pricing and cost mischarging, represented the largest proportion of these recoveries. Our successes in prosecuting criminal offenses are just one manner in which the Department combats defense contractor fraud. There are two other methods by which the Department seeks to protect the taxpayer from unscrupulous defense contractors. One is the vigorous use of civil prosecutions brought pursuant to the False Claims <laughs> Act. The other is to support debarment of defense administrative inquiries, which can result in the suspension or debarment of defense contractors and their employees. Now with respect to the Northrop investigation. 
And as you indicated, Mr. Chairman, uh, in your opening statement, there are outstanding inquiries which are still open, standing, outstanding proceedings, and our ability to go into those outstanding matters at this time, as I'm sure the committee appreciates, is uh, limited. Nevertheless, we have uh, committed ourselves to working with the, the uh, committee uh, in dealing with these very serious issues. We will respect your concerns in that, Mr. Richard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Northrop investigation uh, in the Central District of California began in early 1987. And in that year, a test technician employed by the Northrop factory near Los Angeles contacted the Air Force Office of Special Investigations. And he reported, essentially, that he was working on the nuclear air launch cruise missile as well as the Harrier jet project. And then in connection with these programs, uh, cheating on important tests on components for these uh, programs was in fact occurring. The department's investigation under the direction of Mr. Fahey and his colleagues determined that hundreds of guidance units called flight and data transmitters for the cruise missile had improper testing and that Northrop had, in fact, generated hundreds of false reports. Similarly, on the much smaller Harrier jet program, dozens of units had been improperly tested and the results covered up by Northrop employees. I want to emphasize the complexity and difficulty of investigating these uh, allegations. And over the period of approximately two years of the inquiry on the cruise missile and Harrier jet uh, programs only, the government subpoenaed several hundred thousand documents and interviewed and called before the grand jury over 50 witnesses. The first indictment was obtained in April of 89 and was subsequently superseded in June of that year. The indictments that were returned only related to the Air Force Air Launch Cruise Missile and the Navy Harrier Jet. They did not deal with the MX missile, the B-2 bomber, or any other weapons system. There were essentially two different parts to the indictment which pertain to the air launch cruise missile. The first part involved false testing and false reports generated by Northrop's California factory. The second part involved a decision by the Northrop employees in Massachusetts to use the wrong damping fluid in the gyroscopes which went into the missile. These came to be known as the cold temperature allegations. As to these charges, the evidence showed that at least since 1983, and probably before that time, Northrop knew it was using the wrong fluid in the gyros. Even though Northrop knew these gyros had to function at temperatures as low as minus 65 degrees, it decided to use a damping fluid that they could not guarantee at temperatures below minus 40. Northrop confirmed these conclusions in 82, 83, and 87, but did not disclose the findings to the Air Force or to Boeing, the prime contractor. It was not until 1988 in June, after our investigation was approximately one year old, that Northrop did in fact concede it was using the wrong fluid. They of course sought to minimize this and ultimately came up with a theory which in essence suggested that Northrop had in fact permitted, was permitted to test its gyros after it had first cold soaked them at minus 65 degrees and then warmed them up for an unspecified period of time. As a result, Northrop began to seek formal and informal waivers of the minus 65 degree requirement on both the Air Force Alcom program and the Navy Harrier jet programs. By threatening to hold up delivery on parts for the Harrier jet, Northrop was successful in persuading the Navy to modify the contract so that the Northrop gyros had only to be guaranteed down to minus 40 degrees. And the Navy agreed to this change without demanding, seeking, or obtaining any consideration and without notice to our ongoing investigation. I should note, however, in addition and in a similar fashion, the Navy had modified the test requirements on the Harrier jet vibration testing so that Northrop could pass those tests. That test required that the stabilization package manufactured by Northrop should be vibrated to 32 Gs, and Northrop's equipment, however, could only accomplish about one half that level. 
Northrop performed the test at one half the level, but prepared documents for, which falsely said the correct level had, in fact, been achieved. After our investigation uncovered this pro uh, problem, Northrop sought to have the specification changed to the lower level. The prime contractor on the jet, McDonnell Douglas, was willing to go along. They wanted Northrop's part. parts, but the U.S. Navy also went along and improved the change in the specification to 12 Gs, again without consideration. Ironically, Northrop was even unable to pass at this lowered level. Finally, ultimately, they were able to pass the test as so determined at the reduced level. I must confess that during our investigation and as a result of these successful attempts to modify contract requirements, our inquiry was severely and negatively impacted. Northrop's efforts to obtain these waivers continued even after it was indicted. In the summer of 1989, a Northrop contract administrator approached the Defense Electronic Supply Center in Ohio uh, in connection with another Air Force program. And they asked that its cold temperature theory, previously indicated, be in fact adopted. The Defense uh, Electronic Supply Center contacted an Air Force engineer at Robbins Air Force Base in Georgia and was able to, in fact, secure this engineer's written approval for the Northrop theory. This theory was then approved in turn by the Defense Electronic Supply Center. Once more, this interpretation was a severe blow to our cold temperature theory of prosecution. And once more, the Department of Justice learned of it after, in fact, was done and completed. This pattern of formal and informal waivers encountered during the course of this investigation, as well as the last-minute disclosure of a witness who claimed that Boeing and Northrop had a side agreement that the missiles would be heated up before they would be launched, caused us ultimately to reevaluate re the likelihood of success at trial on the cold temperature issues of the indictment. After four days of jury selection, we were nevertheless prepared to proceed with the prosecution at which time Northrop expressed a willingness to discuss a plea of guilty and an admission of culpability. As the negotiations continued, it became obvious that Northrop was concerned about several other pending investigations that they were aware of, and they were interested in resolving those as well. I should state that since the mid-1980s, uh, since mid-1987, Several other allegations of, of, against Northrop had, in fact, arisen. These allegations concerned Northrop's involvement in ma manufacturing parts for the MX missile, the F-18, and the B-2 bomber. Each of these allegations was thoroughly investigated by the task force under Mr. Fahey's direction. And ultimately, each of these separate investigations were reviewed and analyzed by experienced agents and prosecutors and resulted in one of three determinations. First, some of the allegations had, in fact, come to us so late that the statute of limitations had already run. Second, some of the allegations, while within the limitation period, had no evidence of criminal fraud. Finally, some of the allegations had an indicia of criminal fraud and warranted further criminal investigation. Those allegations have been and continue to be vigorously pursued by us. And we advised Northrop that we would not pursue criminally those cases as to which the statute of limitations had run and those that we had found insufficient evidence of criminal fraud. However, we further advised the presiding judge in Northrop that as to certain other allegations, we intended to pursue a complete and thorough criminal investigation. And we further advised the judge, as well as Northrop, that Northrop still faced civil lawsuits and administrative sanctions as to all cases which had been open in our investigations. We ultimately required a plea to 34 felony counts. And in our judgment, these counts reflected an admission on Northrop's part that over 110 guidance and stabilization systems for the cruise missile and the Harrier jet had been improperly tested 
and that the test results were in fact falsified. The plea was ultimately accepted and the, North, uh, and the Northrop was sentenced to be fined criminally $17 million. I'm advised that this is the largest straight criminal fine ever imposed on a defense contractor. The general manager of Northrop's California factory and the chief engineer of that same factory received prison terms which reflected both their criminality and their cooperation in our investigation. I'd like to just briefly turn my attention for a moment uh, to the question of curing the waiver problem. And I want to uh, parenthetically mention that the waiver problem is something that is really not unique necessarily to the defense procurement field. <laughs> It is a problem that plagues prosecutors whenever we are dealing with fraud on the government, whether it be in the military context or in a civilian context, where you have wittingly or unwittingly government officials acquiescing in, tolerating, uh, or otherwise going along with deviations from rules, regulations, contract requirements, or the law. And that acquiescence and type of behavior frequently undermines, if not the legality of a prosecution predicated on false statements, at least the jury appeal of such a case. With respect to dealing with the waiver problem, uh, in particular uh, in the uh, military arena, defense procurement arena, the Department of Justice and the Department of Defense are in fact attempting to deal with the issue. There is no simple answer because of the frequently undeniable tension between the legitimate needs of the military to have its products delivered in a timely fashion and the legitimate need of prosecutors to guard against potential prejudice to their ongoing investigations. The process we must seek is one in which relevant personnel throughout the system are aware that actions that they may contemplate taking could seriously impact on a pending investigation without prejudicing the investigation by disseminating widely throughout the organization the contents of that investigation. We are working on different options to supplement and strengthen these mechanisms already in place within the Department of Defense to ensure that such contractual decisions will not have the effect in the future of undercutting criminal and civil cases. Mr. Fahey and his colleagues have come up with a specific proposal which is being examined now for establishing specific contact points once investigations are in fact uh, uh, launched so as to ensure that there is a, an easy mechanism for DOD employees uh, to contact and uh, table prospective contract actions that might influence or impact on our pending investigations. We are hopeful that this increased dialogue with the Department of Defense uh, will, in fact, help us enjoy greater successes in these prosecutions in the future. If I may just, in closing, comment briefly on, on uh, part of the statement by the Chairman with respect to the applicability of the uh, racketeering statute, RICO, uh, in this case and in analogous cases elsewhere. During the course of the prosecution, during the course of the investigation and determination of how to frame our charges, the applicability and utilization of the RICO statute was in fact considered. Uh, given the nature of the law with respect to RICO in the circuit in which the contemplated prosecution would be brought, it was concluded that we could not utilize that statute um, uh, under current existing case law. Aside from that, uh, the utility of utilizing the RICO statute in a situation to deal with uh, uh, corporate, uh, corporate activities such as that demonstrated by RICO has to be closely examined. But I would want to just uh, indicate that in appropriate circumstances, RICO very well may be utilized uh, and uh, is not an option that the Department of Justice uh, forecloses um, as a matter of policy. Uh, that concludes the summary of my remarks, and uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, we're glad to try to answer any questions uh, that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Richard.
Mr. Richard, in February of this year, the Northrop Corporation pled guilty to 34 felony counts of providing false statements to the United States regarding testing procedures and tests on the cruise missile and Harrier aircraft. Is that correct? That is correct. And on March 13th of this year, the U.S. Attorney and Assistant U.S. Attorney of the Central District in California wrote to O. Kevin Vincent, who is the Pentagon suspension and debarment official of, at, uh, on Northrop, and stated, I'm quoting, we are not aware of a more significant prosecution. This is the first time that we are aware of in which a major defense contractor has been convicted of failing to conduct critical tests on a nuclear weapons system. If any case cries out for debarment, this is the case. If ever the American people deserve to be protected from the type of reckless and potentially life-threatening conduct, this is it. Mr. Richard, this is an extremely frank and harsh assessment of the situation. I'd like to ask you if you agree with the U.S. Attorney from the Central District concerning the significance of the fraud Northrop perpetrated in this case. Mr. Chairman, as you know, the decision uh, before the suspension and debarment board is still pending. We have, uh, through the U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, made uh, the views of that office known to that board. We have communicated and are continuing to communicate with the board facts and circumstances that we believe are relevant for them to consider in uh, reaching a decision which is ultimately theirs to make. Uh, the communication, I think, speaks for itself, and I, I am reluctant to, to try to, in this context, or, or have the result of, of any comment I make possibly uh, inappropriately uh, impact on that pending proceeding. Our views are known to the board. Uh, we will continue to work with the board. Uh, but ultimately, it is for the board to decide. Mr. Richard, it seemed to me that, that though it's your duty to advocate, you all are prosecutors, not judges, and it is your role to urge upon the trier of fact and the decider of punishment what the facts are and what the punishment should be. So I'm surprised that you're uh, hesitant today to endorse these comments from uh, a U.S. attorney from your own department. It's not a... Uh, 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 it's not a hesitancy to endorse. It, it's it's a, hesita a hesitancy to do something in a public uh, forum which may, in, in fact, in impact uh, on, on a pending administrative proceeding. Uh, we have made our views known. Uh, we are not withdrawing those views. Uh, we are not walking away from them. The, the communications speak for themselves. Uh, you know, U.S. attorneys all over the United States, including one right here in Washington, D.C., is not hesitant to walk out on the front steps of the Capitol and have a press conference and characterize the case that's pending before the judge in any way he wants to. Why wouldn't that same kind of prosecutorial zeal apply uh, when you're dealing with Northrop? Well, I can't, I can't speak to other activities uh, uh, other than what, what I uh, find myself uh, confronted with at the moment. Uh, uh, we have a pending proceeding. Uh, we have um, obligations to ensure that that proceeding uh, uh, proceeds uh, without uh, undue uh, public pressure on the individuals that have to ultimately make the decision. We have communicated our views uh, to the uh, uh, to the board, okay. and and uh, I, I'm not sure that it uh, uh, it serves a, a purpose to discuss uh, beyond that in, in this fashion uh, uh, our views. It does say that this is the first time we are aware of in which a major defense contractor has been convicted for failing to conduct critical tests on nuclear weapons systems. Now, doesn't the Justice Department and the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, in the Central District of California have similar information on the MX nuclear missile program and the B-2 stealth bomber? Well, I, I think you if I understand your correct, uh, question correctly, I mean, it's in connection with, with convictions for these activities. Uh, uh, I think the, 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 the reference is, is the first time that uh, someone has been convicted for these. No, 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 no. Uh, no. Maybe I'm misunderstanding your question, sir. I, I, I said it's uh, the, the U.S. Attorney in the Central District made it clear that this is the first time we're aware of in which a major defense contractor has been convicted for failing to conduct critical tests on nuclear weapon systems. My question is, isn't it the case that the Justice Department and the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Central District of California 
have similar information on the MX nuclear missile program and the B-2 stealth bomber program. Isn't that correct? Cases are on. My hesitancy uh, is I'm not sure I, I, I fully appreciate the question. It, the, there were um, aspects of the MX program and the B2 program that were uh, looked at and, and ultimately declined, um, uh, involving a variety of, of activities involving false reporting as well. Um, you have some ongoing? Uh, pardon me? You have, those invest you have investigations of that type ongoing now? as well? With, with the gentleman, you know, sure. the question I think that we have to address ourselves to is not was there prosecution on this matter, but was there evidence developed or did evidence appear with regard to this possibility? There were the the, 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 were uh, and, on the, and on the B-2, too. There were allegations. Um, okay. Uh, Mr. Fahey advises that, that with respect to the MX program, uh, there are civil proceedings ongoing uh, which uh, are predicated on false testing, but no, um, uh, nothing in the criminal arena. With respect to the decline B2 um, uh, allegations, that, that focused on, on the pricing mechanism, if you will, utilized for the, uh, the, the B-2. Um, I'm not sure if that's completely responsive to, to your question, but it wasn't a testing allegation. So I... Um, if the gentleman would permit, sure. in each instance, the B-2 and the MX, evidence was discovered by the Department of Justice indicating that there was, that there were falsification of books, records, and and reports to the Defense Department. Is that not so? That, in, that, that there is some evidence to that effect, yes, Mr. Chairman. And this is with regard also to testing, that there were false reports with regard to testing in each of those cases. Is that not so? With, uh, I'm, I'm limiting my response, Mr. Chairman, on the B-2 closed uh, uh, case. Uh, the answer on the B-2 closed matter is, is no. Uh, that did not relate to a testing allegation. It related to a, to a cost uh, processing, uh, which was um, uh, questionable validity, but not a testing allegation. With respect to the MX missile, yes. Yes. Uh, now, there's, there's an ongoing test in Chicago, uh, there's an ongoing case in Chicago, is there not? The, 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 there are ongoing investigations, yes. Uh, with and which, again, and there's also one going on in Los Angeles, is there not? That's correct. These, these are both investigations that have not yet been presented to the, to, to the courts or the jury, is that right? That's correct. It, it is and those it, that, that give me the pause going into what the basis of those investigations are and, and, and the nature of it. That's my hesitancy, Mr. Now, in each of these instances, it involved uh, falsification of testing. Is that not so? You're referring to the, to the open, ongoing investigation? Yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I would... Uh, I'm prepared I, to respect I, your concerns. I, I want you to tell us what you can properly tell us. The, the, there, are, there are ongoing investigations, uh, and, and um, it, with your indulgence, I, I, I would request that we, we uh, leave right. it at, the, at the that. The committee will, will, will discuss with you how much you can put Fine. in the record on these particular points. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, chair thanks the gentleman. Chair recognizes now the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Blythe. Mr. Richard, in your testimony, you state that between 1988 and the first half of 1990, 23 of the top 100 Department of Defense contractors have been convicted of defrauding the United States. I commend your efforts. Can you tell us of those 23 contractors? 
How many have been suspended from doing further business with the government? I, I would have to get back to you, uh, sir. Well, you uh, will have the record uh, open. You can yeah, furnish uh, that for the record. Without objection, that will be inserted in the record at the appropriate place. Can you tell us how many have been completely debarred from doing business with the government? My, my understanding is th uh, and, uh, that of the top 100 c contractors, that none have been debarred. But uh, again, I would, I would ask respectfully that I check on this and get back to you. All right. You can correct the record if it's yeah, fine. different. Against how many are suspension and debarment proceedings pending? I would not know that. I, I'm <clears throat> sure we can uh, obtain that from the Department of Defense. What exactly is the role of the Department of Justice in deciding whether a contractor should be suspended or debarred? The, as I, I've tried to indicate, our role uh, is a limited one. The ultimate decision is for the Department of Defense. Uh, we uh, view our role as as uh, ensuring that uh, the Department of Defense has adequate access in, in an appropriate time to all the facts. Uh, well, we are you satisfied with that role as it now exists, the limitations that you have? Well, we are not the decision makers. I mean, this, this is, uh, uh, I think, an appropriate allocation of roles between us and the Department of Defense. It, it is appropriate for us to ensure that we have access to the decision makers, that we have an opportunity to, to make our views known as forcefully as, as we wish. But the ultimate decision, I, 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 in answer to your question, I am satisfied rests legitimately with the Department of Defense as opposed to the Department of Justice. In your testimony, you mentioned that cases brought under the False Claims Act require a lower quantum of proof than criminal prosecutions. What is the, the standard of proof required to support a suspension? I believe it's a preponderance of the evidence. And what is the standard of proof required to support a debarment? Same, I believe it's the same analysis. Okay. What is your view over the practice of suspending or debarring a subsidiary of a corporation, but not the parent? Well, I think these are fact-bound situations, uh, uh, Congressman, that uh, uh, I think in, in appropriate circumstances, uh, 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 the bombing of, of contractors as opposed to just subsidiaries would be, would be certainly an appropriate action. Uh, uh, obviously, it, it should be egregious. It should uh, be uh, you know, one that is, is carefully considered. But I, I wouldn't, as a matter of policy, urge that it be eliminated from the options. Well, since my time is limited and moving on, is the Department of Justice consulted in any way by the Department of Defense before new contracts are awarded? I am not aware of any process uh, for consultation. For example, has the Department of Justice asked for its advice on the contractor's past performance before a new contract is awarded to that particular firm? I am not aware that there is any formal process, but I would mention, uh, Mr. Chairman, invariably a DOD investigative component participates in these investigations so that DOD would be aware as, a, as an entity of, of ongoing investigations and, and the historical base for these investigations. Well, do you think the views of the Department of Justice would be useful to the Department of Defense in making a determination on past performance? I'm not sure uh, uh, how useful it would be, assuming that DOD is aware of the, of the enforcement history of the contractor, and I assume that they are aware uh, of the enforcement history. Uh, I what I'm driving at yeah. is, do you think we should legislatively change the law to require that they consult with justice on the past record of the contractor before they award uh, a new contract? In answer to your question, and without further study, my, my initial reaction is uh, probably not. I'm not sure that we could, uh, other than making sure that they are aware of the enforcement record of the contractor, that we could add much to that decision-making process as to their 
suitability for dealing with the contract uh, uh, and, and creditworthiness and, and all the other factors that go into it. Well, I see my time has expired, but we may well come back to that. I'd be glad to further consider it. Uh, Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair recognizes now the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Sikorsky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, picking up where the chairman and uh, Mr. Bryant uh, left off, uh, we got uh, on record the Harrier falsified tests and on record the uh, uh, air launch cruise missile falsified tests. And there are allegations, public allegations, of falsification of tests by Northrop in both the uh, uh, B-2 and the, uh, 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 the stealth bomber, the B-2 stealth bomber, and the MX nuclear uh, missile program. No, I, I don't believe uh, with respect to the B-2 bomber uh, that we had uh, um, gone well, as far as talking. Let's skip that for a second okay. and go back to the MX. Okay. The point is, and I think you'll agree, that we have two of the modernized uh, legs of the triad system Northrop was uh, intimately involved with and had falsified tests affecting their effectiveness. I, I don't quarrel with that statement. Okay. And uh, now jumping back to the cruise missile that's on record, closed case, uh, we're talking nuclear war. We're talking uh, uh, extreme, sensitive, nuclear crisis situations where this thing, this air launch cruise missile, is a vital component and needs to work, right? And we're also talking billions and billions and billions of dollars that dwarf the homeless, that dwarf the FHA problems and some of the other problems that we hear, hear about, uh, correct? That's correct. Now, didn't the Justice Department's investigation find that Northrop used the wrong fluid in the guidance system for the cruise missile, a fluid that would not stand up to the cold temperature needed uh, for the functioning of these missiles? That is correct. And in addition, your investigation found that in some cases Northrop did not perform the required test, and in other cases, failed test results were stricken and passing testing results submitted. There was improper testing done on both the cruise missile and the Harrier aircraft. That's correct. And now we've talked about the cruise missile, but this Harrier aircraft, uh, you know, uh, sometimes stopping short of this all-out nuclear war, we need a response. We send in the Marines. T uh, small, s larger tactical responses, the Harrier aircraft is a major component of their support system, the Marine support system, correct? That, that's correct, but if I, if I may interject just a point, uh, uh, Congressman, my understanding is that between the two, the criti uh, criticality, if you will, of the yeah, test. I'm, I'm just uh, thinking the public, the world's at risk with the air launch cruise missiles. These people that we put on, put into an incredible tense situation are trying to respond for us, uh, sometimes publicly, right. sometimes covertly. Uh, are online, and they're the ones affected by whether these test results were falsified or the testing was done in the first place, and their lot, rear ends are on the line, right? Certainly. Uh, how far back does the uh, uh, cruise missile program, uh, in the cruise missile program, did you find that Northrop officials were lying and falsely certifying test results on this program? Probably as early as 1978. Uh, since the inception. That, that's in right. April 2nd, 1990, the U.S. Attorney and Assistant U.S. Attorney again wrote to the suspension debarment official in the Air Force. You stated, it appears to be a so-called fact-based uh, debarment. What, uh, what was the Justice Department alluding to when it was recommending a fact-based debarment of Northrop? Go ahead and testify. You're under oath, and uh... <laughs> I'm happy to on that. We were recommending that we present uh, any and all facts that did not uh, implicate the grand jury secrecy requirements uh, to the Air Force. On April 3rd, the Justice Department again wrote O. Kevin Vinson, this time stating Northrop was indicted and pled guilty to 34 felony counts to allow Northrop to attempt to shift the entire blame to one product division, attempt to cure problems only at this division, and even restore high-level managers in that division to their former position in no way indicates this problem is behind Northrop. In fact, the present focus of this agreement 
graphically illustrates how a major corporation can use its corporate divisions as shields to hide behind and deflect the consequences of its crimes." End of quotation. You seem to clearly indicate here that you believe the problems stemming from the cruise missile and Harrier cases go well up into the corporate structure of Northrop, do not lie within a rogue division within that corporation. Is that correct? Those are my words, sir. And you agree with that? Uh, that. Well, those, well, let me uh, say, you go on to state, quote, we know of no reason why Northrop should not be required to accept responsibility in this proceeding for its false testing. Correct? I said that. What is the Justice Department's view on how high this crime went within the Northrop Corporation? Who should be held responsible and, and accountable? Mr. Richard? Well, certainly, uh, as reflected in the plea, uh, the corporation pled guilty, not the uh, subsidiary. Uh, we, we, we certainly believe that the criminal uh, liability is, is a corporate liability, as reflected in our prosecutive action. Uh, well, the, re the reason I'm asking is that you go on to, uh, on April 26, the attorney's office again wrote to the Air Force saying, quote, Northrop apparently has not been able to cure significant testing problems in other divisions, which is currently evidenced by two ongoing criminal investigations currently being run in this district. Again, we, fe we feel the current investigations against Northrop, including one at the B-2 division, bear heavily on the issue of present responsibility, quote, unquote. The, the, the term, uh, Congressman, uh, present responsibility is, is critical in this assessment because that, that is really what you're looking at. Is this a, a presently responsible entity? Uh, and you have to evaluate uh, the, their uh, responsibility in the context of, of the universe of actions that they have taken, not only in connection with the, pr the criminal acts, but what they have done in a remedial sense. And, and does it reflect a commitment uh, to uh, uh, cleaning up their acts, so to speak? Uh, well, that's the point. Yes, no, I, I as agree. Early that, as that April is what we are looking at. And up through it, clearly, they're not presently responsible. Well, again, the, the ultimate determiners are, are, are the people who have to decide. Well, I understand and, uh, that, but your guys have been pressing and pressing and pressing and pressing. Our, our that, letters speak for themselves. Yeah, they, and it's clearly Northrop Corporation is not presently responsible regarding its dealings with the government on its various contracts. Mr. Uh, Faith? Well, clearly, sir, those were the words I used, and those were my beliefs at the time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Are they still in time of the gentleman has expired. I'm sorry. Right. And they're still your beliefs today. They haven't changed. They haven't. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. The, uh, Chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Illinois, Ms. Collins. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to have my my uh, opening remarks, I ask unanimous consent to have my opening remarks placed at the appropriate point in the record. Without objection, the opening statement of the gentlewoman from Illinois will be inserted in the record at the appropriate place. Thank you. Uh, continuing on with the line of uh, questioning that has gone on, Mr. Chairman, I'm wondering, uh, it has been stated that the current investigations, including the B-2 division, bear very heavily on the issue of present responsibility. We've already talked about that. I think the clear indication is that uh, your findings to date and the B-2 problem indicates serious problems that would call into question the present responsibility of the Northrop Company. Isn't that a fair interpretation of, the, uh, of this quote that was just given before? Well, it's, it, it's a, a summary of a variety of factors, and I wouldn't uh, uh, focus necessarily on any single factor as being dispositive of the issue. But concerning the B-2 program, the Justice Department currently is considering a civil case filed on Los Angeles, is that right? As well as currently conducting two criminal cases, one out of the Central District of Los Angeles and the other out of the, on the outskirts of Chicago. Is, is that not correct? Um, the, the, uh, our ability to, to articulate pending proceedings are, are, are uh, um, extremely limited uh, and uh, to, um, to go into them, it poses a, a significant problem to us uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, there, there are, however, 
uh, as we've tried to indicate ongoing proceedings in a variety of areas. Let me uh, put it this way. There are, you say there are ongoing proceedings. That's correct. Would you be able to say whether there is an ongoing proceeding in, on the outskirts in, in the district on the outskirts of Chicago, Illinois? No, unless it's a part of the breathing package that Barbara gave us. I'm not familiar with the Chicago investigation. I haven't. Uh, 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 I'm not sure at, the, at this moment, but I'd be glad to get back to you on the question. Well, of well specifically the, about rolling metals, Illinois. Yes, I, I'd yes. be very interested in that because, as a matter of fact, I have uh, I've been visited by a gentleman from Northrop uh, who uh, is at rolling metals, and he brought with him two uh, what I hope are voters in the seventh congressional district with him who are employees there. And their great plea, of course, is that nothing would be done that would uh, cause them to feel insecure in their employment. Uh, I'm not interested in having them uh, unemployed, of course, but I am interested in saving the taxpayers' money. We all pay, uh, pay money. Now, it's my understanding that the criminal investigation into the B-2 Center around uh, irregularities in cost and pricing, as well as testing issues similar to the cruise missile. Is that correct? The, the matter that was closed relating to B2 focused on, uh, criminally closed, focused on the um, pricing issue. Uh, again, with respect to the matter that is open, I'd prefer, uh, for the reasons previously articulated, not to go into the thrust of, of the pending inquiry. Well, would you be able to say uh, that uh, whether or not the, the Justice Department has at least one ongoing grand jury investigation into the F-20 case? where there are allegations that the Northrop Corporation and possibly Tom Jones attempted to buy influence uh, from the Republic of Korea in an effort to sell their B-20 fighter plane. Isn't that correct? The Department of Justice has long had a policy of not uh, publicly acknowledging the existence of grand jury investigations. Uh, uh, as the chairman indicated in his um, well, then is the, is is the uh, chairman of the board, Tom Jones, personally a target in the grand jury investigations of the uh, F-20 case? We we as a matter of policy, we do not publicly identify targets of ongoing inquiries, ma'am. Has he previously signed a consent decree with the government for a number of uh, violations regarding foreign payments and other matters during the activities as chairman of Northrop? Uh, I, I I understand uh, that. Uh, he did, but um, uh, the historical background of Mr. Jones, I really don't have access to at this moment. I could obviously obtain it for you if you uh, and submit it for the record. In a timely fashion, we'd Certainly. appreciate it. Now, it's our understanding that the Justice Department has attempted to obtain an internal investigation conducted by Northrop to determine exactly what happened in the Korean F-20 deal and that Northam has refused to turn over this investigation to the Justice Department. Is that correct? Uh, Ma'am, the, the, the issues um, regarding the right of U.S. Uh, prosecutors for access to internal um, uh, investigative reports of corporations is one that is, is, as you know, is highly contested in the legal community. Uh, some courts have, have, have given us access to it, uh, saying that there is no attorney-client privilege with respect to the preparation of some re uh, such reports. Others uh, have said no, that there is an attorney-client privilege that exists with respect to such reports. We certainly want access to these reports. And you have means by which you can gather that access? We, we have our, our, our traditional grand jury process, and they, in turn, have the ability to try to quash that process. Well, do you believe this is an indication of the present responsibility of Northrop uh, that there may be some serious wrongdoing concerning the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and other relevant laws, and that the chairman of the executive committee of the board of directors, uh, Mr. Uh, o. Mer Mr. O. Meredith Wilson, has requested and obtained the study of the events, but is now shielding top Northrop officials by refusing to turn over the information that you need? The, uh, 
I, I can't, I can't uh, uh, talk to their motives in, in, in uh, uh, theoretically uh, invoking um, uh, a legal position that they may have and asserting that position, especially one that is uh, 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 so important as the attorney-client relationship. Uh, this is a, an but area where we want access to these reports. We have maintained that we believe that they are not covered by privileges. Uh, nevertheless, uh, some courts have, in fact, concluded that they, they are covered. But isn't it relevant to the, to, the, to the currently responsible, presently responsible? Their assertion of, of what they believe to be their right, um, I think they have an obligation to cooperate as, as fully as possible with the, uh, the, the suspension and debarment board. One final question. How would you uh, uh, describe that cooperation? With the board, I, I, I'm with not. The, yeah, with the Department of Justice on the F-20 investigation. Well, uh, the, the, uh, with respect to the F-20, I, I, <laughs> I'd prefer not, not commenting on, on the F-20. With respect to, to the uh, investigation uh, concluded, uh, the criminal prosecution, it was, it was a, a hotly contested uh, investigation and prosecution. Thank you. My time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for being lenient with your time. And the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Lang. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Richard, uh, in your testimony, you mentioned that your investigation had pursued allegations that ultimately disclosed there was no criminal case here because the military service in question, in one case the Navy and in the other the Air Force, had acquiesced in uh, Northrop's conduct. You also stated that those types of claims are more properly resolved by a civil lawsuit or by administrative remedy. My question is, did uh, you refer these matters back to the Department of Defense to pursue such actions or remedies? And that's the bomb of justice. Yeah, actually, we work simultaneously doing civil mm -hmm. Uh, Congressman, if I may answer the question, surely. oftentimes we were simultaneously proceeding down parallel paths, one being civil and the other criminal. When we determined, because of the circumstances you've just indicated, that uh, we would not be able to prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt, we would allow our civil counterparts to go forward. I should note that they were an integral part of our task force in Los Angeles in pursuing these Northrop uh, investigations. And that happened here? The civil uh, actions did go forward? Yes, sir, they did. Uh, a letter dated July 8, 1988, from Assistant U.S. Attorney Howard Daniels to Colonel Edward Morris of the Oklahoma City Air Logistics Center stated that certain persons within the Air Force might have attempted to conceal information from the Justice Department. My question, have you ever been able to determine whether such uh, relevant information was concealed, and if so, have you been able to identify who may have been the concealer? We were able to, uh, within a matter of a few weeks, determine who we believe to have uh, attempted to conceal relevant information from investigators in the task force. Uh, we were able to deal with that problem at that time. Uh, we think ultimately uh, it did not have a severe impact on our ability to go forward, but it did cause us some delays uh, in, in proceeding forward. Uh, we, we have a vote on. I'm just going to ask one last question. Uh, have you had any difficulty interviewing Northrop employees and conducting uh, investigations? Have you, have you been in touch with uh, Northrop's counsel? Uh, what role did that counsel play or attempt to play when you conduct these interviews? Well, there have been uh, different approaches used by Northrop and its uh, numerous counsel in terms of uh, our ability to talk to employees. On some occasions, those employees have been willingly uh, provided to government investigators for interviews. Uh, in other circumstances, uh, we have had to litigate uh, our ability to uh, uh, contact employees. And you touched on this question of internal re reviews by Northrop and whether they have to turn them over to you or not. Has Northrop, uh, so far as you know, done any kind of internal review, and if so, have any documents that resulted from uh, such reviews been made available to the government? Well, it's been my experience in, in most of the investigations which I've headed uh, that uh, Northrop, through its counsel, uh, does uh, generate internal memoranda and reports 
reflecting uh, the results of their internal investigations. On some occasions, those have been provided to us. On others, they have not. I see. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My time is up. Chair will note that um, it, it is the intention of the Chair to continue to uh, proceed with this matter, and the time of the gentleman from New York has not yet expired. The Chair will continue, and, and I think Mr. Bryan will be back here briefly. And, and, well, I and would uh, I would yield to uh, the gentleman from Ohio. If that's the gentleman's wish, the Chair will respect it. it just, I just want to know the gentleman know that he's not being foreclosed by the by the Chair. Uh, all right, then, then the Chair will recognize the gentleman from uh, Ohio, Mr. Oxley, on his own time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, uh, in response to the question from Mr. Lent, you had identified an individual from Northrop, uh, but uh, there was no name forthcoming. Do you have the individual's uh, name? Uh, perhaps I misunderstood your question, sir. Uh, I was talking about individuals uh, within the uh, Air Force community that we felt uh, at one time had impeded our ability to uh, make inquiries. And, and do you know who those individuals may be? Yes, we do. Would you state them for the uh, committee? Well, that's, that's a I believe we would be prepared to provide the, the identity of the uh, individual to the committee uh, uh, through private communication. Uh, uh, uh. Let me ask you this, Mr. Richard. Is there a, is there a potential pending uh, case or investigation against those individuals? Is that why you're reticent? I, I, I just don't know uh, uh, what, if any, action may or may not be uh, considered or under consideration with respect to uh, uh, this individual, not just by us, but by uh, other agencies. And, and I, I'm just not uh, aware, um, and I would like just the opportunity to evaluate that. Uh, uh, Has the name of the individual or individuals been communicated to the Department of Defense? They well, the investigators who are part of our task force are members of the Department of Defense, both the Defense Criminal Investigative Service and Office of Special Investigations through the Air Force. And when these facts were developing, uh, those agents and agencies were therefore aware of what was going on. So that uh, you are not the only ones to have privy to that information? Oh, no. That's correct. We are not the only ones. And, uh, well, just to follow it up then, would you uh, make certain that those uh, are given to the committee, uh, specifically to the chairman, uh, in a private uh, memorandum? Certainly. Is that, uh, does that uh, <laughs> meet the agreement of the uh, chairman, that that information? Chair, if, if the gentleman requests and, and the witnesses agree, the chair will be most happy to receive it and, and, and to receive it under those conditions. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. I, underst I understand the sensitivity of this, uh, and I'm sure the Chair does as well, and I, I think that's uh, the best way to, uh, to proceed. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Richard, uh, in your prepared testimony, you mentioned that Northrop devoted considerable time and effort to trying to get specifications for parts for the air-launched cruise missile, and uh, Harrier charged, uh, changed uh, after Northrop became aware of the Justice Department investigation. Uh, what kind of internal institutional communication could be devised to make sure that the Defense Department officials do not inadvertently compromise ongoing Justice Department investigations uh, in the future? Well, there are, there are uh, existing directives that have been promulgated by the uh, Department of Defense uh, already uh, in, to all personnel uh, talking in terms of coordination of uh, remedies and the mechanisms uh, to be employed internally for ensuring that this doesn't happen. These are obviously, in light of our experience in Northrop, have to be re-examined and expanded. Uh, as I indicated earlier, uh, Mr. Fahey has uh, proposed one mechanism uh, that he would like to uh, have considered, at least for the operation of his district, which would establish, um, uh, once an investigation is launched in the procurement area, points of contact, if you will, both within the investigative component of the Department of Justice, uh, to wit his office, 
and um, the Department of Defense so that if there is any contemplated contract action being considered by any uh, uh, DOD component involving a contract that's under investigation, there would be an immediate mechanism for uh, consultation and consideration so as to avoid this. The tension, though, of course, is um, uh, our uh, hesitancy to promulgate, if you will, uh, to the world of DOD and its many employees uh, the nature of our pending investigation. Uh, so, you know, there are trade offs here that have to be examined, and we are in consultation with the Department of Defense on just these points. Just one more question, if I may. Is it true that there is a Civil False Claims Act pending for the same Northrop? test falsification that was a subject of the Northrop guilty plea? Yes, that's true. Uh, there are actually two. Uh, there is a, uh, a civil case uh, pending which is set for trial, I believe, in September or October of this year on the air launch cruise missile in Los Angeles. Uh, there is an independent False Claims Act case on the Harrier jet uh, controversy. That uh, case has not yet been set for trial. Let me just ask you the, the last question then, Mr. Chairman. How can Northrop contest uh, in the civil courts, uh, conduct uh, which was admitted in the criminal guilty uh, plea? Well, as I understand, the primary issue is, is that of damages at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thank you, gentlemen. The uh, chair will proceed with questions. Uh, Mr. Bryant's coming back here and will preside because of the uh, vote going on, but the chair recognizes himself now for. Uh, few questions before that occurs. Gentlemen, uh, Northrop made public statements which attempted to have the people believe that the cruise missile Harrier problem was uncovered by Northrop itself, did it not? That's, that's our understanding. Now, what are the real facts in the matter with regard to who uncovered these problems? Well, I think, I think we tried to indicate uh, how the investigation was launched in, in our statement, and that was through, through uh, uh, an employee reporting this uh, to us. In fact, it was a Northrop employee who blew the whistle to That's the uh, government. Is that not the case? That, Gentlemen, That's uh, correct. I'm going to have to go and, and leave Mr. Pratt uh, presiding, which he can do my job. You're asking questions. Mr. Richards, very recently, the, the FBI, <coughs> under the direction of the U.S. Attorney's Office, in the Central District of California raided the production facility where Northrop is a major subcontractor on the F-18 Navy fighter. In fact, 50 FBI agents went into the plant, went down to the production and assembly areas, we are told, and actually removed components that had been installed uh, on the F-18s. The stories uh, which we have heard indicate that the Justice Department had reason to believe that Northrop was knowingly installing defective substandard or substituted parts on the Navy's F-18 program. Uh, can you tell the committee about the recent raid that was conducted by the Justice Department uh, in connection with the F-18 program? Mr. Chairman, uh, it, it, it's, it's precisely these kinds of, of open inquiries that, that uh, would respectfully defer not and request that we not go into the nature of, of what it is we're looking at and, 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 and the nature of the inquiry. Uh, right. It is the case, is it not, that in, if, if such a raid was carried out, it would have to be done with a warrant. Certainly. And to achieve that warrant, one would have to show the judge probable cause. Isn't that correct? That's correct. So, it's a case that you have evidence so it w would be fair to say that you have some evidence of criminal behavior or you wouldn't be able to get a warrant. Isn't that right? <laughs> We obviously have to have to convince a judge that we have some basis for the warrant. Thank you. Uh, I assume you can confirm that the Justice Department has an ongoing criminal investigation into Northrop's handling of the F-18 program. You can confirm that or not? I would prefer not to. <laughs> okay. On June 8th, the manager of Northrop's facility in Macon, Georgia, pled guilty to labor mischarging on various aircraft maintenance and repair contracts. Is that correct? That is correct. What programs did this labor mischarging affect? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, ha I have that information, and if, yeah, I can supply it to you, or, or if you indulge me. Uh, Go ahead and look for it. Pardon me? Um, 
my understanding is in connection with uh, 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 falsification of a series of time cards and, and other contract documents uh, uh, concerning um, costs related to contracts awarded to Northrop for repair and maintenance of aircraft uh, by the uh, Werner Robbins uh, Air Logistics Center in Macon, Georgia. Which aircraft programs? Um, I would have to get you further details on that, uh, Mr. Chairman, and, and I'd be glad to do that. Uh, Let me ask you this question. How many Northrop programs do you have evidence of criminal behavior with regard to? That, that, that is a very broad question. Uh, well, it's a very clear question. How many Northrop programs do you have evidence of criminal behavior with regard to? Well, I, I, I couldn't, uh, I mean, answer that off the top of my head. We have uh, a, a certain number of pending inquiries. Well, how about, uh, we have, have it with regard to the B-2, of course, is that correct? Uh, we, we, we have acknowledged through the, the submission of documents uh, to the committee that the uh, there was a, a pending one. As well? Uh, uh, yeah, the, 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 there is no current uh, but, MX but criminal you found, investigation. You found evidence of criminal behavior with regard to the MX, isn't that correct? You have evidence of criminal behavior with regard to the MX. Dummy the dummy corporations, no the unauthorized vendors, and so forth. Falsification. There is, there is no current uh, criminal case pending on the MX missile program. No, not asking about current cases pending, but about evidence which you have and which you have marshaled? Well, I, I think it goes back to a point Mr. Richard made earlier. Uh, there was some probable cause at an early stage. We ultimately concluded there was insufficient uh, evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that there was criminal misconduct on the MX program. There are some civil cases still pending which are in litigation by the department. All right, cruise missile? There have been convictions. The F-20? That's under investigation, isn't it? Yeah. The Harrier? There have been convictions. convictions. Have been convictions with regard to that. What about the F-18? We mentioned that a moment ago. You had probable cause to carry out a raid in connection with the F-18. Now that's just six that's based on what I now know of because of the hearing today. How many more are there? Programs. Let me ask it this way. Can you name a single program which Northrop is involved in with regard to which you have no evidence of any criminal activity? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I, I, I don't have a complete inventory of all their contracts. I'll be very candid with you. Well, uh, aside from whether you have a complete inventory or not, just can you name one? Can you name one Northrop program with regard to which our government has no criminal, uh, no evidence of criminal activity? I don't. I don't have an index uh, available, to, available to me of all the okay. of all the possible yeah. investigations. I, I don't wish to, to, to turn this into a, har a harassing question, but it's a serious one. Are you are you personally able to name one Northrop program that you're aware of, with regard to which we have not marshaled some evidence of criminal wrongdoing? Just just a net yes or no answer. Well, I, I just can't answer that question because I just don't have the knowledge. I'd have to go back to, to inventory what is uh, known to us. It seems to me that it's... Uh, I'm not trying to be evasive. No, that's fine. Uh, I'll let it rest Chairman. there. It does seem to me that it's somewhat instructive that you would have to go back and study and search to find a program with regard to which there is no criminal, no, no evidence of criminal you, wrongdoing you, you, involving Northrop. On the contrary, you're asking me, so. uh, you're asking me about uh, a universe of... of uh, contracts and, and I don't have an inventory of every conceivable allegations that the Department of Justice is looking at uh, and you're asking me to get a categorically respond to you and I'm just not in a position I understand. to do maybe so. our next witness Mr. Betty can and, and I'm not, understand I'm not pressing you personally so much or uh, intending this question to be critical uh, impliedly critical of you personally I'm just pointing out that here a person in your situation is and you have to stop and think about it to come up with a Northrop program with regard to which there's no criminal activity uh, in, the, in the knowledge of our government. That's not, maybe not your fault. That certainly says something about Northrop, however. I think my time has expired, and where are we going next?
I mean, Mr. Chairman, if I may just yeah, ask, sure. uh, answer uh, and, and elaborate on the point. We don't normally keep a running index per contractor at the Department of Justice of all pending matters. I understand that. So, I mean, it's really a question of data collection. Uh, I understand that. I'm not, I'm, again, I do not intend that question to, to imply any criticism of you. I'm pointing out that it is interesting that of all the programs Northrop is involved in, a person like you can't, it doesn't come to your, to your mind immediately, or my mind, immediately with one program with, with regard to which there's no criminal activity. I think we're talking about Northrop here, not you or the Justice Department. The gentleman from Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think, too, it's instructive. It, um, you're a citizen. You pay taxes. And you're, you're uh, uniquely situated to be aware of a lot of things that Northrop, yes. not everything, may, perhaps, without uh, re uh, reflection with some documents, but the instructive uh, part of this conversation is that you, we can't think of anyone either. And, uh, <laughs> And uh, maybe the target drones they've been making for a few decades. But, uh, Mr. Richard, several years ago, Henry Hudson's ill wind uh, investigation became public when a large number of uh, search warrants were issued to defense contractors all across America. Northrop was raided in connection with the ill wind probe. Can you tell us the status of, uh, of ill wind? Uh, uh, the status of that investigation as it concerns Northrop? It's still it's still ongoing. <laughs> It's still ongoing, and and and. Uh, uh, you don't want to pique our interest anymore? No. <laughs> I, I, other other than acknowledging that the matter is still open, I I, I would request that uh, it not be uh, okay. In urged addition, to go in the last further. couple of years, the Customs Service announced with great fanfare that it was going to seize the property of those involved in the drug trade and plow the profits back into the war on drugs. It's my understanding that the Customs Service contracted with the Northrop. Corporation to facilitate the disposal of those properties, thereby generating cash to be plowed back into the vaunted war on drugs. It's our understanding that the U.S. Attorney's Office in Beaumont, Texas, has been conducting a criminal investigation into Northrop's handling of this contract, one more contract that hadn't been touched on earlier, uh, and has found a number of instances where Northrop showed a careless disregard to the cost it was incurring in the handling in disposal of these properties and thereby squandered much of the revenue obtained out of the seizure program and thereby reduced the proceeds that would be then plowed back into the war on drugs. What can you tell us about the status of the DOJ's investigation into that? That, that too, is still pending. Uh, I understand, uh, as an aside, that uh, uh, I believe GAO has audited the program itself. I'm not sure if they've released their report, but uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Congressman GAO has also looked at that program. In one of the uh, D Justice Department's memos to the Air Force officials of the Central District state that an Air Force official is suggesting that you are out, quote, to punish, unquote, Northrop. When you look at the behavior of the Northrop Corporation in the 80s with regards to the cruise missile, the Harrier, the B-2, the F-20, the F-18, the MX, the Illwind investigation, the drug customs contract, and so on and so forth. Why shouldn't Northrop be punished? I mean, I, I know this is strange to the Air Force. <laughs> well, I guess I guess it's, uh, the, the issue comes down to uh, choice of remedies. Uh, we 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 do punish them. Uh, we go after them criminally where there's sufficient evidence to uh, justify a criminal prosecution. Uh, we uh, try to ensure that uh, the full panoply of civil remedies are employed, and that uh, the appropriate officials have an opportunity to consider uh, suspension and debarment actions. Uh, based on questions of their current uh, level of responsibility. So I think uh, uh, the Department of Justice and, and DOD uh, have uh, a, a panoply of remedies that uh, available to it, and, and I don't think we have been reluctant to utilize those remedies and urge on DOD that they uh, uh, utilize uh, their remedies to the fullest possible extent. I'm reminded in this discussion of punishment. Uh, I'm reminded that the uh, Northrop has been uh, uh, called on the carpet repeatedly on environmental law violations as well, and, and I suspect uh, uh, other laws as well. 
uh, over the over the years. Um, uh, I went to law school and and I did legal aid for prisoners and and uh, have the only two maximum security prisons in the state of Minnesota in my district and and have kind of a working knowledge of the the basis of our Western uh, law. Punishment plays a active role in the theoretical base uh, for our criminal activities, criminal actions, criminal justice system. Uh, it plays a role in civil actions as well. Uh, there's a belief that it acts as both a, uh, as a carrot to deter and a stick to, to get people in, in line. So when you talk about the, uh, the criminal cases, uh, there you have a reasonable doubt as the, as the burden of proof that you must carry and you're going to discharge, you're going to not proceed on criminal cases that, uh, that uh, can be proceeded on in civil and you have a whole mix of those, right? Yeah, but I... I but in I, the civil aspect, we've got preponderance of evidence. Just, I just want to put this into the context. This company got $35 billion from the American taxpayers over the last decade. $35 billion. They've got a, a laundry uh, list of, uh, of, uh, of bad actions, some criminal, some where charges weren't brought, but certainly shenanigans that uh, aren't worthy of any American citizen, especially an uh, American corporation taking $35 billion out of the, out of the federal treasury. And, uh, and they're making things that aren't tables and chairs, they're making things that are actively part of the national security of this company, country. Everything from the nuclear, the uh, all-out nuclear exchange to the uh, support of a few grunts on, on, in some special project. And they have failed to test those things and put at jeopardy our national security from top to bottom. And I think the concept of punishment should be led by the Air Force and not, uh, and not demeaned and discouraged by the Air Force. Let, 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 let me just uh, put a note of caution on, on, on this uh, discussion, and, and, and that is the... the uh, I think you put a lot of notes of caution. No, on no, the, no, I, I think you've, you've danced pretty well through this process and not trying to, uh, to lose your, uh, your, your role, but I'd like to see a little more vim and vigor from the the prosecutor for the taxpayers. Well, I, I, I think our record is pretty uh, uh, substantial, uh, and, and I don't think it's marked by timidity on our part at all. I do suggest that, that the process uh, uh, articulated uh, um, uh, in the suspension and debarment uh, uh, procedures, as I understand it, is not designed necessarily to be uh, punitive. In fact, uh, um, it, is, it focuses on whether there is a, an articulation of present responsibility by the corporation. When you, when you start talking about uh, utilizing punishment concepts in the civil and administrative arena, you are, you are invoking issues relating to the recent Supreme Court decision on the Halpern case, uh, questioning whether such utilization in the civil context of, of punitive measures would bar criminal measures. Uh, as a violation of double jeopardy well, question. I under, I under, so the, well, I, the issue I, is not in the air. Uh, that's, that's, that's nice, but I hear a lot of Dr. Spock's uh, spoil the rod and uh, spare the rod and spoil <laughs> the child uh, in, this, uh, in this process. And what tees me off is the Air Force keeps going along. Uh, you know, th how many times do the taxpayers have to kick this football that uh, Northrop and Lucy keep pulling off uh, uh, away from us? We're gonna, we've ended on our backside on every contract that's, you know, it's, it's losing the money is one thing that boils me, but, but losing the money to systems that are absolutely critical to national security should rile everyone. Everyone who stands around the flag and defends the flag and is concerned about national security. If Northrop was a Department of Justice contractor, do you believe the Department of Justice would still be contracting for the services of Northrop Corporation? I would hope not. You would hope not. Thank you. <laughs> God bless you.
Uh, please, please recognize our colleague from the Government Operations Committee, Mr. Shea of Connecticut. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank this committee for its diligence over the last eight years. It's no wonder we've had a problem, though, because you've had trouble getting the CEO to come into your committee, and our committee as well has had trouble, and it seems to me the next invitation should be accompanied by a subpoena. Uh, there's no question you have the F-18, the Gentleman MX. Neal, I might point out he's under subpoena at the present time from this committee. Well, I look forward to coming to that hearing as well. Uh, the F-14, the F I mean the F-18, the, the MX, the B-2, the Harrier jet, the Airland airland uh, cruise missile, among others, have had problems. The Justice Department decided to settle on two in particular, the Harrier jet and the airland cruise missile. Uh, I guess that's CR case 89-303. Now, with the, with the Harrier jet, that was a vibration problem, and the, and the issue has been dealt with. Uh, we have a better system. But with the airland cruise missile, which carries nuclear weapons, we have a problem that wasn't dealt with. Is it true that this case was dismissed in a plea bargain where they pleaded guilty to 34 cases? Th th 34 counts. Right. Uh, Is it not true that this issue with the airland cruise missile was dismissed? No. Uh, it, it, Air launch cruise missile. The, um, the aspect dealing with the cold temperature issue. Thank you. I only have five minutes, so, uh, the, the, no. but the issue of the cold temperature, and the problem with the cold temperature is that that's basically the guidance system. It's in the brains, isn't it, of the system. And isn't it true that, uh, that uh, the fluid freezes at uh, temperatures of, of, of 40 below? There is some evidence, Congressman, well, that well, uh, indicates that at about minus 40 degrees, Northrop itself has doubts as to whether the fluid will perform. Well, they have doubts because in every instance the test showed that it didn't perform above that. Isn't that correct? Not entirely. There are some tests that indicate it might work at temperatures of about minus 50 degrees, but it drops off rapidly. Yeah, I'd like to just put in quotes the word might. And my, my question is, why would we have agreed to settle on this case and close up the books when this is probably the most damaging of all the cases with Northrop? Why would we let them get away with it? Well, I, I think uh, uh, to, to appreciate, if, one, I don't think we'd let them get away with anything. Uh, two, I think uh, we, to understand our actions with respect to the cold temperature charges, which are just part of the charges ultimately brought against uh, uh, Northrop, uh, you have to look at, at the strength of our case in light of the waivers uh, and, and that were given and their potential impact on our prosecutive uh, ability both in terms of legal ability and, and the jury appeal, uh, uh, flowing from uh, the waiver of these cold temperature requirements. You know, is your short answer you didn't think you had a case against him? No, we, we, we were prepared to go right. forward with trial. Well, I just want to, as one congressman out of 435, express tremendous dismay that of all the areas that we basically are covering up, this is the one we're allowing them to cover up. It's a nuclear weapon. It's a system that we think does not perform at cold temperature. Isn't Congress, that true? Congressman, we, our actions do not reflect a cover-up. On the, co on the contrary, they reflect a, 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 an exposition of the facts uh, but, and, a, and, a, and a, a critical appraisal of our ability to take a case into court and prevail. I want you to define what you mean, exposition of the facts. Isn't it, is, isn't it a fact that these, uh, what has been discovered is now sealed? No. In, these, in this plea bargain arrangement, is, haven't, have you dropped the case against them? Is that not true? No, Congressman, uh, there has been nothing sealed with respect to the facts that we developed during the course of the cold temperature investigation. Indeed, we provided, I believe, to some of your staff uh, people who came out to Los Angeles some of that evidence. In addition, we provided it to the Air Force. Uh, we have summarized it in the statement that Mr. Richard has uh, made a part of the record here today. There's been no uh, under seal uh, filings with respect to evidence on cold temperature. And, and respectfully, I, I would disagree from the U.S. Attorney's Office in Los Angeles that we have in any way covered up the evidence uh, with respect to the cold temperature issues. How would you describe Northrop's cooperation? Now, Mr. Fahey, I want you to answer this question, please, because you've been dealing more directly with them. How would you describe their cooperation with your office in this plea bargain? In the plea bargain? Uh, well, it took six days to negotiate the plea, and it was, as Mr. Richard indicated, hotly contested. Uh, both sides had very strong positions going in, and ultimately, 
uh, we reached a resolution. I, I should indicate. This isn't the fact, though, that you met with our staff and said that they were probably the least cooperative of any group that you've had to uh, work out a plea bargain with? Well, on some issues, I think that's right. Okay. I mean, I would prefer that to be said. That's I wasn't sure what you were driving at, Congressman. The fact is that they have not been very cooperative. Is that not true? In, in certain uh, circumstances with respect to the plea, that's correct. How would you categorize their uh, corporate announcement after the plea bargain where they said, um, after the plea bargain arrangement in February, that Northrop indicated that it had been and continues to be a cooperative with the Department of Justice in all aspects? Would you find them very cooperative? I didn't think the, uh, the corporate statement was entirely accurate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, thanks, you, gentlemen. Chair inquires, are there further questions of the witness? Gentleman from Texas. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I just have a quick one, and if this is not, you're not the appropriate one to answer it, please say so. But Mr. Richard, who staffs the, the panel that uh, has the decision-making power with regard to suspension and debarment? Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I, I would suggest that you direct the question to DOD. I'm, I'm just not sure of the answer. Well, I don't mean the names. I'm just uh, no, DOD no, I, personnel. I, they don't uh, rely on the Justice Department for staff. Oh, no. We, 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 we do not participate uh, in the staffing position. Can you tell us what the, what the standard is for debarment in the law? Well, I mean, the standard of proof, yes, but there is a, multiple, there is a series of factors under the regulations. Uh, the, the standard, we believe, uh, is, is one of preponderance of, of, of the evidence, but there are multi-faceted uh, issues that can be considered by the board and set forth in, in, in the various uh, operative regulations. You don't have those uh, uh, No, I'm afraid not. Okay. That's all, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from Minnesota? Thank you. Just briefly, on the uh, the uh, cold uh, testing, uh, is that air launch cruise missiles? Cold temperature is the air launch cruise, cruise missile. missiles. Yes. And then the vibration was the Harrier jet. That's correct. And, you know, the, they set the specs to match what the this cruise missile has to do, presumably, at least in a lot of cases, over the Soviet Union. And it's going to be taken in bombers, in some cases, in bombers 50, 60,000 feet up. You know, it's 65 degrees below sometimes in Minnesota on the <laughs> ground in winter. And over the North Pole at 50 or 60,000 feet, and then over Siberia uh, in the Soviet Union, much of the Soviet Union. And what happened here, and, it, and it, it's just so distressing, is that it was a reverse limbo test. They didn't make the 65, so they go back to the contractor, the Air Force, and get them to raise the bar up. And they didn't make that, and they got them to raise it again. And on the gyro, it's the same thing. They got the Navy to change the uh, from 32 Gs, I think, to, well to half that, and yeah. they didn't make that, so they raised. They keep raising the bar up. It's a great, uh, it's a great test. They only got a few, several billions of dollars for these, uh, for for not match, ma making these specs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, just one question from the chair. In connection with any of these changes of specifications or discussions that Northrop has had leading to changes of contract or test specifications or anything of that sort, has there ever been any discussion with the Department of Justice when there's been an ongoing criminal proceeding in, in which the uh, Department of Justice had either an investigation or a criminal process going on? In, in this particular case? By, by, the, by the Air Force. In this particular case, here. in this particular case, no. It was all after the fact that we learned about it. All done before you learned about it. In this particular case, yes. But didn't you warn them not to do it? Did, did the Justice Department ever warn them, uh, that is, the Department of Defense, not to make changes in specifications in, in instances where you had criminal prosecutions going on? Mr. Chairman, I think that we have provided to your staff letters in which we did uh, advise of, of our concerns. As a matter of fact, that is, that, that these letters have been very interesting to the chair. Uh, and without objection, the chair will put them into the record at this, uh, at this time. Let me just read here from, from, one, of the, from one of the letters. It said, uh, this is July 8, 1988. Uh, this is to uh, Colonel Morris, who is the uh, uh, 
the uh, officer commanding of the uh, Air Logistics Center. Uh, obviously, our investigation of this issue depends heavily on close cooperation with the Air Force. It is therefore alarming to learn that recent developments directly imp implicating our investigation were not communicated to OSI. It is our understanding that affirmative steps were taken to conceal the new information from OSI, thus preventing the United States Attorney's Office from carrying out its inquiry. That's a very serious statement, isn't it? Yes, sir. It, it, it is true, is it not, that, that, that the event alleged occurred? We believe it did. Here's, here's, here's another. Uh, so this indicates that uh, the Defense Department either knew of or had, had participated in concealment of facts from the Justice Department uh, that were important to your investigation and the prosecution of your criminal case. Is that not so? Well, Mr. Chairman, I think at a micro level that was certainly the case. Uh, we, we did have problems with individual engineers and individual program offices who were issuing waivers, uh, but we believe it was at that micro level. Well, let's, let's go further here. Here's another letter to, uh, it, and, and the first letter, by the way, was signed by uh, Howard F. Daniels, Assistant U.S. Attorney, and Robert Bonner, United States Attorney. This was uh, for the United States, on behalf of the United States Attorney for the Central District of California. And again, on behalf of the U.S. Attorney for the Central District of California, again, in a letter signed by Mr. Mr. Fahey, who's uh, done such a fine job of testifying this morning. Uh, we come to this paragraph. Uh, this letter is a follow-up on our telephone conversation during the week of November 11, 1989, concerning attempts by Northrop Precision Product Division, and, uh, rather the PPD, to contact Air Force program officers for waivers, deviations, and, and or other specification interpretations. As previously stated, our litigation concern is that an Air Force officer office unwittingly may grant a waiver slash deviation or concur with a PPD specification interpretation that would result in undermining our case against PPD. Understandably, we would very much like to prevent such occurrences from happening. To that end, it is important that we be informed as soon as possible of any communication by Northrop to the Air Force concerning any waiver, deviation, or spec interpretation issues arising out of the Air Force's procurement of gyro components from PPD. We would very much appreciate if you would uh, notify all program offices of the need to keep our office apprised of any such communication so that they may be dealt with appropriately. Our particular concern are the following issues. Cold temperature specifications, MIL, STD, 810C interpretations, qualification test requirements, DC 200 fluid. We are also interested in alerting the Navy, Army, and DLA general counsel offices of above concern. Could you provide us with appropriate points of contact in those offices to deal with these issues? Now, the Air Force and the Navy in these matters granted the waivers anyhow, didn't they? Well, it turns out uh, they did. And the practical effect of that with regard to your criminal prosecution was what? I think it, uh, candidly, it made our ability to go forward on a criminal prosecution uh, very problematic. As, on, as these, on these particular on matters? On cold temperature only, yes, sir. Uh, and, we, given, and given the constraints on your budget, personnel, and money, uh, you are in a much more difficult position now to go forward, uh, given the fact that you have limited resources to address these kinds of cases anyway. Well, not so much. Uh, we have referred those allegations, of course, to the Air Force for possible suspension and debarment activity. So these, these changes and, and, and the permitted deviations occurred after the warning letter, did they not? I, I'm not completely sure, Mr. Chairman. I'd have to go back and look at the chronology. Uh, we have, of course, submitted the waiver packages, I believe, to your staff, and we've submitted the letters, so I think it would be a simple matter to put the chronology together. The uh, staff advises me that the waiver, uh, the, rather the warning came first and the waiver came later. Uh, that sounds right. I, I'm just not 100 percent sure, and that's why I'd have to refer to the record. Gentlemen, I, are there further questions of our witnesses? Gentleman from Virginia? <laughs> Mr. Richards, your testimony stated that there is a tension between the legitimate needs of program managers to have their products delivered and the legitimate needs of a prosecutor to build a case. Is this true? Yes, I think it was uh, articulated well by Mr. Uh, Weld, the former Assistant Attorney General in 1987, I think, when he appeared before this committee and, and he uh, expounded upon 
what he perceived and, and I perceived to be a, a tension along those lines. Why should a program manager acquiesce in illegal conduct just to get a product? Uh, won't this uh, result in a, a possibly a defective and, and, and certainly overpriced product? Well, I, I am sure in many instances it's motivated by a conclusion of that individual that the, the particular spec is not uh, uh, um, appropriate, that, that the testing requirement is too severe, it doesn't reflect the adequate uh, um, real situation uh, requirements. Well, for whatever reasons, we're, we're assuming that there is nothing venal in the decision to grant the, 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 the waiver. We're, we're not talking about a situation where the individual is being corrupted. We're, we're is making, I have to assume, uh, taking upon himself a judgment that possibly he's not qualified to make and certainly should not make without consultation with us. Well, my follow-up question is, is why, was it, why would it be in the contract anyway if it's not necessary for the performance of the particular product. I mean, we are all supposed to try to uh, get the best at the best price, and if you are loading it up, uh, gilding the lily, so to speak, you're going to be paying more for it than you, than you need pay. Well, well, certainly, but, uh, and, and I don't quarrel with what you're saying, but I mean, over the life of a contract, there may very well be times where you, you, you want a, a, a flexibility to change specs based on new uh, information and, and uh, uh, new capabilities, for example. Uh, but, uh, I mean, in, in this particular case, uh, I share your, your skepticism. Why, why was it there? Did they get any form of, uh, of cash consideration? No. For this? None. And, and, and I, I would point out that with respect to uh, uh, the Elon's cruise missile, the testing uh, question was uh, deemed, I mean, the whole, the whole unit was deemed a critical unit, if you will, uh, so that the, uh, the failure of the unit uh, is, is a, a serious proportion. And isn't it in the final analysis that they accepted what the contractor could produce, basically? Uh, they accepted uh, and what, what it could meet the testing requirements of. And, yes. would, and they cooked the books. They modified the books to reflect compliance with the, with the specs when they were out of compliance. No Sorry, no. record, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Chair, okay, thanks to the gentleman. The gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Slattery. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I don't have any questions at this time, but uh, as someone who has taken an intense interest in uh, several projects that Northrop has under construction uh, over the last year, I would like to commend you, Mr. Chairman, and this committee that I am no longer an official member of but anxious to return to sometime in the future uh, for uh, uh, launching this investigation and bringing uh, public again uh, the kind of shenanigans that we see going on in the military industrial complex. And as someone who believes and believes very strongly in a strong national defense, I said this uh, several years ago when this committee held uh, some very important uh, hearings and investigation of the general dynamics operation, and that is that, that uh, if we want to maintain what I believe is very important, and that is a strong uh, public support and public consensus for a strong national defense, it is critically important for those private companies in this country and for the Pentagon to do a first-rate job of protecting the taxpayers' money in these projects. And we have seen repeatedly instances where that was not the case. And it is deeply alarming to this gentleman. And uh, again, it looks like to me we've seen similar shenanigans here. And uh, I hope that uh, with these kind of hearings and, and putting the public spotlight on this kind of activity, it will have a deterrent effect on uh, future perpetrators of, of this sort of activity. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to sit here quietly and as long as I can today, given our other schedules, uh, and listen to the, to the testimony, but uh, I don't have any, uh, any further questions at this time. Chair, thanks to the gentleman for his very helpful testimony. Gentlemen, uh, you've been here a long time. We commend you for your assistance to the committee. We thank you. We also commend you for the vigor with which you've approached your business. We wish you well, and we will try to assist you in any of your undertakings in which the subcommittee may, may be of help to you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Our appreciation goes with you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
The uh, chair announces that our next witness will be Mr. John A. Betty, Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition. Mr. Betty, we're thankful for having you here. We appreciate your kindness in coming to the committee. The uh, chair advises, uh, do you have any uh, of your associates that you would like to have uh, testify with you at the time of your appearance? Do you have any of your associates you'd like to have join you at the table? No. Very well. Mr. Mr. Betty, the, uh, it is the practice of this committee to receive all testimony under oath. Do you object to appearing here under oath today? No, sir. Mr. Betty, the chair advises in view of the fact that you are appearing here under oath, it is your right to be advised by counsel during your appearance. Do you desire to be advised by counsel? No, sir. Mr. Betty, the chair advises that um, at, the, at the witness table there are two small booklets, a red one and a greenish blue one. Those are copies of the rules of the House, the rules of the committee, and rules of the subcommittee. They're there to advise you of your rights as you appear here before the committee. and. Uh, to inform you of the limitations on the powers of this committee as well as your individual rights and the requirements of the law and the Constitution as they affect both of our appearances here today. Um, if you have then no objection to appearing before the committee under oath, would you please rise and raise your right hand, sir? You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to so help you God. I do. The committee thanks you for your testimony. To help you God. I do. The committee thanks you for your testimony. You may uh, proceed in to uh, give your testimony in any fashion you deem suitable. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a, a short opening statement I'd like to uh, read, if I may. Okay, Mr. Chairman, members of the com subcommittee, I appear today at your invitation to discuss with you the subcommittee's concerns about how we ensure the protection of the taxpayers' interests, including national security and our dealings with Northrop Corporation. Since we received your invitation, I have met personally with the commander of the Defense Plant Representative Office, the DPRO at Northrop, and his superior, the commander of the Defense Contract Management Command, the resident Defense Contract Audit Agency Auditor for Northrop, and the Deputy Director of the DCAA, as well as other Air Force and DOD officials to satisfy myself that the people who have the frontline responsibility for managing the programs and protecting the taxpayer interests were themselves satisfied that the proper management control processes, procedures, and disciplines were in place, second, that they were being adhered to, and third, that they saw no evidence of misconduct on their, in their day-to-day -day dealings with the company. The DPRO commander, supported by the DCAA resident auditor, told me that they have confidence in the oversight processes and that they are functioning well. And I should mention that the DPRO commander now is part of my organization, which was, was, which was a recent organizational change as part of the Defense Management Review, and the DCA auditor reports to the Department of Defense Controller's Office, neither reporting to the Air Force at this time. Let me describe to you the systems that are in place to provide oversight of contractors to protect the government's interests, focusing in particular on the oversight which takes place at Northrop. The DOD's oversight of the business conducted at Northrop, similar to that conducted at other large contractor operations, is, before, is performed by that DPRO and the DCAA. It falls into nine basic areas which make up the Integrated Contractor Assessment Program. Hardware software acceptance, tests on deliverable items, cost schedule control systems, purchasing system, overhead cost control, material management accounting system, manufacturing systems including planning and labor usage, property control system, estimating systems for proposals and cost accounting standards. Late last year, the government conducted comprehensive reviews of Northrop's business systems, including the procurement system, the, the production management system, the estimating system, and the material management and accounting system. A special program performance review was conducted on the B-2 program during November and December of 1989. This review was conducted by a team of specialists, many of whom were from outside of the B-2 program. It covered all contractor business systems and provided a benchmark to assess Northrop's capability to effectively and efficiently produce and support the B-2 aircraft. While a number of spe specific problems were identified by the review team, 
The team found that Northrop's business systems are adequate for proper management of the B-2 program. Yesterday, I spoke to the B-2 program manager. He told me that he has confidence in the management systems in place for the program, and he also feels that the people he deals with are cooperative and candid. In your letter to Mr. Cheney on July 17th, you made several references to the Assistant U.S. Attorney's Memorandum written in September of 1988, which criticized the Air Force's management of business at Northrop at that time. Detail answers are being prepared, which will be provided to you. But let me briefly address two of the issues. You pointed out, and the Department agrees, that the problems existed at that time with Northrop's cost schedule control system, the CSCS, which you referred to earlier, which reports contract costs as well as estimates of completion. You cited two potential problems arising from the erroneous data, the potential for improper payment and whether program status reports would have been misleading to the Department of Defense and Congress. On the first issue, the CSC system is not and was not the basis for any payments to the contractor. Rather, contractor payments are based on vouchers stating costs incurred, which are approved for payment by the administrative contracting officer. On the second issue, it was apparent that the CSCS system was not working properly for the B-2 program at Northrop at that time, and the Air Force program manager used a number of alternate means to assess program status. These included using his on-site team and other experts to perform regularly his own analysis. He also conducted formal, formal quarterly reviews of the cost, schedule, and technical status of the prime co contractor and the major subcontractors and he reviewed data obtained from new business proposals. The combination of these techniques provided management good visibility of critical program parameters. The results of these special analyses were reported along with Northrop data to Air Force and OSD management. Specifically, from the fiscal year 1981 through fiscal year 1986, the independent Air Force estimates of development costs were 12 to 19 percent higher than those generated by the Northrop system. Since the time of the 1988 Assistant U.S. Attorney's Memorandum, a complete review has been performed of the B-2 cost, schedule, and control system, recognized the deficiencies have been recognized, and that the system was revalidated by a tri-service team in February of 1990. The letter also quotes the 1988 memorandum to the effect that the early, early in the B-2 program, there were only two government auditors on site. In the early years of any program, when expenditures are relatively small, resident contract administration and audit staffs are also relatively small. As expenditures increase, on-site oversight staffing also increases. Further on-site audit report does not represent the total audit effort. Additional support is provided, as necessary, by the audit manager and others not permanently assigned to the plant. The increase of oversight personnel to the B-2 program tracks well with the increase in government business in that plant. Currently, there are 138 contract administration people and 23 auditors for a total of 161 oversight personnel assigned to this program at Northrop. The DPRO and the DCAA resident auditor consider this number to be adequate to do the job required of them. Also, in my conversation with you last week, Mr. Chairman, you raised concern that the actions of some employees of the Department of Defense may, might be inhibiting Justice Department cases against Northrop. Since our conversation, the DOD General Counsel and I have personally met with senior Justice Department officials and the U.S. Attorney involved. In that meeting, it became apparent that there is natural tension between the legitimate needs of program managers to have their systems built and delivered and the equally legitimate means of law enforcement of, uh, officials to preserve the likelihood of success of their investigations. The Justice Department officials agreed at our meeting to provide us with specific suggestions on how we can better meet the needs of our respective organizations, and we will review and respond to those suggestions as quickly as possible. In summary, I've, dis I've discussed with cognizant managers the contract administration process in place at Northrop on the B-2 program, the level of audit and oversight applied to the program, and the validity of data generated by the cost schedule control system in use. They have assured me that all monitoring systems necessary to protect the interests of the taxpayer and national security 
are cur currently in place and working well at Northrop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to read the statement, and I'll be pleased to answer any questions you and the members of the subcommittee have. Chair recognizes the distinguished gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Bliley, for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Betty, Mr. Richard testified earlier today that the Department of Defense's own investigation showed that hundreds of guidance units for the cruise missile had improper testing and that Northrop had generated hundreds of false reports. In, ad in addition, dozens of rate sensor assemblies for Harriers had been improperly tested and the results covered up by Northrop employees. What suspension and debarment action were taken by the Department of Defense as a result of this fraud? The uh, specific suspension and department, uh, debarment procedures that have been taken have been taken against the uh, Precision Products Division. Uh, that uh, is uh, currently in effect. Uh, it's being reviewed. Uh, as you probably know, uh, suspension and debarment is uh, actually for some limited period of time, three years in the case of debarment, except for drug-related drug cases. Suspension is uh, for an interim while investigations are going on. There's currently a review of whether uh, it's appropriate to lift that, uh, 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 that action. However, uh, there's, uh, before any, any such decision can be made, there's additional information we understand that's available from the uh, Justice Department, some of which is tied up. Uh, but uh, we're uh, in the process of, uh, of receiving that information and using that as a part of the uh, decision to lift that, uh, to, um, uh, whether or not to take action on that suspension. Well, the debarment. Will this type of conduct uh, that Northrop has engaged in, for example, be considered at, in the future when uh, it's time to consider a contract for some future program? Uh, is, uh, we have, uh, at the Department of Defense, I'm informed that we, ha we are in the process of uh, of improving our total process of, uh, of considering all elements of uh, contractors' prior performance as part of new contract action. Now, in the case of, uh, of uh, specific of the, uh, of the problems at the uh, Precision Products Division, uh, the, uh, there's uh, been no evidence that I know of, uh, certainly there's been no uh, prosecution of people that have been beyond that particular division that particular division has uh, is um, uh, the, the particular well, is location. Prosecution is standard. I mean, uh, you, you have to send somebody to jail before you consider doing that. I mean, when it's clear from the record that uh, the books were cooked. The uh, uh, Mr. Congressman, the uh, in all cases, uh, any actions we take have to be based on uh, on a due process and that uh, we have to have uh, evidence that uh, in uh, specifically that, that the problem has occurred. Uh, we also review whether there have been actions that have been taken to uh, fix the fundamental problems uh, and also a review of the people that have been involved. Mr. Betty, Mr. Richard testified that of the 100 largest corporations doing business with the, with the Defense Department, tw 23 of them have been found guilty of fraud. How many of them have been debarred? I don't have that information. Have any of them? I don't have In your knowledge? Uh, I just can't answer the question. I don't have the information. You have you me under oath? Will you, you submit it for the record? I'd be happy to. Mr. Richard testified that Northrop sought to lower the coal functioning uh, requirement uh, for the uh, air launch cruise missiles, uh, certain gyroscopes in the guidance system, from 65 degrees below to 40 degrees below. Do you have any idea how much such a change degraded the capability of the air launch cruise missile? I have uh, been given to understand that the, uh, that the Air Force, the SAC command, has uh, run a series of tests. Uh, for operational tests, uh, thus far they have not found evidence that uh, it has hampered the capability that they need. Well, if a cruise missile fails to function, 
What do you suggest we tell the soldiers, sailors, and airmen who relied on that fighter or that, or that missile? If what? it fails to function? Yeah, because it, uh, the standard being lowered. But there's no evidence that it, it will fail to function because of the standard being lower if we can believe well, the test has Well, why was the standard conducted. set that high to begin with? I can't answer that question specifically, Mr. Congressman, but I can tell you that from my years of experience in another, uh, in another kind of business, uh, it's uh, unlikely that all standards and specifications can be established at the beginning of a program that are immutable. Well, uh, wasn't it a fact that this one was lowered to what the contractor could produce? It's my understanding that there are uh, honest differences of opinion as to uh, what uh, procedures are necessary in order to, uh, to run that particular test, and there was some question as to what the actual requirement is. Did Northrop also succeed in getting the vibration specification for the rate sensor? Uh, assembly on the Harrier jet lowered from a requirement of 36 times the force of gravity to less than 12 times the force of gravity? I've read that, Mr. Congressman. I don't have any direct knowledge. Well, did you, didn't you hear it this morning? I heard it this morning, yes. And you never heard it before? I heard it uh, earlier this week. But I, but I don't know what the facts are. I know what's been alleged. Didn't they plead guilty to it? I'm, I'm sorry. I just have not been part of those detailed uh, reviews. Amazing. I have no further questions of this witness, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thanks, gentlemen. The uh, chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Bratt. Thank you, Mr. Betty, how long have you been in the position that you now hold? Eleven months and um, thirteen days. You came to the government from what role? I came to the government from thirty-seven years in uh, industry, non-defense primarily. In what industry? I said non-defense primarily. Uh -huh. Were you working for another company before Ford you came Ford Motor here? Company. Ford Motor Company uh, for 27 years and 10 years with Chrysler. I see. Uh, if you had a um, working in that, in that role, if you had had a um, company which had a chairman of the board, which I understand from the statement this morning is a felony, I mean, is a felon, convicted felon. Let's say you're working at a company and and a company comes to your company and wants to do business with you, and you find out the chairman of the board is a felon, and you find out that uh, uh, there are convictions, investigations, and uh, uh, criminal inquiries going on with regard to every major project which they have, are working on with regard to your company already, wouldn't it con cause you to begin to wonder whether or not you ought to keep doing business with that company? Is that a hypothetical question? Is that an answer? No. Well, give me an answer. I guess I would have to review the circumstances, determine what impact it would have on uh, the ability to uh, do business with that company and judge accordingly. Well, I must I'd have to say that based on that answer, I have serious doubts about whether you're the man for the job which you now hold, or at least serious doubts about whether you're willing to answer our questions here today honestly. Have you ever done business before in your private inter, uh, uh, activities with a company that had a felon for the chairman of the board and had been involved in uh, criminal investigations, inquiries, and convictions, and admissions of fraud with regard to every other major contract that had ever done with your business? Not to my knowledge. Well, then why wouldn't the same kind of standards apply to, with regard to the, the people of the United States? I'm not exactly sure how to answer that question from the standpoint that uh, the uh, uh, my primary responsibility is to see that we're, uh, we're uh, providing the uh, the weapon systems, et cetera, and protecting the taxpayers' money. Now, the, Did it ever occur uh, to you to the ask uh, why, how a, a person who is a convicted felon could get a security clearance as chairman of the board of this corporation that's involved in all of our major weapon systems, including the stealth bomber? 
Has, I'm sorry, would you ask the question again, please? Well, we understand from the information we've been given that the chairman of the Board of Norfolk Corporation has been convicted of a series of felonies. And for a felony, what is the facts? The chairman read it in his opening statement today. Yet he has a top secret security clearance and is involved in the production of our most uh, sensitive weapon systems. Did it ever occur to you to ask uh, how he got that security clearance? I did, I, no I didn't. Are you aware your department will not give those top secret clearances to the staff of this subcommittee, but the chairman of the board of this company, which has committed all of these violations and who personally has, a, has been convicted of a felony, is able to receive that kind of a clearance? Are you aware of that? I, yes, I, I learned that the, uh, because, of cor because of the correspondence between the chairman and the secretary of defense that there's some question of, that's been raised about, the, uh, about uh, providing security clearances to uh, members of the subcommittee and uh, that's a matter that I assume is being handled between the chairman and the secretary. Mr. Bed, your predecessor Robert Costello argued against the continuation of the B-2 bomber program and argued that uh, in paraphrasing that program he said uh, he was against because for among other reasons it is brought to you by the same people that brought you problems on the MX, problems on the cruise missile, the Harrier and so forth. Why is it that the performance of the Northrop Corporation in the 1980s hasn't similarly alarmed you and the other officials running the Pentagon? I'm not sure what you're reading from. Uh, I happen to have a statement that uh, was purportedly made by Mr. Costello and after some investigation at the end of 88 where uh, he indicated that uh, he thought that there was significant improvement and that he could report the program's acquisition strategy as sound, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not sure about the conflict. Yeah. Well, we're paraphrasing what he told the subcommittee staff, he told the secretary. So there seems to be a difference of opinion apparently about what he said. Why hasn't it alarmed you the same way it alarmed him? The B-2 program? Well, the fact that this company has, everything it's touched has had some taint of criminal activity involved in it. Well, Congressman, there's, uh, there have been ongoing uh, reviews uh, with uh, Northrop, both on the, uh, on the program and on the management. Uh, they have been conducted uh, over a period of time, which uh, have included a uh, Arthur D. Little study in 1988 and 1989. Uh, there were the uh, reviews uh, by Mr. Costello, uh, my predecessor, as you just indicated, in, the, in summer of 88. Uh, the Air Force Service Acquisition Executive has had at least quarterly reviews since uh, November of 87. Uh, there are quarterly uh, B-2 uh, reviews um, by uh, both at both corporate division and management, uh, corporate division management and corporate management, I should say, by at the four-star level. Uh, those ongoing reviews uh, have indicated uh, significant pr pr uh, improvements in the management as we see them from an operational standpoint not necessarily from the level at what you're asking, but from an operational standpoint, and that uh, they feel that the program at this point is, um, is uh, receiving the kind of oversight attention that it requires and deserves. Mr. Mr. Betty, I I'm uh, truly astonished by your response. Uh, the record of this company is so, uh, is, is so plain and, and so unambiguous that you would come prepared to defend them rather than come prepared to discuss the enormity of this problem with us is, is to my way of thinking uh, uh, perhaps an indication of the, of the fact that this administration is not gonna solve this problem with the, with the current personnel. Would you be willing to, submit, to provide to the committee uh, for our records all of the studies which you just read, uh, referred to, which you say indicates everything is all right? I'd be happy to. Yeah, but my time has expired for now. May I, may I make one comment? Uh, sure. The, uh, uh, my purpose here is not to defend uh, Northrop. My purpose here is really to describe to you why we have confidence that, uh, that, the, that uh, we can, they can and we can properly manage the programs that we have in place. Yeah, but see, all you ever refer to are the program reviews on the B-2. You, you don't ever seem to want to talk about all of these, uh, 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 the, the cruise missile, the Harrier, the... Uh, F-20, the F-18, all these other programs where there have been outrages committed. Well, it, it's unfortunate, but I, I was under the impression that the primary thrust of, the, uh, of today's review was going to be the B-2. 
Well, the staff met with you for almost three hours, and the staff talked to you about every one of these. So how could you have that impression? The staff also told me that we were not going to get into the details. We were going to talk about the management controls. <laughs> the ma management and control of Northrop, isn't that right? Yes. Well, how could, you <coughs> how could you talk about the management and control of Northrop without talking about all these programs that there's problems with? I, I have no more time, Chairman. Time the gentleman has expired. The chair recognizes now the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Axley. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Betty, I'd like to ask you a, a few questions on the uh, B-2 uh, stealth uh, bomber program. The uh, declination memo, uh, which I'm sure you're familiar with from the Department of Justice in the False Claim Act uh, case brought against Northrop's Advanced System Division, found that Northrop's cost schedule control system was not generating meaningful information. Let's examine uh, briefly the function of the CSCS uh, CS, uh, uh, system. Is the function of the CSCS to monitor a, a program? Yes, sir. And <clears throat> is the objective of the CSCS system to provide data with which to uh, measure costs and uh, scheduling? Yes, sir. Should an adequate CSCS be a tool that measures whether there are, are or will be cost overruns or failures to meet the uh, time deadline schedule? It, it can be used in that regard, yes, sir. Should an adequate CSCS system be able to measure the extent of cost overruns or delays? Uh, yes. The only reason I'm hesitating is that uh, it's best that at, uh, at providing current status, uh, it's, uh, it's not quite as precise in predicting, but yes, it should be able to do both. In your opinion, was the failure of the uh, CSCS system the reason uh, why the Navy uh, was recently uh, surprised unpleasantly as it was on the A-2 or on the A-12 uh, program? This is with a different contractor now. This is with a different Same contractor. Same system, though, essentially. The, it's, it's a... Uh, uh, all of the things you have said is, are, uh, are as I understand them. Uh, the um, uh, problem with the, um, with the A-12 uh, probably should have been picked up in the CSCS system, in my opinion. Uh, what, in your opinion, perhaps went wrong in, in this particular instance with, with the uh, system? Well, as I, as I understand it, what uh, his, uh, and, and again, we're in the process of review on the A-12, so that I need to see the complete uh, review. But as, as I understand the preliminary review, what, uh, what actually occurred was uh, there were uh, design changes in order to uh, reduce the uh, weight of the, uh, of the aircraft. In that process, the uh, designs became uh, uh, significantly more complicated. They, that resulted in significantly more complicated tooling. Uh, that increased the amount of tooling time that would be required. Uh, also, because of the uh, types of material involved, it uh, increased the complexity of, uh, and the time in getting good parts off of the, uh, of the tools when they were completed. And then there was a misjudgment on the capability of the tooling, uh, of the tooling capability to uh, handle the increased workload. And unfortunately, uh, it was one of those situations where it happened an inch at a time. And uh, finally, it collapsed on me. Would you describe that remains the CS? To be excuse me, that remains to be verified, but that's my understanding at this time. Would you uh, consider the CSCS system a management tool for use by the contractor? Yes, sir. As you know, the CSCS at Northrop was entirely inadequate. As a matter of fact, the DOJ, uh, the Department of Justice declination uh, memo, uh, describes it as, and I quote, essentially a farce. Um, if a key management uh, tool, if, it's, if that is a, uh, indeed uh, correct, and I'd be interested in your opinion on that, uh, what does that say about the quality of Northrop management in this particular area? Well, uh the, let me go back to the memo. That is one of the things I, uh, I checked with the people that were involved uh, in the, um, the um, allegation that the, uh, there was, that the information being provided was not adequate was correct. I mentioned that in my opening statement. Uh, in, in, as described to me, there, were actually, there was actually a period of time early in the program where the, uh, where, the, where the system being used was capable of providing adequate information for that period of time. The system then became overwhelmed for two reasons. One, as I understand it, it was manual and uh, the, it could not handle the volume of work. And secondly, there was a fundamental change in the design 
that cause what they call a rebaselining, which means that a lot of the information that was used as the basis for these projections was changed. And for a period of time between, I believe it was uh, 82 to 86, the, the, the system was just overwhelmed. Four the, years. About four years. Now, you're saying that a, a multinational corporation, multi-billion dollar sales, um, was operating a system manually? At the, initially, it was operated manually, that's correct. And, and was done so for at least four years? No, it wasn't for that whole period of time. At least I have no knowledge for how much of that period of time. But it was both the fact that they were trying to, uh, to uh, move it into an automatic system, automated system, and also the fact that there was a fundamental, uh, significant fundamental change to the design of the product that, that caused the uh, process to break down. It, w it was both. Now, the question could be, why did it take so long? And that's certainly a, a legitimate question. But I don't you have, have a good answer. You have a distinguished background in, in the business sector, in the private sector. Uh, doesn't it strike you as uh, rather uh, odd that a multinational corporation with a uh, international reputation like Northrop would be operating a, a, a control system uh, manually, uh, something that strikes of a uh, uh, 19th century uh, kind of uh, uh, effort? Yeah. Not having been directly involved, I'm not sure how to pass that judgment. It certainly was odd that it took that long to straighten it out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Time of the gentleman has expired. Gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Hey, Mr. Chairman, uh, since you weren't around to hear the horror stories about Northrop for virtually every year of the 80s, uh, you probably weren't uh, familiar, and that's probably why you're happy to come up here today with the internal um, kind of rhythm of these oversight investigation hearings. Uh, you, you heard earlier the problems. Yes, sir. The scandal. And uh, your function is to come on and you perform the function the Department of Defense has uh, repeatedly and uh, to give us the don't worry, be happy kind of uh, uh, approach. Uh, you said uh, you have confidence in the oversight process that you've established and the processes, and they are functioning well. You, de you described the processes in place, and you talked, used the terms accounting, manufacturing, property, estimating, cost accounting standards. And you said you recently, just as of yesterday, talked to the manager of the B-2 program, and he's confident in the system and in the Northrop people who have been cooperative and helpful to him. And we should then end our concern, allay any fears, and, and go merrily skipping down the, the, uh, uh, the road. Uh, aren't you bothered by the falsified tests? Of course I am. On the air launch cruise missile? You were here during the discussion. Doesn't it bother you that those first they falsified tests and then the test specs were, were uh, adjusted so that they, uh, they uh, jumped uh, the hoops. Of course it bothers you. Don't you think a cruise, air launch cruise missile should uh, have a, uh, uh, a, uh, uh, a system of hydraulics that can, the fluid uh, can withstand below 65 degrees below zero? Well, I, I can't speak to the minus 65 degrees below zero. What I, could, what I believe uh, is necessary is that they meet the operational requirements of the Air Force. But they don't. And you change them. The Air Force changed them. On the MX, they falsified tests. On the B-2, they falsified tests. On the Harrier, they falsified tests. And if you're not concerned with the grunts on the ground, how about the American people and the whole idea of a, uh, a deterrence policy in, in, uh, in, in, that ends up in nuclear war. We're talking about the MS, the L MX, the land-based missile system. We're talking about this great wonder, the B-2, the stealth bomber. We're talking about air launch cruise missiles as well as the Harrier aircraft. And the question is? The question is, you're not bothered. You're I am confident very, I in am the oversight processes and they're functioning well. What, uh, I, I am bothered by, uh, by the problems, I'm bothered by the uh, mischarges, I'm bothered by the allegations, and, I, and uh, to the extent that we find uh, people responsible for that, we won't tolerate That's it. That's bull crap. You, you, 
you come up and say that stuff, and you don't even mean it. I wish we had, you guys believe in lie detectors down there, but you guys come up and say that stuff, and, you, and we should have a buzzer that rings on that stuff. On every contract that they've had, they've screwed up criminally. Not just, not just personal negligence or nonfeasance or malfeasance, but criminal activity. If they and were you keep doing business with them as if it were your money. If it were your money, I'm sure you would have stopped them a long time ago. You guys say on this on the 65 below zero thing, well, we'll just bump up the standards. They can't meet those, we'll bump up again. And, on, and we paid uh, hundreds of thousand dollars for one cruise missile floating over the Soviet si Siberia aimed for a missile site or for a population center that goes down because you guys moved the specs up. But we complain about a $7,600 coffee pot or a $500 hammer or a $5,000 toilet seat, and you come in and tell, these are high specs. We have to make sure these coffee pots withstand nuclear war. When you don't even make, make sure our air launch cruise missiles withstand a 65 below zero tra trajectory. I, and, and you come up here and tell us, don't worry, we're confident in the oversight processes and they are functioning well. And you talked to the manager of the B-2 yesterday and he's confident in the system and he wants to thank the Northrop people for being so cooperative. The suspension department that's used as a Pentagon is not as a punitive ma ma matter. I think it should be used because it's very instructive. But rather, the, the, the department debarment or suspension process is there when the Pentagon believes a corporation is not presently responsible and or the government's interests are not currently being protected. Read taxpayers, is that correct? I believe that's correct. I, I lost track of the question. Well, it's your program I'm describing. I, it's <laughs> not, the suspension debarment program is used by you not as a punitive measure, even though I think you should use it because it's highly dis instructive, but rather because you want a corporation to be presently responsible and to protect the government's interest, taxpayers' interest. That's the policy. Okay. What's the basis for the presently responsible doctrine when, a, when it's applied to a bank robber who, once out the door, is therefore not going to rob any more any bank. He's presently responsible in that circumstances. Or Manuel Noriega when he's in the can down in uh, Florida. He's presently responsible under that doctrine. Tell me, that, tell me how I'm wrong. I, I guess I just don't understand the question, Congressman. Once the bank robber is standing on the sidewalk outside of the bank he robbed, we should trust him under the presently responsible doctrine. The, there's uh, nothing that, there's nothing that, that, under your understanding of it, having ignored Northrop for 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, April of 90 from the prosecutors, we should now accept them as presently responsible as they're standing on the street outside the Treasury Department Our with, a, with a big truck. <laughs> Filled with the cash they robbed? Yeah. <laughs> Congressman, as I understand our process, uh, what, uh, what, the, uh, what the people try to do in reviewing them is to make sure that whatever has happened, uh, whatever systems, procedures, or Well, this is, this, uh, you, you just said about the B-2. Look at just the B-2 part of the program. Justice currently has two ongoing criminal investigations of Northrop and the B-2. But your people, whom you're confident in, in, in terms of the oversight process, that these processes are functioning well, and this company is presently responsible. But, but, but Congressman, we're, we're precluded to act on the allegations. We have to, we have to act on evidence. Do, do you know what the Justice Department has? I do not know what the Justice Department has. You just told me you have to act on the evidence. That's correct. But you don't have the evidence. I don't have the evidence. That makes your decision a lot easier to rationalize. But it, 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 it's a pretty stupid process if you ask me. How do you assure us that Northrop is okay on the B-2? I assure you that Northrop's okay on the B-2 to the extent that I can. 
As and, a result and you don't look of, at the evidence. As a result of <laughs> I don't know which one I'm talking to. Well, <laughs> you, you can talk to either one of us. Who do you appear? I, I can only respond on the basis of the evidence that I have. And I have to talk to the people who are on site, who are, who are dealing Thank with you, this Mr. thing Chairman. on a day-to-day -day basis, and that, and that is exactly who I have talked to. Would, would the gentleman yield? Sure. Mr. Betty, have you ever talked to anybody at the Justice Department about whether Northrop should be viewed as being a presently responsible contractor? Mr. Chairman, the discussion that I had with the people of the Justice Department is what I related in the opening statement, where as a result of my conversation with you, I asked our, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, I, I talked to uh, Mr. Richards, who was here earlier, and we set up a meeting where he brought over uh, seven people, himself plus six other people, where we talked about the whole process as opposed to a specific issue. We talked about the fact that uh, uh, the allegations that he talked about earlier this morning of where uh, we were either either uh, inadvertently or or perhaps in some cases advertently, I don't know that, of um, uh, acting in such a manner that made it difficult for them to prosecute cases. If they had specific examples of where individuals uh, were directly involved, uh, we wanted to review those and look at those. And if we have procedural issues or systematic systemic uh, problems, uh, they offered to bring us some specific uh, recommendations on what we could do differently. So that's, that's, the, that's the only context in which I spoke to the Justice Department. So these events all followed the finding that Northrop was a presently responsible contractor. I'm sorry, I couldn't these, hear you. These, these events, your discussions with the Justice Department, have all followed the, the decision made at the Department of Defense that Northrop was a presently responsible contractor, have they not? Well, I'm, I'm not sure how to answer that. I don't know if there was a specific judgment made uh, in that regard or uh, whether it's the absence of uh, being judged the opposite. I'm assuming that, that, that your judgment is that Northrop is presently responsible, should continue on as a contractor, uh, and that this decision was made some time back. Your discussions with regard to Northrop with the Justice Department were made somewhat later, in the last week or ten days, were they not? Yes, sir. I'm curious, how do you, 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 how can you tell us that you've had an input from the agency which is diligently trying to prosecute these people for criminal misbehavior? Well, our discussion, uh, Mr. Chairman, did not dwell specifically on B-2. It dwelled on the broader issue that I thought you had directed me to is, uh, is uh, um, our, do we have a fundamental problem of uh, interfering with um, Department of uh, Justice's cases. I'm not asking you to, to interfere in the Justice Department's proceedings. I'm suggesting that it would be very prudent for you to discuss with the Justice Department in a timely fashion whether or not Northrop is qualified to continue as a defense contractor. And I'm pointing out that, in my view, to uh, make, the, make the decision that they are qualified and that they are responsible without a, an ongoing program or pattern or regimen of discussions with the Justice Department on decisions relative to contracts, contracting, and relative to whether or not they should continue to be eligible for contracts, appears to be the wrong course for you to take. You are, you are denying, the or the Defense Department is denying itself the ability to have the information as to whether or not these people are, are the kind of folks you want to be contracting with. You haven't got a single weapon system in which you're engaged uh, in, in which you're engaged with procuring from Northrop where you do not have evidence of severe with wrongdoing, late deliveries, overcharging, uh, programs that don't meet their original specs where the specifications have to be changed, cost overruns, uh, misbehavior with regard to uh, substitutions of parts, failure to uh, proper, provide uh, proper parts to and to maintain proper inventories. They falsify tests and test results. They tell you that tests have been performed where in fact none have been performed. Uh, they give you uh, they give you equipment that where the where the uh, where where the uh, where essential components uh, the the fluids and the guidance system don't work at the temperatures that they're supposed to work at. 
they give you missiles where they procure the guidance systems in part from, from uh, Radio Shack and places of that kind. They, they throw away dumpsters full of gold-plated parts and extremely valuable pumps and things of that kind. They've lost control of their, of their property management system uh, and, and, and a number of their officials are under indictment. An officer of the, um, the chief executive officer, now the chairman of the board, is a convicted felon. I, I, I can't quite understand what you're doing over there, sir. Well, I've got to recess while I go and vote. I will return in 15 minutes and we will, we will reconvene at that time. And we will look forward to continuing questions here. Thank you, Mr. Betty. We will be back in 15 minutes. Subcommittee will come to order. Mr. Betty, the, um, are you aware of the letter from the Justice Department to Mr. O. Kevin Vincent, dated April 26, 1990, and signed by the United States Attorney, Assistant U.S. Attorney, and Special Assistant assigned to the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Air Force? I don't think so, sir. We will make we'll make a copy of that available to you so that you uh, have it ready ready for you. Now, while that is being made available to you, I'd like to read from, read to you from the letter where the Justice Department describes its beliefs concerning the Northrop's present responsibility and Northrop's assertion in a memorandum that claims that they were taken care of that they have taken care of the problem. The attorneys for the Justice Department wrote as follows. The general theme of this, parenthesis Northrop's, close parenthesis, 65 page nor memorandum, disclaims Northrop's corporate responsibility for falsification and substitution of test results on flight data transmitters for the ALCM and rate sensor assemblies for the Harrier jet. Throughout this document, the emphasis is on the field performance of these parts and downplays the criminal er criminality as only testing irregularities. It goes on to say, if Northrop views its corporate responsibility to comply with the law as primarily a concern of whether a part appears to function properly, then its out of focus perspective raises a serious issue as to its, quote, present responsibility, close quote. If Northrop has not changed its beliefs after being convicted, then it is, how it is hard to vision that Northrop is now presently responsible. And I end the quote there from the letter. It would appear that the prosecutors in this case question whether Northrop is presently responsibility, or rather is presently responsible. How do you, re how do you view the situation with regard to present responsibility of Northrop? And, uh, what is, and, and how do you uh, justify your difference of views with the Department of Justice, Mr. Betty? Um. I don't know that I can answer, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, directly in terms of my views. We have a process in the department which uh, reviews uh, the um, items such as uh, a specific areas such as present responsibility as part of the whole uh, uh, review process for suspension and debarment. Uh, I'm neither a lawyer nor am I sufficiently familiar with uh, the judgments on present responsibility to be able to respond directly to you. Uh, well, let me the read only further from the letter to Mr. Vincent. It has this to say. Although this is meant to apply to PPD, that's a division of Northrop, as you know, Northrop has apparently not been able to cure significant testing problems in other divisions, which is envisioned by two ongoing criminal investigations currently being run in this district. Again, we feel the current investigations against Northrop, including one at the B2 division, bear heavily on the issue of present responsibility. Now, Mr. Betty, it seems clear that the Justice Department is telling you, or the recipient of the letter, who was one of uh, your subordinates, that not only when you examine the facts of the cruise missile case, but when you examine the facts of two other cases, including B-2, you would seriously, seriously join them in questioning whether Northrop is presently responsible. Yet they are not currently suspended at Northrop, 
and therefore it must be assumed that the Department of Defense, including yourself, believes that the taxpayer's interests are being properly protected. Now again, this is at variance with the views of the Department of Justice. Can you explain the difference of views between the Department of Justice uh, on the one hand and the Defense Department and yourself on the other with regard to the present responsibility of the Northrop Corporation? Well, what, uh, what you're reading from is a uh, letter from uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Fahey, who, uh, who's expressing his opinion. Uh, what we don't have is the response from Mr. Uh, Vincent uh, expressing uh, uh, whatever his opinion is. Uh, I have not been involved in that process or that procedure, so I don't know what uh, exchanges uh, occurred between these two. I don't know what the basis of differences of, of opinion are between these two individuals. Uh, had it been provided to me before the uh, meeting, I would have uh, called Mr. Vincent in and uh, talked to him specifically about the issue. Well, from your understanding of the facts, do you believe that Northrop is presently responsible and should not be disqualified on the basis of all of the serious incompetence and misbehavior that we have seen in connection with their performance under their different contracts? What, what, I have, uh, what I have heard, Mr. Chairman, is a number of allegations. Frankly, I can't separate out which of those allegations are supported in fact and which are not, based on uh, my current knowledge. The people uh, who have been reviewing this in uh, detail apparently do not feel that there's a cause uh, to uh, consider Northrop not presently responsible. Well, Ms. Betty, has there ever been a serious investigation by the Defense Department with regard to whether Norfolk should be disqualified because of the serious misbehavior associated with its contract compliance? The only knowledge I have uh, of that question, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, is, uh, is uh, specifically directed to the Precision Products Division. And there, there of course, is suspension. It's as a result of uh, also the criminal activity that uh, was previously testified to. That's the only direct knowledge I have. Could you submit to the committee any investigations that have been made by the Defense Department or any of the agencies of the Defense Department with regard to disqualification of Northrop because of serious misbehavior in connection with any of the contracts that we have been discussing today? Without objection, the record will remain open for purposes of, of receiving that information. Now, just one further question. I note my time has expired. Um, we have here a curious situation. Defense Department has investigated Northrop in connection with a number of matters. They find two things in connection with those. The first is serious misbehavior in the case of each one. In some instances, it's culminated with successful prosecution, convictions, or pleas of guilty. In other instances, the prosecution is still going on. In other instances, however, the investigation is uh, declined or terminated because of behavior at the Defense Department, which appears to constitute to the Defense, De or rather to the Justice Department, uh, essentially acquiescence by the Defense Department in what they regard as some serious criminal mis misbehavior. Now, my question to you is, why the difference in approach between yourself and the Defense, and the defense Department on one hand and the Justice Department on the other? Why is it that justice on the basis of serious investigations finds serious criminal misbehavior, suggests disqualification of Norfolk, but no, uh, rather of Northrop, but no such, but no such uh, recommendations or behavior of that sort takes place at the Defense Department? Well, I can't explain the difference of opinion without uh, getting into uh, the specific details, but I guess one of, the, one of the points that I would like to make that may bear on, on your question is that, uh, is that I'm not here to defend Northrop. That's not my intent at all. My intent is to speak specifically to the issue of whether or not uh, we feel that the programs we have ongoing now are being properly controlled, are being properly managed. Uh, to the extent that uh, in, in, in most of the allegations are a couple of years old, uh, to the extent that the, pro that the people have not been uh, uh, properly addressed, the issues have not been properly addressed, uh, and there's specific um, um, data to the contrary, we should deal both with the people involved and with the issues involved. 
what i have tried to do is to try to determine whether there has been sufficient progress to address those issues of management that were brought up to to indicate whether our the programs we have currently in place are being properly managed one of the items i found out was as a result of the review of northrop management from i believe it's nineteen eighty seven if you look at the corporate organization chart of northrop in nineteen eighty seven it had fifty positions twenty five of those individuals are now gone another i believe it's ten have different jobs only fifteen are in their current position so in the last three years there's been a significant turnover in the in the management of northrop and that's been part of the process now whether that has fixed all of the problems you've uh, you've alleged to, you've spoken to i don't know yeah, now two of those changes to which you alert uh, you allege are uh, movement between the ceo and the chairman of the board one one move from the ceo to the chairman of the board and the other move from the chairman of the board to the ceo is that right i believe those would be part of the 10 changes no. I, I don't detect that any of them went to jail um, but I, I'm curious, how, what does this all mean to me? It, to you, it means that, there, that, that there's a process of change. Can you tell me that this change has been for the better? I would hope it's for the better. I would but hope that you, the... Can you, can you sit there under oath and tell me that it has been a change for the better? I cannot tell you that, Mr. Chairman, because uh, I was not uh, here, uh, nor did I experience what uh, Northrop did uh, during that period of 87. I, I can go by what's been reported to me, and I can go by what uh, the people on the, that are uh, there managing the programs uh, and are close to it can tell me is happening today. Well, my... Uh, I would just observe that in, in, in connection with your statement that you said that you've met personally with the commander of the Defense Plant Representative Office, the commander of the Defense Contract Management Command, and the, and the Defense Contract Audit Agency Auditor for Northrop, as well as the, director, the Deputy Director of DCAA, as well as other Air Force and DOD officials to satisfy myself that the people who have the frontline responsibility for managing the programs and protecting the the taxpayers' interests are themselves satisfied. One, proper management and control processes, procedures, and disciplines are in place. And two, they are being adhered to. And three, they saw no evidence of misconduct in day-to-day -day dealings with the company. Uh, have any of these people reviewed the evidence that the Department of Justice has uh, found to be so compelling in their communications with your agency? I did not ask that specific question, sir. Uh, most of that data is, uh, is, and those allegations are two years old two or more years old. Aren't these exactly the agencies that has done what the Defense Department is, uh, has done with regard to these contracts that the, defense, uh, that the Justice Department finds to be acquiescence in misbehavior? These are the agencies that we're supposed to, that we're supposed to monitor and to superintend the conduct of these, of these contracts with uh, the proper care. The Justice Department has already advised you that the behavior of these people has been of such character as to constitute acquiescence in serious misbehavior or waiver of wrongdoing. Mr. Chairman, I I'm, I'm, I'm curious if you're I going to the right place to check to find out whether whether the contracts are being properly superintended by your agency. Uh, the, I, I, it, it appears that the Justice Department finds that there's serious misbehavior, so you go to the people that they say have acquiesced in the wrongdoing I, to check I it have, out. I have no knowledge that they have uh, specifically talked about the DCAA or the AFPRO people, or the uh, DPRO people. That, that well, may be the case, but that's not my understanding. Well, the, the, the Justice Department has said that the, that the, prog that the assistant program officer and the, uh, and the AFPRO have been involved in behavior which constitutes either waiver or acquiescence in wrongdoing. The, uh, now, these, these are hardly the kind of watchdogs I'd want watching over my affairs. The uh, AFPRO uh, has, uh, has been in place uh, since uh, 1987. Well, uh, that's, there's, that's there's right during the time about which the Justice Department complains. Well, I'd, I'd, have to, I'd, have to, I'd have to see the uh, I'd have to see the data, Mr. Chairman. That's I did not understand well, that. I'll, I don't I'll, I don't believe. My time has expired, and I'm going to recognize my colleagues because I don't want to don't want to consume too much. But I'm going to read to you a few of the recent items of correspondence, which I think you will find very interesting. 
about the diligence with which these good people approach their responsibilities to protect taxpayers. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Minnesota. You talked about the, uh, the division, the PPD division had Gamron and. I'm sorry. Have you been asked about the, the PPD of division heads, Yamron and Eng, uh, Engler? Uh, Yamron? Okay, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the Central District, California, U.S. Attorney and the Assistant, Mr. Fay was here earlier, wrote to Mr. O. Kev uh, o uh, um, Kevin Vincent uh, again in April of this year that uh, they are suggesting a fact-based debarment uh, uh, be appropriate. Uh, and uh, they looked at factual information that had been uh, gathered on the cruise miss missile. And they went on to say, and I quote, it appears that Northrop's Precision Products Division, this PPD division uh, that we've been talking about, Joseph Yamron and Leopold Engler in particular, were involved since at least 1983 and knowingly provided out-of-spec flight data transmitters for use in the air launch cruise missile. We believe that the knowing participation of these individuals could be proved by the preponderance of evidence. This, of course, is relevant to Northrop's present responsibility inasmuch as Northrop has decided to reinstate both Yamron and Angler as managers. Mr. Betty, uh, how can you possibly argue that a corporation that reinstates employees as managers engaged in this kind of behavior is presently responsible? My understanding is that the uh, charges against both those people were dropped. Uh, we're talking about criminal charges where the, the, the burden of proof is uh, uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. We all, I know you're not a lawyer, but we all watch Perry Mason and, and L.A. Law and the rest of it. They stay in their letter. We believe that the knowing participation of these individuals could be proved by the preponderance of the evidence. Certainly, certainly uh, uh, something that uh, is a standard that the, uh, uh, the board for suspension and debarment embraces. And the question is, how can, how can we find this corporation that puts these two bad actors back in as managers uh, and, the, and the U.S. Department of Justice people telling you guys that these are bad actors and shouldn't be, uh, and, and Northrop shouldn't be found presently responsible under those circumstances, and you go ahead and find them presently responsible? Congressman, there's absolutely no way that I can respond to uh, a one-way correspondence where, uh, where the assistant U United States attorney makes his allegations to someone, uh, and we don't even have the response of that individual. Uh, I mean, well, I have no doubt that Mr. Fahey uh, seriously believes what he has here. Now, whether those are the facts or not, I just don't know. Well, it's interesting. Before I ran over for a vote, you told me you haven't talked to these people. Pardon me? You, you told me you haven't talked to these people. To Faye and the, and the prosecutor. Yeah. The people who have been living yeah. and breathing and uh, uh, quizzing Northrop and prosecuting could, Northrop for years now. Could I, could I just correct that? I, I, yeah. I talked to uh, Mr. Fahey was one of the group of seven that came over from the Justice Department to talk about the general subject in preparation how, for this hearing of how to improve the overall process. Uh, at that point in time, we didn't dwell on uh, on these uh, older cases. But we talked about how do how do we do it better in the future? How do we fix the process as opposed to uh, re? Um, Continuing to dwell on the uh, two and three year old cases. That's what we did in that re in that review. But we're back to this presently responsible or present responsibility issue, which you guys use as the basis and w upon which to keep doing business with American taxpayers' money with Northrop Corporation. And I just can't fathom that. We had a chat out in the hall. I just that's the, that's the concern. And and when when you're faced with here are two people, managers of the division, who were involved in knowingly providing out-of-spec 
flight data transmitters for use in our air launch cruise missile, a vital component and costly component of our national security, our defense, and this company puts these bad actors back in again, and the prosecutor says they, they did this beyond a preponderance of evidence, and it's relevant to the present responsibility of the uh, company, and we have a black hole in terms of our information here. Well, Congressman, again, I'm not a lawyer, but if uh, they knowingly provided the out of spec, et cetera, et cetera, proved by a preponderance of evidence, I'm not, it's not clear to me why they dropped the charges. Well, because it's burden of proof. It, it, the burden of proof for a criminal uh, carrying a criminal charge is beyond a reasonable doubt. If one person on a jury of, say, 12 finds that, well, they, it's not beyond a reasonable doubt, and the defense attorney embr embraces a definition of reasonable doubt to involve any little kind of thought that maybe they're not guilty, they are found guilty under assistance. That's criminal justice. This is a preponderance of evidence standard that's relevant to the presently responsible decision that you guys are making. And the prosecutors say clearly it's beyond a preponderance of evidence. And yet, and that's, I guess you share my question as to how these guys get back in here again, and you guys allow them presently responsible. Another case, in addition to Mr. C Clarence Gonzalez was the general manager of the Northrop plant making components for both the cruise missile and the Harrier, and he pled guilty to one count of conspiracy and seven false statements on the cruise missile program. There the burden was met beyond a reasonable doubt. He pleaded out. In addition, Howard Hyde, who was the chief engineer, pled guilty to one count of conspiracy and two false statements on the Harrier jet program. So it would appear that we have the general manager, the chief engineer, and two other man managers who were vice presidents of this corporation in the eyes of the Justice Department knowingly involved in this scheme, and Northrop has chosen to reinstate at least two of these guys, and yet you find them presently responsible. Well, I probably learned more about law just now than I did by watching <laughs> Perry Mason. But you got to, your job here is to defend the Department of, of Defense's ju and justify that decision of presently respond. It obviously it bothers you, does it not? Well, uh, the whole proceeding bothers me, but uh, I think, uh, <laughs> I think uh, here again we have, uh, you know, we have uh, the uh, uh, assistant district attorney uh, or assistant US, United States attorney giving us his opinion. And what I'd really like to hear is what, what's the, what's the opposite well, that's view? That's why we invited you today. We, I'm, we, I'm not the, I, I'm sorry, but I'm under false pretenses then. Okay. This is a big deal. The biggest in the public mind issue today in the Department of Defense and symbol of cuts, how far, how much, and the rest of it is this stealth bomber. This is the decision as to whether Northrop's going to continue contracting with the taxpayers on the stealth bomber. It seems to me that this is information that you should have had readily available in your portfolio, on your tongue, in this discussion as the uh, undersecretary for procurement, acquisition. acquisition and procurement? Just acquisition. Acquisition. In the title, anyway. Congressman, uh, the, uh, if, if, the, if the issue in your mind is whether we go ahead with the B-2 or not. No, it's not. If okay. The issue is why don't you have this information? You're top of the heap. Oh. You're, and, and you're up here representing the heap. Yeah. I, mean. well, <laughs> I, hadn't, I hadn't heard it put quite that way before. <laughs> but the, uh, the, uh, there's uh, absolutely no way that I'm going to have all the details of every transaction that we're involved with. But, but the thing I tried to concentrate on the B-2 that I try to satisfy myself on is exactly what, what you quoted uh, back to me, and that is the fact that we have adequate controls in place today. It has nothing to do with present responsibility as a result of the uh, precision products uh, piece. It has to do with do we have, are we satisfied that we have adequate controls to discharge that program? We're not going to resource it. A marvelous facility to listen to two people. <laughs> the, uh
time of the gentleman has expired. The chair recognizes now the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Blatt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Betty, one of the defenses raised by Northrop in response to the allegations about the CSCS deficiencies in the B-2 program is that CSCS wasn't used to approve payment. So what's everybody shouting about? But isn't it true that the cost to maintain the CSCS system was part of a general overhead of the B-2 program? And did the Air Force paid for it? in spite of the fact that the CSCS system was not generating any useful information? I asked that same question myself, Congressman, because it seemed to me that if it wasn't generating useful information, the question is why have it? Uh, the answer that I have that uh, makes uh, some sense to me is that it would, first of all, there was useful information being provided. It was not, however, complete. For example, it was useful, uh, at least through a portion okay. of that time, for actual it was not good for projection. Uh, all right. And well, then, you say some of that information was good. Yeah. Well, in light of that, is the Department of Defense pursuing the idea of recovering costs for the part that wasn't any good from well, Norfolk? Yeah, it, uh, I'm afraid it's not quite that simple, but, to the, but certainly it's a good question. Yeah, it sure is, because isn't it likely that the same Air Force acquiescence that prevented a general recovery will also block recovery for this misbilled expense? I, I don't know how to answer that. It's Well, I got another one. Maybe you know how to answer this. <laughs> Has anyone's career ever suffered for this? I mean, you had all of these officers out there high-ranking officers, probably <laughs> colonels, very senior, looking for their stars. Have any of them ever suffered as a result of the foul-ups that have occurred? Of the CSCS or in more general? In, 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 in Northrop, since you've been at second, I, mean, I don't want to ask you to go back in history. I don't want to get that. But since 89, I assume you came on in 89. Eleven and a half months, sir. Yes. It just grew to three Has years. anybody suffered in the program since? Have you got the same guy in charge out there that when you first came on? Yes. But, but, the, but the situations are... <coughs> the General situ Schofield is still a program manager? Yes, he is. And he's been for four or five years? Since uh, 87, I believe. When did he make General? Uh, I don't know that. Well, you so can he's supply been program that. manager since 83. You can supply that information for the committee. Since 83, he's yes, been sir. there all this time, and all of these things have been happening. I assume he must be getting good fitness reports, uh, or he wouldn't be there. I hope that's the well, case. Uh, now you're, but you're specifically talking about the CSCS system. In 83, and what is it? CSCS what was the price system? estimate in 83, and what's the price estimate now? Uh, on the B-2. I don't, I don't have those numbers in my head, sir. I would like for you to supply for this committee, because I think your whole system is fatally flawed. Here's what I think happens. You put somebody in charge of a program, and they go out there to work with a contractor, and the chairman gets the, the officer by the shoulder when they come in, and he said, Joe, you and I are going to get along fine. We're not going to have any problems. And they don't, because they whine and dine and entertain and and take care of this person because they know this person has the pan on the spigot. And they become not inspectors for the Defense Department to see that the taxpayers of the United States get that just due, oh, they are if it doesn't get in the way, but meantime, they become advocates of the program because in addition, I would like you to furnish for this committee the name of one officer who came back to the Defense Department and said, this program with contractor X is so bad, so far off the target, that I recommend you terminate the program. And that that officer, whoever he was that did it, received prompt promotion afterwards. I'll bet you they will cash in pretty quickly and uh, retire. Thank you, well, Mr. Chairman. I Ms. have no further 
question. I, I'd like to make one comment, if I may. Mr. Uh, Betty, go ahead. Uh, I, I understand that, uh, Mr. Congressman, that uh, you, you were you're trying to drive home a point to me, and I appreciate that. However, there are an awful lot of very good and very dedicated people out there who are managing programs for us, who are working long hours, who are doing the best they can for this country. And, uh, and, I, yeah, yes, and I think I, that your general statement kind of impugned well, a lot of very good people. Well, my time, Mr. Betty, I, I agree with you because our Defense Department has worked, our, our, our fleet sail, they accomplished their mission. But too many cases have been demonstrated by the media and have been discovered by this committee of cases where the watchdog has fallen asleep. And in those cases, we should vigorously pursue it and we should take appropriate action. I don't and think the Defense Department should that. take appropriate action to rotate those officers off of the project I if they're not doing the job. I fully agree with you. I couldn't agree with you more. And punish the people who grant the waivers unnecessarily. And when the waivers are granted, seek recovery from the contractor for uh, the fact that he is not living up to the original I specification. Agree. I agree with you. I fully agree with you. And that's certainly my intent. In your 11 months, have you pulled the program officer off the job? I have not, nor have I had cause to. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks, the gentleman. The gentleman from Kansas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, as I sit here and listen to this, I have to tell you that uh, my blood just starts boiling. I'm a member of the, the Budget Committee, and I've spent hundreds of hours this year trying to kill this B-2 program. And uh, listening to the comments made today just makes me wish I would have gotten started earlier. You know, one of my favorite shows on television growing up as a youngster was The Untouchables. Remember that show? Elliot Ness shaking, chasing the likes of Frank Nitti and Al Capone, and one of the one of the scenes that I remember, in fact, that's where I first learned about the Fifth Amendment, because about the time Elliot Ness would get his hands on somebody, they would stand up and want to take the Fifth Amendment. And you know something? I find it I, really unbelievable, is the best way I can describe it, unbelievable that, that Mr. Jones, the chairman of the board, the guy that's operating and running Northrop, refuses to appear before this committee and has made it very clear that he would exert his Fifth Amendment rights in response to all questions. You know, that is a bloody outrage that the person that is running the Northrop Corporation that has done billions of dollars worth of business with the government during the Reagan years does 90 percent of its business with the government and the and the head person refuses to appear before a congressional committee and answer questions and says that he will exert his Fifth Amendment rights in response to questions of this nature. A bloody outrage. And, and Mr. Betty, I'm going to undertake to be as fair to you as I possibly can. I appreciate that. But I want to tell you something. As one member of Congress, I am not going to vote for another dime to the Northrop Corporation until Mr. Jones is gone. And I'm not going to vote for another dime to the Northrop Corporation for any reason until there's new management there. I am sick and tired of this kind of arrogant behavior on the part of people like Jones and the rest of this high-level management team out there. This is outrageous. And you know something? A person in your position, you, you ought to be after them like a junkyard dog chasing these people day and night for this kind of activity. And I would just encourage you to do that. I, you know, I just can't find the words to express my absolute disgust with this. You know, one of the things that's just amazing to me in this country today is, is that no one is held accountable for anything anymore. No one is. The American taxpayers are outraged with the savings and loan mess. They're outraged with the kind of corruption we have seen over the last 10 years in the Pentagon, and it seems like no one is really held accountable. Well, I'll tell you something. I hold Jones accountable. And I think the Congress of the United States ought to hold him accountable. And I think that every shareholder in the, in the Northrop Corporation 
should know that this member of Congress is going to spend all of my energy that I can find to prevent that corporation from getting another dime in government contracts until there is new management. And I would hope that those in the Pentagon like you, Mr. Betty, would share my outrage and communicate that to the people running this corporation. We're not going to tolerate felons, and we're not going to tolerate people that refuse to come before the Congress of the United States and answer basic questions about what they're doing and threaten to exert their Fifth Amendment rights. Not when they're doing 90 percent of their business with this government and relying on the taxpayers of this country for 90 percent of their business and they refuse to answer any questions. This is an incredible outrage. Do you share my outrage and are you prepared to go back and tell the Secretary of Defense, Mr. Cheney, that you believe that we, you shouldn't do any more business with this corporation until at least the chairman of the board is prepared to answer questions? Do you share my outrage and are you prepared, Mr. Betty, to go back to, to, to Secretary Cheney and to President George Bush and ask him to terminate any further discussions and negotiations with the Northrop Corporation until we get some new management that can at least come in and start being honest and answer questions for the American taxpayers. Will you do that, Mr. Betty? That's, uh, that's a very difficult uh, choice you give me. I mean, I can either be outraged as a private citizen or else I can, uh, I can, um, um, I can take uh, the, or I can uh, uh, continue to exert good business judgment on behalf of uh, the nation and of, on behalf of the taxpayers. Well, the Mr. inability Betty, let me just make of point. Mr. Let, let you me know, just, may I finish my point? Sure. Thank you. Uh, the fact that uh, Mr. Jones would not appear before this uh, subcommittee is, uh, is a matter between the subcommittee and Mr. Jones, and uh, I assume that you have plenty of uh, ways that you can cause that to happen. And if he chooses to, uh, to hide behind a, a constitutional right, I'm not really sure how I get involved in the middle of that. Uh, well, I would just observe that, that we are dealing with a company now that's operated by a, apparently a convicted felon, someone who has a long history, uh, some, a company that has a long history of problems with the law, as evidenced by this two-page list of legal problems. And I hold the top person responsible. I don't know about anybody else in this country, or in the Congress for that matter, but I have a feeling that a number of my colleagues would share my view that when we're talking about this kind of problem, we go to the top. You know, where is the Truman attitude? The buck stops here, okay? And that's the approach that I would urge you to take. And I, I you know, Mr. Betty, honestly, I would hope that you would go to Secretary Cheney and say, this guy is a bad actor, and this management is a bad operation. We have them that have already pleaded guilty to 34 counts of falsified test. How much more evidence do we need? 34 counts. That is prima facie evidence that we shouldn't be doing business with them unless we absolutely have to. And I guess, Mr. Betty, all I'm asking you to do is if you share my outrage, to go back to Secretary Cheney and have Secretary Cheney pick up the phone. That's all he needs to do. And say to Mr. Jones, Mr. Jones, shut the lights out tonight on your way home because the Congress is fed up with you and because we are fed up with you. And we're not going to be doing business with the Northrop Corporation anymore until there is new management. Send the word to the Board of Directors of the Northrop Corporation. Send the word to the shareholders. And you know what will happen? The same thing will happen that happened with Mr. David Lewis when he chaired General Dynamics several years ago and got into the same sort of problems before this same committee. And at that time, I said, Mr. Jones, you should resign. And a few weeks later, he resigned. And I think that General Dynamics maybe has had better relations with the Congress, better relations with the Pentagon. And today, I say to Mr. Jones, resign, Mr. Jones. We need new management. And I would hope that you would share that outrage and go back to, to Secretary Cheney and that he would share it also and communicate it to, uh, to Mr. Jones and the people running Northrop. Will you do that? I, I want to ask you again. I, I, I'm sure that the... Uh, do you the, think the, that Northrop should have new management, yes or no? Uh, as I tried to point out earlier, uh, out of the 50 top boxes, uh, there has been a... Uh, there has been a since, in, since 87, there's been a significant turnover. 
Okay, you're well, talking about you're not one answering my question, Mr. Betty. Here you are, I'll the to, Under I'm Secretary sorry. of Defense for Acquisition. And I just want to get a basic answer to a very simple question. We have a man running Northrop Corporation that's doing billions of dollars worth of business with the, with the Department of Defense. You're the responsible for signing contracts and approving this business. And this man refuses to come before a key congressional oversight committee and answer basic questions without asserting his Fifth Amendment right. And I'm asking you as the Under Secretary of Defense, if you are prepared to tell Mr. Jones that business with the Pentagon or Northrop is in jeopardy unless you are willing, Mr. Jones, to testify before this committee and answer basic questions about the, these issues that we have before us. That's all I'm asking you. Are you prepared to do that? No. Well, that, that, that is a sad commentary, I think, well, Mr. I, Betty. I, I'm sorry, but there's, uh, I, I don't see that my job is to act as an instru instrument of a particular congressman to depose uh, I'm not asking a, you to do a, that. A, a, what I'm asking you to do, Mr. Betty, is be vigorous and, and share my outrage in dealing with these people. And here is a, 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 the chairman of the board of this corporation that's doing billions of dollars worth of business with the government, that has a record of impropriety, and the company has pleaded guilty to 34 counts of falsifying tests, and this person refuses to testify before this committee. And all I'm saying is, why won't you get on the phone and say, Mr. Jones, why won't you go before that committee? This, this committee has subpoena power. Bring him in. Should we do that? Would you like to see us do That's that? up to you. Okay. I'm really surprised that you are not willing to be more vigorous in, in pursuing him. And do, do, doesn't this raise serious questions about whether you should continue to do business with him? Uh, yes or no? How, how do I, I keep answering the same question, I feel, Mr. Congressman? I think that it's not a question of doing business with him. We're doing business with the corporation. Oh, come on. You know, that, that's the same kind of apologetic conduct that's just totally unacceptable. The person running that corporation is responsible for that corporation, the, just like Mr. the President of the United Mr. States and, and other people that are responsible for, for running organizations. And, and uh, if you have a problem with the organization, you have a problem with the person in charge, and Mr. Jones is in charge. I, I, and any suggestion that, to the contrary may, is just unacceptable. That, that may, that may, the gentleman has expired. The uh, chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Bryant. Ma'am, ma just make one small comment. Yes, sir. You certainly it's may. My, it's my understanding that uh, Mr. Jones is no longer the CEO of the company. And uh, on that, chairman he's of the, chairman of the board. He's chairman the, of the board. But the chief executive officer, I believe, is now Mr. Cressa. Uh, the, the same goes for both of them, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but the that, chairman that of the board is the chairman of the board. And chairman he's running. But not the chief. And, well. the, and the CEO refused to show up today as well, just for the record. So they're, I, you know, okay. they're the same as far as I'm concerned. The uh, time the gentleman has expired. Gentleman from Texas. Mr. Betty, uh, are you a member of the board that makes decisions with regard to debarment? No, the, uh, the mm. board, uh, we have boards in each of the services and in the uh, Defense Logistics Agency. The, um, the head of those boards are, uh, are people at various levels that are in the contracting or, um, or um, I, gu I guess it's primarily the contracting activity. I'm not a member of the board. Uh, each of the services and the DLA have uh, specific debarment officers uh, who okay, will well, make it, those judgments. Well, there's a board, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't there a board presently considering whether or not to debar Northrop? Isn't that a pending in, in matter? The Air, in the Air Force, that's correct. What do you call that board so we can be talking about the same it's, thing? Uh, I think it's a suspension and debarment board. The what? I believe it's called a suspension and debarment board. Okay, now, whether that's the exact title in each of the services, I'm not sure. And the, and the question of whether to debar Northrop is now under consideration, is that correct? Well, not to debar Northrop. The, uh, what's uh, under consideration is there's a, actually a suspension of the Precision Products Division of Northrop, is my understanding. The question is whether uh, it's uh, appropriate to lift that uh, suspension because the suspension is a temporary thing. I mean, it's up to... So you mean there's no does. consideration being given now to debarring Northrop? Not to my knowledge. Well, the Justice Department was talking in terms of debarring. I, they were here I just know. a moment ago. I don't know of any action to debar the corporation. 
Are you going to recommend it that it be considered? I have I have no evidence or no uh, reason to make that recommendation. <laughs> you have no evidence and no reason to make that recommendation. Can't act on allegations, uh, Mr. Congressman. Mr. Betty, what is your understanding of the criminal grand jury investigating Northrop's behavior on the F-18 contract? Uh, as you know, recently the Justice Department and the FBI conducted a raid of that plant. Did you know that? Yes, sir. And during the raid they conducted on the plant, uh, where for one of the first times in uh, memory, they actually went down to the production line and pulled out parts that, that uh, were thought to be suspect and potentially defective or substandard. Are you aware of that? I'm not aware of that detail action, but I'm not surprised. Well, what is your understanding of the criminal grand jury investigating their behavior on the F-18 contract? I just that. That there was a raid and there's some kind of an, and there is an investigation. That's all the details I have. You mean you, you don't know, you, did you inquire further to find out what's going on? No, I didn't. You did not inquire? I did not inquire. You mean to tell me you're told that the FBI raids a production plant where a defense contractor is under suspicion for defrauding the taxpayer and you're in charge and you didn't ask anybody any questions about what was going on? There's an investigation going on as, uh, as the information, as the uh, Justice Department is willing to release information to us, then we'll review that information. They're not always uh, uh, willing to, nor, nor is it appropriate for them to release information that they have. You know, to carry out the search warrants, they need to have affidavits to take to the judge to show there's probable cause. Uh, did you uh, play any role in helping them gather those affidavits? No, uh, uh, that their role may have been played. I did not personally, know. Did you hear about it ahead of time? I did not. Have you looked at the affidavits? No, they're not always available to us either. Did but you I, ask? I have not. No, I have not. You mean you didn't even check to see if they were available to you? I'm there. Now, somebody swore to an affidavit that there was criminal behavior taking place down there in this plant. A, a federal district judge had to believe it to authorize the search warrant. The warrant was carried out in a raid, and you didn't ask to see the affidavits to find out what criminal behavior was being alleged? You really, Did you? I did not. On June 8, 1990, Northrop's managers of their facility that maintains and repairs aircraft parts under contract to the Air Force at, among other places, Warner Robins Air Logistics Center, pled guilty to mischarging the U.S. Air Force for labor costs uh, on these contracts. Were you aware uh, of that guilty plea by another Northrop manager? I personally was not aware of it. It may come as a but surprise to you, but I don't. Uh, I, there, there are uh, there are enough things going on that I don't pursue each individual action that happens within the acquisition process. You're, you're coming to this committee and representing that 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 we should continue having a contract with the Northrop Corporation because you say everything is hunky dory and you haven't even asked any questions. The specific questions I asked had to not to do with the uh, criminal uh, or, or the investigations that were going on in specific areas that had to do. <laughs> Mr. Betty, if you, Gee, I, I guess if I they can't, carried I guess out a raid at Ford answer. Motor Company when you were working for Ford, pardon me. If the FBI had carried out a raid at Ford Motor Company and carried off parts, would you have not asked some questions about what the raid was all about? Wouldn't the company lawyers have gone to find out what was going on and fully brief you about what was taking place? They probably would have. Then why didn't that happen when you were working for the taxpayers? Well, it, uh, it may have at the uh, levels that follow this on an ongoing basis. What levels follow this on an ongoing basis? We have a, a service acquisition executive that, uh, that uh, worked for the Air Force. Well, did he follow it? I have no idea. I why? Know. Why didn't you call and ask him? Why didn't I call Why don't you him? know whether or not those levels have been following this? I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> My time has expired. I yield, yeah. Didn't you come here and testify that uh, under oath that you were confidence, con you, were, you have uh, confidence in the oversight process sees and they are functioning well, and then you described them? 
And now you just related how you don't, you don't check up on them in reality. What I, uh, what I specifically um, testified to is the fact that I had reviewed with the people on the, on the scene uh, just what they're, uh, uh, what they are doing. If, if you recall correctly, I said uh, that I asked them. Uh, no, no. One is there proper management, control process, procedures, disciplines, and go place? back to your statement to about confidence in the oversight processes and that and they, they are functioning specifically, well. Specifically, I, I say here the DPRO commander, supported by the DCAA resident auditor, told me they have confidence in the oversight processes and they are functioning well. And you I believe that? I believed it, yes. What about all the stuff you've heard today? About why I didn't ask specific questions on a raid? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's about uh, these felons working at this corporation, replaced as managers, this corporation found guilty of fraud and, and uh, uh, falsification of tests of these, this company, the prosecutors who have lived and breathed and died with in, in this case for several years, telling you that there, there are big problems here, and then you have the nerve to come to here and say there's no evidence. We ask you, what about this evidence? You say, I don't know about this. You say, but there's no evidence to take action against Northrop. We point to more evidence. You say, I don't know about that evidence. But do your other people know about that evidence? I don't know whether those people know about that evidence. What do, you, what do you know? What do you do? That's a good one. <laughs> well, what's the answer? I, the answer is I don't know. Thank you, Mr. Cut. Chairman. Cut. Uh, the chair observes that the time of the gentleman has expired. Mr. Betty, the chair ha and the committee have to go over the floor and vote. This time we're going to go over and be back in 15 minutes because uh, I think everybody needs a little break here. <laughs> so the committee will stand in recess for 15 minutes, and we will all be back together in the same room at that time. Thank you, Mr. Betty. Please stands in recess. As the committee takes a break, we will turn to some programming information right now and return to the hearing in just a few minutes. From the nation's capital, you're watching C-SPAN. We're taking a short break now to update our program schedule, and we invite you to join us Sunday for live coverage of the National Governors Association Summer Meeting in Mobile, Alabama. Our coverage begins at 11 a.m. Eastern Time on Sunday and will include NGA task force meetings as well as live call-in programs with governors. That's live coverage of the National Governors Association meeting Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Looking at the schedule for the next few hours, coming up shortly we will resume our coverage of the hearing in the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigation. The subcommittee is focusing on defense contracting practices of the Northrop Corporation. Just after that, it's remarks by House Majority Leader Richard Gebhardt, who discusses the status of budget negotiations between the White House and Congress. Then we'll air remarks by Robert Kimmett, the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs. He discusses recent developments in anti-terrorism. That begins at 1.55 a.m. Eastern Time, 10.55 p.m. Pacific. Finally, we'll turn to a discussion about media coverage of the African American community and awareness of racial stereotypes and news judgment when covering minorities. Our guests are William Drummond of the University of California, Tom Porter, Director of Programming for WPFW-FM Radio, and Adrian Washington, Deputy Metropolitan Editor of the Washington Times. That's a brief look at the C-SPAN schedule. Thanks for joining us. Monday on C-SPAN, from the National Governors Association in Mobile, Alabama, a call-in program with Governor Douglas Wilder, Democrat of Virginia. The Governor's annual summer meeting has been called to explore the areas of education and the environment. Phone in with your questions and comments Monday on C-SPAN, beginning at 8.45 a.m. Eastern Time, 5.45 Pacific Time. <laughs> We now return to the hearing in the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigation, chaired by Congressman John Dingell of Michigan. Mr. Betty, welcome back to the committee. The chair is going to recognize Mr. Shea. Delighted to be back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I just You're again, good 
And I again want to thank you for the privilege uh, and courtesy you're extending me, allowing me to sit on these hearings and to recognize that this is an issue you've worked on eight years. And I'm uh, a Johnny come lately. Uh, Mr. Betty, I have some sympathy for you. I'm a new member of Congress. You're new at your job. But, but having said that, what astounded me was the fact that you were willing to say that you're comfortable, that the controls are in place and that they're proper and that everything is being properly managed. And then with the last question, it seemed fairly clear to me that you really are just on going on faith in what people who work for you say. I got interested in this issue just by reading it in the newspaper, and it seems to me that, that you, you show a tremendous lack of knowledge, and I don't mean disrespect, but for someone in your position to know enough about Northrop. And I even have a problem with the logic, and I just want to pursue a few a, a logic with how you see this. I want to know if the Department of Justice consulted in any way with you and the, uh, and the Department of Con uh, Defense with regard to Northrop and whether their contracts should be renewed or continued or whether you should have new contracts with Northrop. Whether the current contracts? Take the current and then let's talk about the you know, additional contracts in the future uh, that they may be uh, seeking to have. For instance, the advanced tactical fighter, uh, which Northrop and McDonnell are doing jointly in competition with Lockheed and Boeing. Did the Justice Department consult with you in any way or any of your people with regard to doing further business with Northrop? Congressman, we have uh, ongoing dialogue uh, between uh, our people, uh, the, um, uh, both um, at the service level and at the um, uh, general counsel level of uh, of uh, the Department of Defense, and I believe, although I'm not sure, including the IG level, uh, I don't know that uh, they have specifically discussed uh, additional contracts with uh, Northrop or not. Uh, I don't know that they have had uh, occasion to. In, case of, in the case of breaking existing contracts, I would doubt very much that that conversation has taken place, but I have no direct so, knowledge. Okay, but you're head of acquisitions, an extraordinarily powerful job, and it's your testimony to us that you, it, n no information has reached you that uh, the jo Department of Justice uh, has recommended to you or to anyone uh, in your offices uh, the discontinuation of any present projects and uh, any future dealings with Northrop? That information has not reached me. That's correct. Um, I'd like to ask you if you would run through again the logic uh, that you had with Mr. Bliley. Mr. Bliley said something I thought was very interesting. He made the point that Northrop got a contract and that they had certain standards and certain rules that they had to follow. He made the point, I think, fairly clearly that Northrop tried to get around the rules and tried to get around the standards and when they were caught, uh, the Defense Department changed the standards and changed the rules. And your response was, in so many words, well, if those standards and rules aren't really required, maybe we can change them. I'd like you to tell me why you think that should happen when Northrop was caught trying to break the rules and standards. The, uh, uh, I, I guess I, I I don't recall it being in that context. So the, when you talk about breaking rules and standards and having standards modified, uh, well, let me try to describe it in terms, I don't know about the specific case now. I only know what's being alleged. But uh, uh, what I was trying to do is go back on my experience, my broader experience, if you will, in the commercial Let me arena. just have you focus it, though, on something like the cruise, uh, the cruise missile. Well, you, okay. uh, I thought you were after my logic, and I was trying okay. to give you what I, I was really Fine. trying to provide Continue from the a way broader you background. Fine. And uh, uh, the point I was trying to make is that it's my experience that uh, in, in other businesses that it's very difficult to write the perfect specification or the perfect set of requirements uh, initially in a program, and that, uh, that they are so good that as uh, additional information is obtained during the, during the process of that program, that you don't gain information that allows you to make perhaps some different judgments in terms of requirements. I was, I was only trying to use that background to say that it, it may have been that in good faith that the uh, individuals that looked at the requirements decided that with their additional information, their new information, that indeed they could make a different judgment. I don't know that that's the case here, but since there uh, seems to be differences of opinion, 
of uh, what that requirement is. I can only assume that people of good faith are, are coming up with different interpretations. See, I'm pained, though, to hear you make that logic as it relates to the air launch cruise missile, because we know since 1983, tests were falsified. Then Northrop was caught, and then standards start to get changed. And my question to you is, uh, no different than if we went out to bid and said, we want someone to build a 10-story building, and we have five people apply, and one gets the contract, and then he tries to build an eight-story building and get away with it, and then after the fact, we say it's okay, and we find out that eight-story building cost us more than the 10-story building. Uh, uh, Congressman, if uh, in, in no way would I condone the falsification of tests, and I would hope that nothing I said would, uh, would indicate that. Uh, secondly, is if the uh, standards were changed in order to allow uh, that falsification to uh, set, then I, uh, I, I would repudiate that, as, uh, as, uh, and I abhorred that as much as you do. That's not the sense of what I was trying to describe. I was trying to describe a situation where it might have been possible that it was an acceptable situation. The way you describe it, it's unacceptable. Yeah, but I think that's the way it applies to Northrop, and that's the sad case here. Yeah. Uh, it's been alleged that, that people in the Justice Department have been trying to gain access to you and others in the department to encourage you uh, to uh, consider uh, not continuing your relationship with Northrop and certainly not having any new projects. Are you aware of any attempts on the part of the Justice Department to seek your ear? Well, there's, uh, there's no attempts that I know of to seek my ear. I, as I indicated earlier, uh, I asked for a meeting with the officials of the Department of Justice on the basis of a conversation with the chairman who uh, indicated to me that there had been, uh, as has come out today, that there's been a history of where there's at least allegations of uh, of actions I, by uh, members of the Department of Defense that have, uh, that have uh, caused uh, cases by the Justice Department to, uh, to, have, uh, to have interfered with cases of the Justice Department. I called that meeting, and, uh, and it's with the purpose of seeing if we can't somehow do better in that regard, if we can't find a process that serves both our needs much better than apparently the current process does. Let me just conclude, because my time is up. But it's one thing that is eminently clear, and it, it was not my knowledge at first, and that was why would the Justice Department not proceed on a number of cases? And every instance we look at, we find that the reason they feel they can't proceed, even though they feel they have a tremendous case, is the fact that there has been a, what really I would call a conspiracy with the Air Force to lower the standards after Northrop tried to change and not meet the standards, and once the Air Force gets involved in that, we take away the government's case. This has been pointed out in a number of documents. I'm not going to ask you this question because I don't want you to feel you have to answer it now, but I would hope that given the documents you just heard today, that you're going to go back and do a lot of homework on this issue because I think it's, it's an extraordinary circumstance that you're seeing. You better believe it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now the gentleman has, has uh, expired. The chair is going to recognize himself. Mr. Jones, are you aware that the chairman of the executive committee at Northrop has been and is currently refusing to turn over the Justice Department and to this subcommittee an internal investigation conducted by Northrop to determine exactly what went on and which of their senior people were involved? That's with regard to the F-20 sale in Korea. I'm not aware of it, no. Have you, have you requested the, this internal document? I'm not aware of it. I haven't been aware of it. How do you regard that as being a manifestation of responsibility on the part of the Northrop Corporation in its dealing with government agencies with regard to internal behavior of its employees and officers? I, I don't know how to answer that, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Betty, in Alexandria, Virginia, U.S. Attorney Henry Hudson has been conducting a very much publicized investigation into corruption in the defense industry called Ill Win. At the time of the initial raids and the investigation became public, Northrop Corporation was raided along with another of other de defense contractors and locations. What is your understanding of Northrop's involvement in the Ill Win scandal 
and particularly which individuals in the company and or Northrop consultants were under scrutiny. I don't have that detailed knowledge, Mr. Chairman. Wasn't the Defense Department involved in that raid? Uh, it was before my time. I don't know. Mr. Betty, are you aware of the Justice Department's investigation into Northrop regarding the MX program and this subcommittee's hearings in October of 1987? Just superficially. Now, Mr. Betty, that hearing uh, and the Justice Department investigation established that Northrop had fallen very far behind in production of the MX missiles guidance system. And in fact, the Air Force was considering taking the IMU contract away from Northrop and awarding it to another contractor. During the time uh, that I'm referring to, Northrop employees established petty cash accounts from which came unauthorized and unapproved acquisition of unauthorized and unapproved parts. These were purchased by Northrop employees from unapproved vendors in violation of the contract, which dealt very specifically with the quality of the, of the parts, where they could be procured, and methods for approval of both the parts and the vendor. Further, are, are you aware that, um, uh, further I should observe that Northrop employees set up dummy corporations to facilitate these purposes, and finally, that uh, most, if not all, of these parts acquired through this system received either no inspection or minimal inspection. Uh, are you aware of that? I, uh, I read briefly about the, uh, about the dummy corporation, but I'm not aware, aware of all of that you've recited. Now, in that matter, the Justice Department triggered the Northrop Corporation, uh, rather targeted the Northrop Corporation again as a defendant. And in this case, Northrop offered no defense regarding the way the purchases were made, uh, nor did they offer any defense against the fact that they came from unauthorized vendors. The Justice Department proposed settling the count, or rather the case, with a count of conspiracy to defraud the United States and a number of other counts for making false statements, false claims, or false certifications to the U.S. government. Now, were you aware of that? Are, are you still reading from the 87 hearing? No, I'm just telling you about what they did. Oh. Were you aware of that, sir? No, sir. Now, is this is again another case of overall pattern of behavior in Northrop uh, and by its employees. Uh, does this justify, together with the other events we've been describing today, that Northrop should continue to be a supplier to the federal government? Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, those, uh, as I understand what you're reading, you're reading uh, uh, things that uh, have happened sometime in the past, and what we're trying to do is evaluate uh, what their performance is today. Uh, I'm not, not exactly sure how to connect the two. Well, let's, let's leave aside present responsibility and, and uh, previous questions, but let's just talk about since 1977-1978. In, in the case of a number of defense procurement scandals, the Pentagon announced that past performance would be a major indicator used in determining future contract awards. How does that relate to what you have just told me? that these are old events and that are, are, no longer con are no longer relevant to the consideration of whether Northrop should be a contractor and supplier of equipments and weapon systems to the Department of Defense. Well, my understanding, uh, Mr. Chairman, is that, uh, is that the uh, process for, for inserting past performance into the uh, contract decision process is uh, has been has been and is being worked on, and clearly uh, past performance ought to be part of the uh, of the decision process. But uh, also part of that process has got to be uh, what actions have been taken to correct the deficiencies that have caused problems to occur. And I believe that that's the process in which we're embarked on. I won't. Uh, I have no knowledge that uh, it's perfect by any means, but that's the intent and the thrust, as I understand it. Mr. Betty, we have here a situation, and it doesn't make any difference whether we're talking about cost, schedule, or performance, but we've run into problems on the B-2, the cruise missile, the Harrier, the F-18, the F-20, the MX, the small ICBM, Northrop's work with the Customs Service and their involvement in, in the ill wind inquiry, 
Uh, all of these indicate serious problems with regard to past performance. As a matter of fact, I cannot think of a single weapon system that they have uh, sold to the federal government that did not involve serious wrongdoing and almost invariably involved criminal misbehavior by either the corporation or its officers. And yet, we note that, that Northrop continues to be the supplier of the single largest weapons program this country has ever offered, the B-2 Stealth Bomber, that they're competing for the, for the next largest program, the Advanced Tactical Fighter of the Air Force. And I'm curious, how is it that, that, they, can, that they can continue to have such favored treatment uh, in the light of their, of their continued serious misbehavior? Well, I can't speak to uh, the basis on which the uh, decision, the prior decisions were made for, uh, uh, for letting contracts, and I don't think you expect me to. Uh, in terms of their competing for the ATF and for other business, then clearly their uh, performance will be taken into account when those decisions are made. Well, last week I wrote to Secretary Cheney describing a Justice Department memorandum and their findings in the B-2 civil case. The findings of the Justice Department included a finding that the Air Force was continuing to allow Northrop to operate a key management system called the Cost Schedule Control System, CSCS, even though the Air Force knew that it was an absolute farce. In addition, they found virtually no oversight of labor costs on the nation's single largest defense program, the B-2. I'm curious if, if you and I shouldn't just listen to a tape that was done by the FBI and the Justice Department in a sting operation regarding kickbacks of defense contracts where an informant, as a part of his cooperation with the Justice Department, taped a conversation between himself and a Northrop employee regarding subcontracts the, on the B-2 bomber. Would you play that into the, into the loudspeaker system, please? at the end was the two individuals involved toasting each other with brandy sniffers. Now, let me, let me tell you what this was. This was a uh, tape which was done in a sting, which involved uh, a pair of defendants uh, meeting at the house of one of them. And it involved how they were going to make money on themselves in connection with a contract, rather a group of subcontracts on the B-2 bomber. Now the Northrop employee in this stated, and I'll quote, a copy of the transcript there of this is made available to you. He said as follows, we don't have any heads, we don't have any supervisory people. Then he goes on to say, nobody questions dollars or anything like that. Now this is referring to the B-2 bomber system. Isn't that exactly what the Justice Department has stated, being confirmed by a Northrop employee, uh, where the Justice Department said in its memorandum that there was virtually no control or oversight on the cost of the B-2 bomber? Uh, 
I don't know how to make that connection. That it, it may or may, you know, your your conclusion may be correct. I, I don't know how to make that connection from what little I. Well, here's I've heard here's, of. here's a fellow involved in a sting operation, this defendant who says nobody questions dollars or anything else. Now, what I read that to be is a Northrop employee is stating that he has at least himself and four other buyers that are reporting through him that he's able to raise price on, or cost on any given item going into the B-2 bomber by 75 percent above what it should be, and nobody's going to question. In fact, he refers to adding 75 percent as taking a little piece here and a little piece there and not getting greedy. I find this to be very troubling. Do you have a bad reaction to this kind of behavior on defense contract? Well, of course I do. Uh, well, this, now, this was in 1984, was it? Do I understand that correctly? Yeah, this was in 1984. Yeah. Now, this is when the Department of Justice was saying there was very little oversight. But it's interesting to note that uh, Secretary Weinberger was before this committee a little after this. And uh, I believe at that point, both he and the Air Force argued and continue to argue that they had a great grip on the cost of the B-2 program. As a matter of fact, Secretary Weinberger in informed this committee that because it was a black control, or because it was a black program, that it's that the controls that the Department of Defense and the Air Force had on that particular program were better than they were in the in the programs which were uh, open to public scrutiny, to congressional scrutiny, and a scrutiny of the internal and external auditors of both the Defense Department and the defense contractor. Now, how are we to believe that proper oversight by the Defense Department was going on, or how do we believe that the cost controls and the pricing mechanisms of the Northrop uh, Corporation were fair to the taxpayers when we have this kind of information before us? Uh, again, I, I can only react the same way you react uh, to uh, this, uh, this uh, transcript. Uh, and I can't speak to what uh, Mr. Weinberger uh, testified, Secretary Weinberger testified. I think the, uh, the issue is whether we have uh, uh, adequate controls in place today. Uh, the second point, I, second point I'd make is that, the, uh, again, the process we were talking about, the CSCS system, was not used to pay the uh, bills. The, that's a voucher system that's entirely independent. The vulture system, to the best of my knowledge, has uh, is never been attacked as uh, having not been adequate. Well, let's look at this. Here you have a part that costs a nickel to manufacture, raised to a dollar, then arbitrarily increased another 70, 75 cents. You have, you have two people who were involved in this, one of whom is a Northrop employee, Another of whom is a subcontractor, subcontractor who, is, uh, who has never been met by the Northrop employee. Indeed, he's a total stranger to the Northrop employee. Yet the Northrop employee is willing to talk openly to this perfect stranger as to how the two of them will then collude to overcharge the government on B-2. He was so confident that no one was paying attention to costs that he thought he could get away with, with a level of almost 100 percent overcharge. Uh, in fact, at the end of the tape, you will observe that uh, I noted that the, the wonderful sounds you heard was the clinking of two brandy sniffers of the two individuals about how they're going to get rich by overcharging the government on the, on the B-2. Now, again, we've, we've seen an agency where almost every single program is tainted with criminal indictments, uh, convictions, prosecutions, where the uh, former chief executive officer, now chairman of the board, is a convicted felon, where a large number of the people who have left Northrop have left because they were under indictment or criminal prosecution or have been convicted. And yet Northrop continues to go its way while the Department of Justice complains to the Air Force and to the Department of Defense that the agency, uh, that, that your agency, behaves in a way which literally uh, denies the Defense Department, rather the Justice Department, the ability to criminally prosecute because of apparent acquiescence in misbehavior by the Department of Defense. 
Well, again, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, if uh, they can bring uh, specific uh, instances uh, uh, to our attention where we can uh, direct ourselves to those individuals, we'll do so. Uh, in terms of uh, how do we improve uh, the situation in the future or how do we fix the problem we're in, that's exactly why I had the uh, meeting with, uh, with the individuals from the Justice Department. And if they come up with uh, specific uh, recommendations, if we can jointly come up with recommendations, we'll respond to them. We'll try to fix the process. It's difficult to go back to 1984 at this point and change what happened here. Well, the, we've even had testimony, and this record contains uh, statements of how the Defense Department has actually withheld information with regard to test data from the Department of Justice in connection with criminal prosecutions on matters of considerable importance to this record. Now, the, I mean, how do we, how do we defend this? We don't. Well, now, Mr. Betty, the Justice Department has stated that until 1986, there were only two DCAA auditors assigned to the B-2 program at the plant. And you've indicated that uh, you, don't, you don't quarrel with that, with that figure. But you've said that uh, since the, 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 the B-2 program at that time was a relatively small program, how much money had been spent on the B-2 up till 1986 in terms of design, in terms of material procurement, in terms of engineering, in terms of feasibility studies? I, and that I, don't, I don't have those numbers, uh, nor... Uh, do I, I don't believe that it was only two up until 1986 uh, either. Uh, well, I, I did let's, let's, just, let's just project back. In 1989, it ceased to be a black program. At that time, $25 billion had been spent. The program had been on the drawing boards or in the process of, of going, to war, going into production since the Carter administration, which ended in 1980, uh, and, and probably before. Can we say that, that it would be fair to assume that, that $10 billion had been spent by 1986? I, that sounds reasonable, but I really don't know. And only two you, auditors. But the, I don't believe there were only two auditors in 1986, but I don't have those numbers in front of me. I have seen a curve, I have seen a chart of how they added the manpower, and I believe that uh, by 1986, the number would have been considerably more than two, but I don't have those facts at my fingertip. Can I read it? Hmm? Have you got this, George? Well, now, let's talk about the CSCS system. The Justice Department, in its memorandum, made a statement that General Schofield recognized by 1987 that Northrop's management system was seriously deficient and of little use. Now let me read exactly where it says. Here's what they, here's what they have to say about this. Such widespread mischarging is at least possible at ASD because plaintiffs are correct in asserting that, the, that Air Force surveillance has been virtually non-existent. DCAA had only two auditors at ASD in the early 1980s and by 1986 still had only seven. In fact, DCAA did not establish the normal resident audit staff at ASD until 1986. Prior to that, the field detachment tried to cover ASD, but was too small to be effective. Even since 1986, DCAA has not monitored timekeeping practices except on a token basis. Thus, over a nine-month period from late 1986 to mid-1987, DCAA did floor checks of 106 employees at ASD out of approximately 14,000. For its part, AFPRO does no monitoring of time cards, depending on DCAA for that function. AFPRO has requested at least one major audit of labor practices in a large ASD department, but DCAA never performed the requested audit for unknown reasons. Now, how can we assume that this system then is working as you and I would like to have it work to protect the taxpayers? How, how can we assume that it's working now? Yes, how can we assume this system is working to protect the taxpayers? Well, right, as, uh, as I indicated earlier, that's exactly one of the uh, points that I had the meetings with uh, the current uh, 
the equivalent of the AFPRO, the DPRO, since that organization now works for me, and uh, including the DCA 8. Well, Mr. Weinberg, including told the us DCA in 86, head audit, excuse me. The, the Wein, but in 1986, Mr. Weinberger told us this system was working fine. Department of Justice says he was wrong. I, now, General Schofield, I, remember, has been there for four years. Since 83. And General Schofield is the one I talked seven to the, the other day. I'm sorry, I'm informed it's seven years, not four years. I, be, I believe he was appointed in 83, so 83. I believe it's seven. But he, no. he is exactly one of the people I referred to in my testimony as to how he felt about the uh, systems that were in place today and their effectiveness. Are you assuming, that, I, like I am, that Mr. Weinberger probably talked to General Schofield to get his, in, to get his assurances that everything was working well? I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, I have no idea. Well, you talked to General Schofield to get your assurances. I, I personally working. talked to General Schofield. I personally talked to the commander of uh, the DPRO on site, and I personally talked to the head auditor of the DCAA on site. And these people are telling you that this system is working fine? They, the, those people are, first of all, in terms of the CSS, CSCS system, uh, they tell me that it's been uh, validated by all three of the services as of February of this year. Has there been any finding of uh, or any holding of any person accountable for the findings in the Justice Department civil case on the B-2 bomber? Now, the Justice no. Department's got a civil case going in which they're alleging serious wrongdoing, overcharges, misbehavior of different sorts and kinds. Well, presumably, when they finish their case uh, and have proved something, we will be privy to, uh, to uh, that and we'll be past the allegation stage and have something to act on. I assume so, that'll be part of the process. So you're not going to do anything about it till then? Well, uh, I, I don't know that we want to interfere with their procedure. Do are you going to have an independent inquiry to find out whether the people there are doing their jobs properly so that you can determine whether or not you're going to keep them there or so that you're going to replace them? Don't you have some responsibility to see to it that the people who are dealing with that particular program are competent, functioning well, and have done the kind of job that justifies them continuing on the program? As with every other program, yes, I'm sir. Curious, I'm curious from what you tell me if maybe not just leaving uh, just, initi rather, just initiating a uh, criminal prosecution uh, or a civil complaint involving misbehavior of a defense contractor almost cements in place the people who are in charge of that particular program. I don't know that that's the case. If, uh, if, they're, if we become convinced that they, uh, that they are not doing their jobs, then we'll have to act promptly to see that uh, we get the proper people to do, their jo do that job. Have you, made, have you made or has the Defense Department made any inquiry into the behavior of the people who are there on the ground working on this particular program? Well, I have no direct knowledge of that, Mr. Chairman. The service acquisition executive uh, is the one that's, uh, that's responsible for reviewing the management of uh, those particular programs. I'll certainly uh, review the situation with him. So you don't know whether or not the Justice, rather the Justice Department's civil action here has triggered any action by the Defense Department to address the competence, adequacy, uh, or propriety of the behavior of the Defense Department personnel who are working on this program? I have no direct knowledge of that. That's correct. Who would? Well, again, I would assume that the, I, I believe that the service acquisition executive would. Do they work for you? They work, uh, they, they work for me. Uh, uh, they're part of the service, but uh, as, as the uh, defense acquisition executive, they report to me on acquisition matters. What are your policies with regard to it, it, your personal policies or the policies of the Defense Department with regard to persons who are involved in management of programs where they are, where the Justice Department initiates a serious civil or criminal uh, proceeding? Do you look at their efficiency and look to see whether the program is being properly handled, or do you, you, you just wait until, until the handling of the matter by the Justice Department has been brought to conclusion? Well, at the, uh, uh, my policy would be that uh, when, there's, uh, when there's an allegation made or there's suspicion that uh, it should and will be reviewed uh, uh, and we'll take appropriate action. Well, with, that, with an, with, in coordination. Has that been done here? 
Well, again, I have to talk to the service acquisition executive to see what specific actions he's taken. Well, has this policy been put in writing, is, is, or is there any other policy at the Defense Department which relates to these matters? In terms of how to handle the individuals? In terms of what you do when you have charges of serious misbehavior which result in either civil or criminal proceedings by the, by the Justice Department I, I, I think involving that's just, major procurement pro programs of the Defense Department. I, I think that's just good management practice, but I can't testify uh, that uh, it has actually been reduced to writing. What happened after the F-18 raid where, they, where the uh, Justice Department and the FBI went right down the line, picking parts off of fighter planes as they were being assembled? In talking to the uh, D-Pro, what he told me was that he went to the line to uh, try and try to audit his uh, processes or the processes that were in place to uh, make sure that uh, he could find, uh, at that point in time, that he could find no problems with the processes. And was he there, tells me any? that that's a standard procedure any time uh, that he has knowledge of uh, any investigation. Are you telling me that, that there was absolutely nothing wrong here and that the Justice Department and Defense rather and the uh, FBI were absolutely wrong in making this raid? I, I don't know that. They, uh, clearly, clearly there's uh, an investigation going on and presumably they will, uh, they will come to a conclusion. Well, was any independent inquiry made by your office or anybody in the, Department of uh, in the Department of Defense to ascertain if the Defense Department personnel in charge of that program in either this area or in the North of Perry that we've previously been referred to uh, involved uh, behavior which would justify uh, personnel changes or, or disciplinary action against, against the employees who were in charge of that procurement program? Well, again, I'd have to refer to the service acquisition executive to see what specific actions he took. Would I be took. fair in inferring that absolutely nothing was done in either of these cases I, by I the Defense Department to deal I, with the adequacy of the behavior and performance of the Defense Department employees and staff who were in charge of these programs? No, I, I, don't, I don't know that you can infer that. It's just lack of knowledge on my part. Do I have any basis of arriving at any different inference if the, if, the, if the secretary in charge of these matters can't tell us about it? I can only repeat what I said, Mr. Chairman. Well, let's go to the Justice Department's criminal case on the cruise missile and the Harrier jet in the Air Force and the Navy's involvement in these programs. On November 14, 1988, the U.S. Attorney for the Central District of California, along with two, S two assistant U.S. attorneys, wrote General Hansen, the commander of the Air Force Logistics Command at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Now, this is what they wrote, and I'm, and I'm quoting. The Air Force Logistics Center at Tinker Air Force Base has been addressing the issue of fleet testing to evaluate the extents to which FTDs, flight data transmitters, may be unreliable as a result of Northrop's falsified testing. A critical issue that has emerged is whether the gyros in the FTD freeze at cold temperatures, thus rendering the FTD inoperative under likely combat conditions at 32,000 feet or higher. None of the routine tests conducted by the Air Force are done in cold temperatures. The thinking of some individuals at Tinker appears to be that the FTDs function well at room temperature, and therefore there is no need for concern about performance at cold temperatures. They go on to state, we are concerned that Tinker's handling of the cold temperature problem could undercut our legal position. Now, I've got several questions. Has there ever been any action taken by your office or anybody at the Defense Department to inquire into the adequacy of the supervision of this, of this particular program and the contractors uh, when, when the, the Defense Department alleges to you that there was falsification of testing and test data? What's the date of that memo again, sir? What's the date on the memo? November What's the date? November 88. The date is November 88. I'm, I'm sorry, I just didn't research that. Well, can you, can you explain to me how you have good coordination between your agency and the Ju Justice Department when the U.S. Attorney in California complains that the Defense Department's behavior in this matter is undercutting his legal position? Mr. Chairman, those uh, you're, you're, you're continuing to quote from uh, memos of 1988, as I understand it, and that's exactly why I had the meeting with the people uh, from Justice Department to find out what the situation is today and what can we do to help fix it. When, when did that meeting occur? It occurred uh, 
after you talked to We could go today. We could go today. That was right after, I guess, you and I talked on the phone. Correct. You, as a matter of fact, you alerted me to the situation, and that's exactly why I pursued it. Now, Mr. Secretary, on December 1st, 1989, the U.S. Attorney, this is December 1st of 1989, the U.S. Attorney. We're getting attorney closer anyway. Sir? We're getting closer. Well, we're getting closer. <laughs> but what I'm asking you is what has been done to correct this thing? Uh, your first meeting with the Defense Department, between the Defense Department and the Justice Department, as near as I can figure, was right after I talked to you. That's correct. Now, on December 1st, then, the U.S. Attorney and the U.S., the Assistant U.S. Attorney wrote, as stated previously, our litigation concern is, is the Air Force unwittingly made, made, made grant a waiver, deviation, or concur with the PPD uh, specification interpretation which, result, which would result in undermining our case against PPD. Understandably, we would very much like to prevent such occurrences from happening. To that end, it is important that we be informed as soon as possible of any communications between Norfolk to the U.S. Air Force concerning a waiver deviation or spec interpretation issues rising out of the Air Force's procurement of gyro components from PPD. We would very much appreciate if you would if you would notify all program offices of the need to keep our office surprised of any such communications so that they can be dealt with appropriately. We are also interested in alerting the Navy, Army, and DLA General Counsel offices the above concerns. Now, Mr. Betty, despite this letter of concern and warning to the Air Force and the Navy about Northrop's attempt to attain uh, waivers and deviations to undermine the government's legal position, the Air Force and the Navy, in fact, did subsequently issue waivers to Northrop for these out-of-spec components. And they, 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 they've issued not one but two. They've dropped it from 65, uh, from 65 below to a much warmer temp temperature. And then they, then they followed up with a subsequent reduction in, in requirements because they couldn't even make the lesser requirement. Now, is that a fair statement? I, 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 don't, uh, I don't think so, but I'm not sure because that, I thought you said that memo is December of uh, 89. I thought the waivers that have been quoted were uh, well, prior to December of 89. There were, two, there were two reductions of the requirements with regard to the Harrier, and there were one with regard to the missile. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. There were two reductions of the requirements with regard to the Harrier and one with regard to the missile. But now, were, they, were they not prior to the, the date pardon? of that memo? Were they not prior to the date of that memo? And, and the Justice Department complains that they were not apprised of these changes. Now, Mr. Betty, the U.S. Attorney in 1988, on July 8th, and the U.S. Attorney had to write to Colonel Morris at the Oklahoma Air Logistics Center, Tinker Air Force Base. This is part of some of the correspondence that we've been discussing earlier. They wrote, and I will now quote, as you're undoubtedly aware, this office is conducting both a civil and a criminal investigation north of the corporation's failure to conduct certain tests and falsification of test data for the ACLM flight data transmitters. A major issue in our investigation concerns the extent, if any, to which reliability of the units in question was affected by Northrop's conduct. Obviously, our investigations issue de is of this issue depends heavily on close cooperation with the Air Force. It was therefore alarming to learn that the recent developments directly implicating our investigation were not communicated to OSI. It is our understanding that affirmative steps were taken to conceal the new information from OSI, thus preventing the United States Attorney's Office from carrying out its inquiry. The new data apparently relates to a recent test of certain units which raised the possibility that the fluid in the transmitter housing may freeze and render the gyro inoperative under certain conditions. Now, I'm curious, why would the United States Air Force conceal from the Justice Department the fact that the tests uh, indicate that the criminal action that was ongoing in the Northrop Corporation may have resulted in making nuclear missiles inoperative? I have no idea. Yes, what, what, what's the date of that memo? 88. 88. I, I'm July sorry. I, I, again, I did not try to research back. Has there been any? Has there been any investigation of this matter at the Air Force? I, I don't know that, sir. Isn't isn't it important enough that there should be an investigation at the Air Force 
if there's been withholding by Air Force personnel of information essential to an ongoing uh, Department of Justice investigation upon which the Department of Justice feels strongly enough to write a complaint to the Defense Department and to the office uh, of, of the agency, or rather the Defense Department agency in charge of the particular program? Well, Mr. Chairman, I would assume that uh, somehow that memo back in 1988 was responded to. Uh, and the question is whether we have a complete file. I have, I have no idea what was done as a result of that. Well, Mr. Betty, about three years ago, this subcommittee held a hearing with the Justice Department in which the head of the criminal division submitted testimony which stated as follows. Let me offer the view that in, in many investigations we have found, rather than venal or improper acquiescence on the part of government officials merging a mutual reinforcement of interest, the profit motive on the part of defense contractors, and a desire to accomplish the mission on the part of the military. Defense officials may overlook or ignore infractions by the defense contractor, not because of the evil intent or for personal gain, but because of belief that the importance of that project and that new technology has to national security. Now, this is three years ago, but this was the explanation that the Defense Department puts with regard to failure of the, rather the Justice Department puts with regard to the failure of the Defense Department to establish real hard standards with regard to compliance with their own testing regulations and their own acquisition and other, and, and other procedures. Now, this, this testimony appears to be not only current, but it does appear to indicate that this is a pattern which is significant and is one about which this committee has received serious complaints over a number of years. Do you want to, do you want to uh, make a comment at this point? Well, I, again, I think, Mr. Chairman, that uh, apparently there have been problems that have been ongoing. That's exactly why uh, I had the meeting with the Justice Department, exactly why I asked them to, uh, to give us their recommendations on what we can do uh, better in this, uh, in this regard with them. Uh, I believe that, uh, that, as was stated in the uh, testimony of uh, Mr. Richards, uh, there are uh, uh, some tensions out there that are uh, legitimate. Uh, the differences uh, between uh, uh, supporting justice cases, and, and there may be some differences at times between supporting uh, justice cases and doing the job that has to be done, and we have to find a way of uh, meeting both sets of requirements, and I would hope we could do that. Uh, I can't speak to what's happened uh, as a part of the history. Uh, I, we don't have a complete file as to what the specific responses were uh, to those uh, old uh, letters. Uh, but uh, we're, what we can do now is what we can do now, and we're about to do that. Well, I, hope, I certainly hope so, and I hope that, that, that you have great success in it. Now, Mr. Betty, it is not only the Justice Department that complains on these matters. Just this week, our subcommittee staff met with uh, Mr. Derek Vandershaf. He is the Deputy Inspector General at the Department of Defense. And he pointed out to the subcommittee staff that the biggest problem in criminal cases of this sort is either actual or apparent acquiescence in the involvement of government officials. And my question is, what are you, what are you and the Defense Department leadership going to do to get the message out to these government officials that it is their job to insist that terms of contracts be complied with and that nothing is done to uh, give the appearance of actual or apparent uh, toleration or ignoring of infractions against uh, defense contract statutes or regulations by defense contractors. Well, I would assume that's not the first time the message has gone out, so we've got to find some way of making sure they completely understand that uh, that type of behavior is not to be tolerated. Well, I, I, might, I might say uh, that I also met with uh, Derek Vandershaft's uh, boss, uh, during this past week, uh, Susan Crawford, the IG of uh, the Department of Defense, to, uh, to discuss the uh, same problems uh, that we've been talking about here. And uh, again, to make sure that we're all part of that same loop in trying to make sure that we're serving the taxpayers in their best interest. Well, let me read from your testimony. You said at page two, while a number of specific problems were identified by the review team, 
The team found that Northrop's business systems are adequate for proper management of the B-2 program. Now that statement is very much at variance with what has been said here by the Department of Justice in connection well, with their testimony. Again, I believe the Department of Justice is, uh, or had quoted for them, the, uh, um, the uh, old letters. And what this is trying to do is uh, respond to uh, uh, the up-to-date situation as seen by our people on the, uh, on the scene. Now, Mr. Betty, you've said a number of specific problems were identified by the review team. What were the specific problems that were identified by the review team with regard to this B-2 program? Well, I thought I brought a list of them with me because I assumed that question was going to come up sooner or later, but I don't seem to have it here. I can, pr I can provide it for would the you record. Submit, would you submit, the, submit their report for the record? I will do so. Well, let's read here. This is April 26, 1990. It's from the United States Department of Justice for the Central District of California. And this is from uh, the United States Attorney to Mr. O. Kevin Vincent. He is, S he's, he is entitled SAF slash GCP. Um, here's what they said. Northrop apparently has not been able to cure significant testing problems in other divisions, which is evidenced by the two ongoing criminal investigations which are currently being run in this district. Again, we feel the current investigations in, in, uh, against Northrop, including one at the B2 division, bear heavily on the issue of present responsibility. Now, this is not an old letter. And here, their testimony in April is at great variance with what you have said to us today in July. What has transpired between April, when Justice sent you that letter, and July, when you appear before the committee to tell us that uh, their system of management uh, is adequate for proper management of the B-2 program? Well, I, I, I guess you'd have to read that to me again, but I thought what you were reading was that there were some, uh, some problems with, uh, with specific tests. Is that what you read? Well, let me read again. Say, although, say, Northrop apparently has not been able to cure significant testing programs in other divisions, which is evidenced by the two ongoing criminal investigations currently being run in this district. Again, we feel the current investigations against Northrop, including one at the B-2 division, bear heavily on the issue of present responsibility. Well, Mr. Chairman, I'm not really sure how to respond to a statement that says apparently they haven't been able to correct testing. I, I mean, that's, uh, that, I think we need more facts than that, and I can't respond to what he had in mind specifically, and I, if, uh, if we can get those facts, we'll respond to it. Well, are you telling us that you have no evidence of significant problems in connection with management at the B-2? Is it, is it testing or management? Is it, are, you, are you telling us that you have no evidence of substantial problems in management in connection with the B-2 program? Currently. At Northrop? Currently. Currently. Well, that, again, that was the subject of uh, my review with uh, the D-Pro commander, uh, the DCAA uh, head auditor, and the, uh, and the uh, program manager. And that's, that is what I testified to. In my review with them, they assured me that they had the management systems in place. Well, your they program do have some manager... I'm sorry, go ahead. They, they do have some problems, which you've asked me to identify and uh, submit, which I will do. Uh, but that's, that's uh, specifically what they, have, uh, what they have reviewed with me. Now, your program manager is, is General Schofield. Yes, sir. He's been program manager for seven years. I believe so. He gets, I assume, good efficiency reports. During this time, you have had a series now of criminal investigations at at uh, the Department of Justice involving B-2 and some civil lawsuits involving the B-2, uh, which have been initiated by the Justice Department. But have you taken any action to inquire into the, to, to the, to what the Air Force program managers are doing, whether they're competent, whether their management or oversight over the B-2 program is sufficient, adequate, 
uh, and properly conducted? Well, in the, ca uh, in the case of uh, General Schofield, uh, uh, I uh, have uh, met with him on, uh, on a couple of occasions, probably four occasions. Uh, uh, to the best of my knowledge, he's a very competent individual, and uh, I, have, uh, I have confidence in his ability to manage that program. Now, he managed it through some awfully difficult times. And that confidence is not in any way shaken by the, by the proceedings and the investigations uh, which are now going forward at the Department of Justice? Well, I think, uh, sir, that that's, uh, that's an issue of, uh, you know, what, uh, what can he be properly held accountable for? I, I don't, again, with those investigations, we have to know exactly what's being investigated. If there's a, if there's a dishonest employee out there, uh, it's not clear to me that, uh, that we can hold uh, General Schofield uh, responsible for that dishonest employee. Well, has General Schofield looked into these matters and given you any report? Well, I, have, I did not raise that specific issue with General Schofield, so I can't answer that question. Well, maybe Gen what, what does General Schofield do? You've got a bunch of Air Force investigations going on out there, or rather a bunch of investigations by the Department of Justice going on about a major contractor, biggest weapons system ever procured by any government anywhere, and is General Schofield is not even bothered sending you reports on what's going on out there? Well, it, it, I would, uh, if he were going to send reports, he would send it, if he were going to send reports, he would send it to the service acquisition executive, who would be, who would be the most logical one to keep abreast of that. Uh, do you have any interest in this matter? I have interest in a lot of matters, sir. Yes, sir. Do you, do you communicate down to say, what in hell is going on? We've got the, de got the Justice Department investigating this matter with the idea of either civil yeah. or criminal prosecutions or both? Tell us what's going on. Well, the, uh, uh, again, we have a, uh, a number of investigations going on at uh, different contractors, uh, and uh, I do not attempt to keep up to date on uh, each one of them. Uh, even, but, even but if, I, even I if certainly the, have been sensitized to the issue. Even if the Justice Department claims that the behavior of uh, the contract managers at the, at the Defense Department is so bad that it raises questions about the continued viability of the criminal prosecution because of possible acquiescence of, on the part of the Defense Department? Well, when he talks, I, I, again, uh, you've uh, exposed me to, um, to um, uh, correspondence I didn't know existed, uh, and I've forgotten whether the April uh, one that you uh, mentioned uh, specifically talked to the contract managers. We'll make the entirety of this correspondence available, but I'm trying to figure out what's going on. You don't know what your managers are doing. Your managers apparently don't know what Northrop is doing. Northrop is being investigated by the Justice Department. Your costs are going up. Uh, your costs for the B-2 have risen from 350 to 450 to now something on the order of $870 million in a matter of just the brief period of time since it, since it went off being a black program. And, and you've got criminal investigations going on out there, and I don't get the impression anybody knows what's happening or is even bothering to inquire. Well, your testimony this morning doesn't give me any reason to believe that you have bothered to inquire or that General Schofield out there has bothered to inquire. Well, I'm wondering I if this I is a good management style. I, I, can't, I can't speak to General Schofield, but uh, the implication of what you're saying is that the, uh, that the uh, whole thrust of managing a program has to do with uh, knowledge of uh, specific uh, uh, investigations by the Department of Justice. There's a lot more to managing a program, I'm sure you'll admit, than keeping track of... Uh, the, uh, the criminal investigations that are going on. Well, what I have tried to pursue with, uh, with those people in place is control of the programs. And are they, are there, are they meeting the technical requirements? Are they meeting their, their cost targets? Are they meeting their schedules? So now, you, I, can't, I don't want to dismiss the importance of criminal investigations, but I don't think that they're uh, necessarily the most important part of what you do to manage a program. So you just think you can sit by comfortably and not worry about it? No, sir. I didn't say that. Don't, don't they constitute a warning to you that, that all is not well out there? Well, they, they, uh, they certainly, uh, they certainly uh, constitute a, uh, a concern that well, there's enough evidence that uh, somebody is going to devote the resources to investigate. 
if you're back at Ford Motor Company and, and, and somebody told you that, that one, of the, one of the divisions under your responsibility was being investigated criminally by the Justice Department, would you be as comfortable with it as you are about having the B-2 being investigated? Uh, I would not, uh, but I'd also say that uh, if I were back in the Ford Motor Company, there would be relatively few investigations going on but uh, you'd, relative you'd, to uh, what's happening here. If you were at Ford here. Motor Company, you'd rush the telephone and say, I want an immediate report on what's happening out there, wouldn't you? Now, I, I, I would. Okay. Why don't you do that at the, at the Justice Department? Or rather, at the, at the Defense Department, when the Justice Department is doing this to, to a major program well, under a, your administration? A number of these things have been ongoing, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, the fact uh, that they're ongoing should, means they've been going on for a good while. Yes, sir. I'm curious, yes, are you sir. being well served by General Schofield when he's not giving you reports about events that are happening out there and, and involving investigations that may involve either his behavior, your behavior, the, the, the behavior of the Defense Department, or the behavior of, of a major contractor? Well. Uh, my under let, let's just pick the example you've used uh, of the uh, of the FBI raid, uh, et cetera. My understanding is that that information, the details of that information, including the warrants, as I understand it, are not available to us. But you didn't ask. You didn't ask. What, wouldn't, wouldn't you find it useful to maybe call up General Schofield and say, General, what in the hell is going on here? And if, if he doesn't, and if now that you know that there's something happening out there, but wouldn't you want to call him up and also say, General, why in hell aren't you telling me what's going on out there about these investigations? Why is it that I have to hear about it from a congressional committee that hails me before, to, before him to testify under oath about what's going on out there? I mean, I would assume that you would have some modest interest in what your subordinates, like General Schofield, are doing. I would assume that you would have some modest interest about what people that are supposed to be under his supervision are doing with regard to defense contracts, including the largest single defense contract since since the invention of the bow and arrow. <laughs> That's a reasonable assumption. Well, what, what has been done? Has he reported to you, or have you asked him to give you a report about what he has done? Well, again, he reports uh, through the service acquisition executive, and uh, that's the person I would look to to keep me informed. Well, has that it's, individual uh, reported to you? Well, we have not talked about these specific cases. Well, uh, why, why? Don't you think that he should have informed you? Well, it, would have, it certainly would have been helpful for today, if nothing else. <laughs> I, I, I'm sure it would have been. It would have probably <laughs> saved us a considerable discussion here today. But what I'm trying to understand is, now that, now that we've found that it would be helpful, do you have any procedures to require the, either General Schofield or his superior to report to you on these events or not? Well, I. Uh, uh, clearly, uh, I've uh, I've been sensitized to the issue, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to have to do something to make sure that I know a lot more about the investigations that are going well, on. You know, I I I was only, I only got to be a first lieutenant in the U.S. Army, but I know back and this is a long time ago. It's about 40 years ago in World War II. But I know if anything like this had been happening in in the company that I commanded, the battalion commander would have fried my height so that you could smell it smoking still now. <laughs> and he'd have said, Dingle, why aren't you telling me about this? And what I'm trying to understand, maybe that maybe maybe defense management systems and defense management has changed since I was in the Army, but I know if I know if any of my personal staff or committee staff were to be under investigation and they didn't tell me about it, there would be some there would be some some hell rays that you could hear clear over in the Pentagon. Well, I'm going to get into it, Mr. Chairman. Well, does anybody report to anybody on these matters over there? <laughs> General Schofield apparently doesn't report to his superiors. His superiors apparently don't report to you. I'm not sure that you report to Mr. Cheney. Who reports to who when these things happen over there? Well, the, uh, the disconnect of uh, the, uh, well, I, I don't know how to answer that question. Well, I, I think I've, I've, I've done about as much as is charitable today. Um, we will probably have some inquiries by correspondence for the record. Do, do my colleagues have questions? Gentleman from, gentleman from Texas. Uh, Mr. Betty, um, you reported a moment ago that your positive assessment of the status quo in your statement uh, was based on quote, what our people saw on the scene. Uh, these people that you're talking about that are our people, have they been, are they people that have been working there for a while? 
Well, in the case of the uh, of the DCAA uh, individual, he's been uh, there since uh, 1986. The uh, mm -hmm. Deep Pro has been there since 1987. So when you say to us, so well, all of these events happened before uh, I got here, and so I don't know what's going on. Uh, that sort of leaves out the fact that those people there that work with you, they were all there when these things were going on. They know about them. And surely they would have come up in your conversations, haven't they? Well, they, uh, 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 they were part of fixing the problems, as I understand it. Well, do you think the problems are fixed? Well, that's what I tried to report in my testimony, that that was the reason for my meeting with these individuals to uh, determine uh, whether, uh, in their best judgment, the problems that they had seen had been, uh, and they had lived with for some period of time had been fixed. So they told you that the problems were fixed? They told me that we now have uh, adequate control, management control systems in place. I think we have to be a little careful about every problem that is not fixed, but the, the concern was do we have the right controls, as I, as I said in my testimony, yeah. the proper management control processes, procedures and discipline in place, are they being adhered to, and is there evidence of misconduct in day-to-day -day dealings with the company? Those and are the specific issues. And you made your first issues. inquiries about this a week ago and after Chairman Dingle called you on the telephone, isn't that right? Well, I, call, I called him. I called him about this hearing. <laughs> What's the difference? You talked to the I chairman see. one week ago, and so then you began making well, I'm, inquiries. I'm under, I'm under oath, so I can't say yes if you ask the question incorrectly. I know, but those kind of answers don't get us uh, anywhere. So my, my point is, you didn't do anything about this another week ago, isn't that, isn't that right? When the chairman talked to you? I didn't do anything. I, didn't, I did not talk to these people before a week ago. That's correct. So these people who've been here throughout all this time, when all these bad things have been going on, have told you that everything is okay. And one week later, you come to this committee and say that you believe now that everything is all right. I have reported specifically what they told me and the specific answers of the question. Yes, sir. Do you know Jed Babin? Yes, sir. Uh, does he work for you? Yes. In what capacity? Well, he's, uh, he's my Deputy Undersecretary for Acquisition Planning. Okay. Are you aware that Mr. Babin, as recently as last year, was an employee of the Lockheed Corporation? Yes. Do you know what, in what capacity he was employed there? Uh, it had something to do with their Washington office. I don't remember the specific He was the Director position. of Contract Policy for Lockheed, in fact, wasn't he? Uh, I, I don't recall that, but I don't doubt it. Well, I'll represent to you that that is the case. You, you don't recall what he used to do? Why did you hire him? Well, I don't remember the specific job title. No, sir, I don't. What, what you said to me was you thought he had something to do with, with, with... He was in the Washington office is what I know specifically, and I know he's been in the contract uh, area for, uh, for Lockheed. I, don't, I didn't recall whether that was a specific last job or not. Did you hire him? Yes, Did I hire him? Yes, sir. Did you must have had more than one candidate for the job. I mean, I'm just surprised you wouldn't know more about what he did. What, what recommended him to you for this job that he has? Well, what recommended uh, him to me was, uh, first of all, uh, his capability, the recommendations of, uh, of people who uh, had, that had known him and worked with him, the fact that he had some knowledge of the Hill, uh, had some knowledge of the, uh, of the um, industry, mm -hmm. and uh, I thought could be of uh, help to me in trying to, uh, to uh, help the acquisition process. Did you check with the Justice Department to be sure that he was not involved in anything that might trouble them? Well, the, uh, I did not check with the Justice Department, but he clearly had, uh, he had clearly had to go through, at least I believe he went through the FBI clearance. Well, good Lord, the chairman of Northrop Corporation apparently went through that, and he's a convicted felon. So you didn't do too much checking. You know, Lockheed's involved in this ill wind investigation, well, as I understand it. Maybe you ought to inquire about that. How, did you inquire to see if there was any problem with the Justice Department? I did not speak to the Justice Department, no. Okay, now, I want to emphasize I have no knowledge whatsoever about Mr. Babin being involved in anything, but it does occur to me it'd be worth a check. Are you aware that while he was at Lockheed, he was one of the most vocal industry leaders complaining that there were far too many government auditors and oversight personnel in contractor facilities? Were you aware of that? No, I wasn't, but... Well, since uh, Mr. Babin felt so strongly about the overabundance of government auditors and oversight personnel as recently as a year ago, does this give you cause for concern that in his current position, he may be more concerned with the defense industry than with protecting the government's interests? I, I have absolutely no reason to believe that that's the case. 
But what does he does he still man, maintain his philosophy in his current capacity at the Department of Defense? That there are too many auditors in the government? Uh -huh. I, I don't know, but there's certainly a lot of people who maintain that. Do you? I feel that we ought to be able to do the job effectively and efficiently with uh, fewer people in those plants. Well, how, have you been doing the job effectively and efficient, well, efficiently? Uh, apparently not, but that, that means changing the process. Pardon me? I, I said I believe that means changing the process, not just changing the number of people we have there. So based on what you've heard here today, you actually think that maybe the way to fix this problem is to eliminate auditors? I didn't say that. Well, let me ask you this. Recently, as shown in a June 28, 1990 uh, memorandum, Mr. Babin, uh, in a memo to the Deputy Undersecretary Secretary of Defense for Acquisition, Mr. Donald J. Yaki, was still complaining about the audit oversight process. Can you explain why he's so concerned about protecting the defense industry's interests in that regard? That is, their, the regard in which they believe I, I, there are too many auditors, I, and why I, he sees this whole issue of government audit oversight as a problem. Well, I can't, I can't speak for Mr. Babin, but on the other hand, I don't, I don't draw the conclusion uh, that you apparently draw from that analogy. I think that uh, uh, we've got to find a way of uh, doing our business uh, a lot more efficiently and effectively. We've got to find a way of uh, spending less of the taxpayers' dollars and doing the job while still maintaining control. That, so doesn't necessarily, a, that doesn't necessarily mean giving up control. Well, you hired a, a fellow who was a full-time advocate of the defense industry to come help you ride herd on the defense industry. I hired him, as I indicated earlier, uh, partly for his knowledge of the industry. That would be helpful. I'd now like to refer you to a June 26 memo from Mr. Donald J. Yaki, which addresses this issue of whether or not there is too much government oversight at contractor facilities. In this memo, Mr. Yaki states that he was directed by you to form a high-level process action team to, quote, identify initiatives and provide coordinated action plans to significantly reduce in-plant government representatives and auditors while providing necessary oversight. I'd just like to ask you, with what we have discussed here today about the almost total absence of oversight at Northrop and the resulting mischarging of billions of dollars to the government, can you explain to us why you would make such a statement well, as Mr. Yaki quoted you as making in his if, memo? If I accept your assumption of total absence of oversight, it, that absence of oversight was with uh, 161 people on site for the uh, B-2. That's, that's hardly absence of oversight in terms of numbers. That's how many you have on site now, isn't that right? That's correct. Well, you're, you told us that you thought everything was going just fine in your statement today. Now... You're, you're st I'm sorry, Congressman. I was uh, responding to your question that, had, that included in it uh, a statement about absence of oversight. Well, how I'm many saying are, how we had people on board, so if... Uh, okay, if, how many if, did you have in the last four years, though? Did you have that level of oversight on, on board the last the, four years? Uh, in response to uh, questions by the chairman, I indicated that there's been a buildup of uh, those uh, people from the early 80s. I've forgotten what date where there was something as low as two or four on site up to a, a total of 161 now. And, and so that, that was some kind of a buildup, and I can't... Okay. We were exploring what happened when, and I just don't have the, those details in my mind. Well, it would be interesting to me to know how you could judge whether or not you have too much oversight if you don't know how much oversight you had before. In other words, during the earlier years of the decade, in the last five years, you've told us, these problems happened, and they happened before you arrived. You acknowledged that there were fewer auditors at the time, and now you have more auditors on board. How can you conclude, then, that the number of auditors on board is what's causing the problem when you had so few back when the worst problems were taking place? I, I don't conclude that the auditors on board are causing the problem. Sure. Well, did you write the memo suggesting that there's got to be fewer auditors or not? Uh, I believe you quoted a, a memo from Mr. Yaki. Yeah. Quoting my direction uh, to, uh, to find a way of uh, reducing the number of people in the plant while if you, I think you read the finish of that statement said while maintaining oversight, providing you said, oversight. You said to identify initiatives and provide coordinated action plans to significantly reduce in-plant government representatives and auditors. And was it there some more to that statement? 
while providing necessary oversight. Exactly. So my only point is that I don't want to reduce the effectiveness of. Yeah. I don't want to. Re yeah. Let me read. I don't you. want. Let me well, well, excuse me. I'd like on. to. I'd like to finish the answer as soon okay. as. Go ahead. But my intent uh, the, uh, in that uh, in, in making that request was not to reduce the uh, effectiveness of the oversight, is to be able to do it with fewer people. As a matter of fact, uh, my intent would be to improve the quality of the uh, of the uh, product that's uh, that's occurring at less cost and in, de in uh, the best interest of the taxpayers. But you know, there's yes. every process we have, you're like all a, of us have, can be improved. You're like a police chief who comes into a town that. Uh, it's crime-ridden, and they're desperately in need of leadership to stop all the crime. And the first thing he does is say, "How can we do this job with fewer policemen?" That might be a goal way on down the road, but the first job of the police chief is to stop all the crime, and obviously that's not taking place. But well, we not only have to stop the crime, but we also have to reduce the costs and the waste in the total acquisition system. Uh, we have to find a better way of uh, of uh, conducting the whole process. So you're going to have to do these things simultaneously. So you're going to focus on the auditors and the government representatives no, instead of the corporation, which has ripped this co country off with regard to every single program it's involved in. I'm not here to defend Northrop, uh, but uh, I believe that there's uh, there's a lot of things that can be done to help the acquisition process. Can it you would name? be of benefit to all of us, and I think that you people have to be part of that fixing the process. Well, one last question. Can you name a single project that Northrop is involved in with regard to which there is not some pending criminal investigation or prosecution? I have not. Uh, rev uh, first of all, I'm not, I'm not knowledgeable of all of the, uh, of the investigations uh, that are going on by justice or by others, and therefore I can't tell you it under oath that uh, I know of, uh, of, um, of um, projects that do not have investigations. Thank you. Mr. Betty, you've been here a long time. The committee thanks you for your assistance to us. We appreciate your courtesy. Thank you very much, sir. You may consider yourself excused. Thank you. Chair announces that our next witness is Mr. Gene Francis Strong. He is a former auditor of the B-2 program at the Northrop Corporation. Mr. Strong, we thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Mr. Betty. Thank you, sir. Mr. Strong, the uh, chair apologizes for keeping you so long. Chair advises that uh, it is the practice of all witnesses, rather that of this subcommittee, that all witnesses who testify before us testify under oath. This practice goes back to the days when Sam Rayburn first founded this committee. First question to you, sir, is do you object to testifying under oath? No, sir. Very well. Uh, the chair advises that given that circumstance, you are entitled to be advised by counsel. Uh, is it your wish to be advised by counsel? Yes, sir. Uh, and, and would you identify your counsel both by name? Okay, it's Phil Benson. Phil Benson, Law Offices of Herbert Hatton, sir. Welcome, Mr. Benson. Thank you, sir. Um, good. Yeah, you have to pull the. Uh, you have to pull those microphones closer to you. There, you'll find that we have as bad a public address system as you can find any place I think outside of Northrop Corporation. Can you hear me better? Um, <laughs> The, the chair observes that copies of the rules of the subcommittee, rules of the committee, and rules of the House are there in the red and the gray-green booklet, which are before you. you. Those will advise you of your rights and limitations on the power of the committee as you, as you appear here before us. Mr. Trong, if you have no objection, then if you will please rise and raise your right hand, the chair will administer the oath. You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God. Yes, I do. You may consider yourself to be under oath. And Mr. Chong, we're happy to recognize you for such statement as you choose to give. Okay. Mr. Mr. Chairman and member of the committee, my name is John Francois Truong. I'm one of the plaintiffs in a pre term false claim act lawsuit filed by my counsel, law officers of her behalf, against Northrop for massive and widespread fraud that has been perpetuated upon the United States government on a B-2 program. Uh, this committee is well aware 
the Department of Justice declined to intervene in this case because the fraud was so massive that the Air Force had to know, but never took action. My attorney, Mr. Half, said it best, that there is a point when complacency becomes complicity. It is a hard point to define, but it's easy to see when it has been crossed. Mr. Half and his firm are now continuing through the court in attempting to bring Northrop to justice and recover at least some of the massive amount of money that Northrop obtained through unauthorized, fraudulent, and deceptive practices on a regular basis and over a period of nearly a decade. The Justice Department now has allowed us to clearly see how $26 billion was spent on a stealth bomber disaster. What became invisible were the people responsible. Before I describe to you my personal knowledge and involvement with Northrop actions in, North, in management of the B-2 program, let me first provide you with my, my background. I received my undergraduate degree from business administration from the University of Kentucky in 1978. I subsequently received two master's degrees, one in applied research from the University of Kentucky and another one in public finance from Kentucky State University. My first job was with the United States Department of Defense as a budget analyst working at the Finance Center in Indianapolis. In 1983, I went to work for the General Accounting Office and spent the next two years auditing major prime contractors' financial reporting on Air Force contract. In 1985, I left the government and was hired by Northrop Electronics Division as a program office specialist. As a result of my extensive education experience and with the details of Air Force contract, my first major responsibility for Northrop was to audit division's records in particular on the MX program, and then prepare cost performance and problem analysis reports in anticipating a major Air Force audit. In 1986, I was transferred to the Advanced Systems Division, now known as the B-2 Division, and became one of the eight financial controllers responsible for 14,000-man B-2 workforce in Pico Rivera, California. This plan accounted for nearly $2 billion per year in Air Force expenditures. As I had already, as I had already obtained a secret clearance I was not one of the many thousand who read magazines, play video games, watch soaps, also managed their personal affairs for the months they spent on the B-2 holding tank. The cost of security clearances and security procedures on this program alone far exceed most of the total spend on complete weapon systems that were actually produced by other major prime contractors. I quickly found that the holding tank labor hours were only one example of multi-million dollar charges that produced nothing toward a B-2 program. In all my experience as a GAO auditor and financial controller, I have never seen the situation of maliciously organized chaos calculated to deceive through two separate set of books. There was the actual charges contained in the operating set, and then there was one prepared by the Finance Department for the Air Force to see. In the operational set, the frauds were exposed, but quickly covered up by financial reports which were fabricated. Maybe I can break it down to two categories of frauds as follows. First, there was the original ignorance of in inexperienced revolving door Air Force auditors that was facilitated by Northrop's fake progress reports. Second, there was an overall cover of fraud when the Air Force woke up a few billion dollars later and realized that they had been taken. As my attorney, Mr. Half, says, even your Aunt Tilly would have recognized a massive fraud was going on when a million, when a multi-million dollars plane became a billion dollar plane. The overall cover of fraud began when the Air Force recognized that it exposed a total dupe if it started over. The Air Force called it an over-target baseline, or OTB. But it was really an effort to clean up the blood. It happened at least three times when the costs were accelerating out of control throughout the program and the schedule was so far overrun because the confusion prevented any progress. The Air Force came to Northrop rescues before the taxpayers or the Dingo Committee found out. They zero out the books, they erase the financial history, and the OTB go an unconscionable act that probably led to $10 billion in fraud themselves. This program was, this program was at least one-third to 50 percent of total wasted effort. Many of my coworkers would say that the percentage is conservative. The true set of books from the operating department were also invisible to the stealth bomber we ever be. As a former government auditor, I expected to see representative from the B-2 program spouse, Afro DCAA, present on a working floor, making sure that North would play by the rules. After all, in a program where even the costs were kept secret, with a bottomless cost-plus contract, the taxpayer's burden was placed in the hands of the Air Force and Northrop to comply with the requirement of cost scheduling control systems. 
Northrop had to meet contractual obligations and accurate and timely financial reporting if the Air Force were to maintain a basically ability to, ma to, ma to manage and control the program. I found at Northrop's factory of the future, the advanced technology bomber that were under secret construction within the walls of B-2 division was fictional stories written on financial and problem analysis report for the avid readers of the Air Force. In essence, we paid Northrop $26 billion to build a new type of paper airplane that carried this nation's debt to the new heights. This only weakened our defense systems. The reason for Northrop chaos, confusion, and waste was rain in the B-2 program. It's not due to new technology or an expanding workforce, or as Northrop Air Force would have led you to believe, it is a very simple problem. It's Northrop's decision to make the money first and some sort of product later. It took a decade event it took a decade for even the cost to be declassified for the Air Force. Many employees we have spoken out during those years. We, worked, we were censored on the inside by management and on the outside by classified status of the program. Northrop hated wire. They always got in the money they won and never let the truth get out. When budgets was overrun and you would have to look hard to find one that did not, my department was required to do the C-Squared system and fill out problem analysis report. This was the reports that had been absolutely accurate. No other reports analyzed the cost of cost overrun in detail level. No other reports were available to the Air Force for, for evaluating Northrop proposed corrective actions. If they tell the truth, they are subject to Air Force review of the tasks. This could and certainly would have led the Air Force to control the V-2 costs. Northrop decided to lie. This report was falsified to keep an illusion of progress alive in a calculated system designed by the company to manipulate the Air Force Northrop capitalized on the chaos. Cost performance report was, was summarized, produced by Northrop Finance Department based on sanitized problem analysis report and misrepresented earned value within scheduled time period. The CPR were required by the Air Force System Command in the Pentagon. They were the only reports with data that originated from the floor inside of this secret black program. They were the Pentagon's only window to the inside. They were not worth the paper they were printed on. Early in my career at the B-2 division, I tried to establish regular communication with operational managers as required by C-Square systems. I was directed by, man by my manager to ignore the actual data available through the operating department, although this information was critical for accurate cost performance reporting. With declaring truth overruns, no progress, and ramping mischarging in front of me, I was directed to ignore these facts and perpetuate the north of fairy tale. When I refused to satisfy but I refused to falsify this report that I knew would prepare for our customers, my manager understood and fabricated it for me. That he told me that he needed his job and he could not be confronting with his management. I went directly to his manager. He told me to be a team player and sent me back to where I started. In January of 1988, we learned that the GAO was sending out a high-level special team of officials to conduct an inquiry. At the first slide was shed on the black war and bleak story of the B-2 cars. I went into the area where Northrop shows was about to begin, and I saw them bringing the same famous briefing charts that they use on the Air Force. Just by accident, I was asked by a coworker to help carry in some material. What I read did not surprise me anymore, except for one moment of realization that there was no limit to the big lie. The centerpiece of the briefing was a diagram depicting how the C-square system was used to establish earned value and progress. The required performance cost reporting sent to the Air Force to show them what we were getting for their money. The chart indicated that my department, the B2, the B2 controllers, derived data for cost performance report directly from the actuals provided by the operating department. This presentation was blatant lie. It represented the exact opposite of the way we prepare our financial reporting. But Northrop knew that the government relied upon this report to evaluate the future of the B2 program and the show went on. My lawyer, Herb Half, told me to make sure that I try everything that I could inside the program before I decided that I had to act from the outside. So I personally called on the Northrop Corporation Vice President of Finance, responsible for the B2 program, who reported directly to John Paterno, the general manager of the B2. The Vice President, Ken Boto, seemed very uncomfortable when I told him that I was resigning and intend to leave unless Northrop took urgent corrective action and report the truth about how far our control B2 finances were. Mr. Boto, the B2 Director of Finance, indicated that he did not realize that there was a problem with the accounting system. He was very busy but stated that he would get back with me 
Two days later, security came and locked my cabinet and walked me out. It was not unique for an employee who insisted on doing an honest day's work on a B2 division. Management's pain response, response is the employee who wanted north of the terror truth should be called a lock and walk. I sit before this committee today and tell you that the $26 billion price tag is not the result of runaway mismanagement. Management that acts with the same consistent responses, using the same words at every level, is a result of well thought out, organized, and orchestrated corporate plan. Be a team player. North, Northrop's clear policy was to prevent the escape of negative information from Northrop to the government that would expose escalating costs and a lack of progress. This policy was followed daily by the workforce in every department at every level. This caused the Air Force to rely heavily on the B2 Quarterly Program Management Review, QPMR, where they were entertained by north of technical promoters and pitch charts. The Air Force bought it every time, but Mr. Half doesn't think that you could find any jury across the country that would. The proofing charts, pitch charts, they're exactly what they I'm sorry, the proofing charts, pitch charts, was what we called it, and they're exactly what they were. We got like pro promos for North Coast B2 stories, and they were supposed to be the facts. Mr. Chairman, we are here to tell this committee and this country the truth. We hope that as leader of legislative, you will design and pass law which will prevent even the opportunity for fraud like this to be possible to happen again. Cancellation, suspension, debarment, and prosecution by the government are, are the only measures severe enough to stop North Coast from cheating the taxpayer of this country. Mr. Chairman and member of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to address this committee today, and I will now answer any question you can, and may assist you in your investigations. Mr. Strong, the uh, committee thanks for you for a very helpful, complete, and useful statement. The you, uh, chair finds your comments to be um, matters of great concern. I commend you for your courage in this matter, and thank you for coming before the committee. Thank you, the chair sir. is going to recognize the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Sikorsky, for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I understand, uh, I want to associate myself with the chairman's remarks. Uh, as chairman of the Civil Service Subcommittee, uh, we expect uh, civil servants and employees of uh, government contractors who are, in effect, working for the taxpayers to conduct themselves uh, competently and dedicatedly, and also to raise instances of waste, fraud, and abuse. Uh, generally, those that are courageous enough to do that end up getting stepped on. Um, unfortunately, that happens. I do want to take this occasion to call attention and herald your uh, commitment to the truth and, uh, and to the taxpayers. As I understand, uh, you were employed at Northrop from 1985 to 1988. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And during that time, you started at Northrop's electronic division as program office specialist to prepare various financial reports on the MX missile program and then transferred to the B-2 program as financial controller. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And also, you're responsible for, in this position, for financial cost reporting, B-2 position, financial cost reporting to comply with contractual requirements for the manufacturing technology and industrial engineering departments of the B-2 program. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, you began, as your testimony indicated, about two months after you were transferred to the B-2 program to discover memos identifying mischarging practices. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And, uh, and when you noticed them, you talked to your immediate supervisor for a corrective action plan to be taken to resolve these mischarges as you testify. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And your manager, uh, were not, managers were not very concerned. Uh, they've, uh, uh, what, were their, uh, what were their comments, do you recall? Their comment was life goes on. You know, life a, goes on? The cost plus program, we can continue to charge until QPMR, where we have to tell the Air Force more stories so we can get more OK for, for more contract money. Now, we just heard testimony from the uh, chief assistant to the um, undersecretary in charge of acquisition. We just heard through testimony that he believes that uh, there are too many auditors around, uh, and this is a complaint uh, that's legitimate, needs to be responded to. In fact, the undersecretary for acquisition set up a team, just a task force, to do just this, to get to get more auditing done with less auditors. The Justice Department has told us that the Defense Contract Audit Agency 
had only two auditors assigned to the Northrop Division while it was developing and producing the B-2 program for much of the 1980s. Is that correct? From 85 to 88, I would assume two auditors was an accurate number. In your position as a financial controller of B-2 program, how often did you come into contact with these two auditors? Uh, for the three, for AB, from 85 to 88, I never see an auditor on the B-2 program. From 1985 to 86 to 88, I'm sorry. 1986 to 1988, you never saw a DCAA auditor in your entire time, and you were one of eight controllers. Yes. Eight financial controllers for the whole B-2 stealth bomber program. Pico de Vera yeah. division. But Mr. Babin and Mr. Betty think there are too many auditors running around. Uh, uh, in these programs. What kind of access uh, did these two auditors have to program information? Well, they never came to me for information, so I assume they didn't get any information. So I assume they have no access to the program information. But they were required to come to see you, did, weren't they not? Right. But um, they didn't. I was told I'm supposed to be audited by some forms of oversight, but I was never been audited by any oversight at the PT. How PT would you video. characterize reports they filed during the period that you were employed at Northrop? So I said I never seen any report by them. I can't comment on that. Okay. How was Northrop able to supply what was basically false information to the Air Force through its cost, set, uh, cost schedule control system, this CSCS thing we've been talking about, without it being noticed or reported to the proper authorities? Well, basically, the Air Force conducts QPMR quarterly, quarterly program management review. The Air Force comes in once every three months to review the charts. So whatever the charts Northrop puts up for the Air Force, that's what they got. So the, the, the taxpayer's policemen on, on, on the scene were the AFPROs and the DCAAs, right? Right, the Afro is supposed to be oversight. You respect. never saw the DCAAs, um, um, even though you were one of eight financial controllers in the two plus years that you were there in the stealth program. And the Afros were relied on the quarterly program management reviews um, uh, provided by the company, right? Well, we do provide the Air Force with cost performance report every month. But a cost performance report is basically fabricated by management to give the Air Force a better picture of how the program actually is. Did anyone, uh, did anyone validate those uh, QPMRs? Not to my knowledge. Uh, at this time, the B-2 was a black program, right? It was Yes, sir. Uh, various parts of the Air Force uh, were only able to see various levels of information, and, and uh, members of the Congress were not to see anything. You, you very correct. <laughs> yeah, uh, and we, uh, we get a good indication why, uh, but they're a presently responsible corporation, apparently. Um, <laughs> were you ever told by your superiors at Northrop that you should falsify any reports, documentation, or anything else on the B-2 program? Yes, sir. Uh, who, many times this happened often or seldom, or uh, how would you characterize that? I was told that if I don't turn in the information to make the company look good, excuse me, North might lose money and my, I might lose my job. Is that, <coughs> excuse me, is that considered a uh, falsification? You're the auditor. I'm saying yes. Yeah. Did you learn of any uh, Northrop uh, management falsifying reports that you provided them, changing them? My manager, my direct, my, my direct manager does what well, he did every, every time I turn in a report. He made it look rosier for his, his manager? Yes. Every time? Every time, every month. We, we require to report on cost performance once a month. So every month for almost three years, every report that you turned in was, was falsified by your manager to make it look better? I give Northrop the benefit of the doubt, I would say, over two years I was B2, one and a half year was falsification. Can you give the subcommittee some examples of the types of false information that were presented to the government on the B2 program and how this false information was presented to the government? Sir, I'm sorry, I wasn't... Can you give some examples of uh, false information being provided to the government? Okay, I can give you two examples. There are many examples, but I can give you two examples. Num number one, 
on the EAC report on the estimate at completion, every quarter the companies require to indicate to the Air Force how much we predicting a specific project will cost. So what Northrop would do is come in with a very low estimate and since this is a cost plus program, once you get okay to go ahead with a specific project, you can't start charging until you finish your, your project. So that's low balling. You come in low, looks good, then you get approved at cost plus and then you can bounce it up. Yes, sir. Okay, any other example? On the problem analysis report, where we require by the C squares again to indicate to the Air Force where we're at. If we made any progress from our last month report, are we having problems? We, ha we must indicate to the Air Force to evaluate the program. Well, we all, well, my management always fabricate to make the report look very, very nice. So the problem analysis reports, as another example, uh, was progress on problems. And you made the problems, or the, the, uh, the tradition, the ritual here was to make the problems uh, look that the, like there was positive progress occurring and give the Air Force a rosy feeling about how good things were going at Northrop. Yes, sir, and I also want, I want to add that uh, if you have no accurate progress report from the problem analysis report, you have no way of knowing where the program is. You have no way of knowing if they be high schedule, be high cost, ahead schedule, ahead cost. That's the only indication, as far as I know, as a financial controller, to tell the Air Force what a program is. DCAA ever audit these reports? N no, sir. APRO ever audit these reports? No, sir. Not Thank to my knowledge. They never came to me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Sir. Chair, thanks, the gentleman. Chair, recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Bryant. Mr. Trong, did Northrop ever misrepresent the cost and schedule to any other branches of the government besides the Air Force? Uh, as I indicated in my opening statement, the statement provided to the GAO was not accurate. That was something to do with the EAC. I have to say yes. If you misrepresent EAC, you are misrepresenting cost to, to the government. The answer is yes to the GAO. When did those misrepresentations occur? And uh, uh, when did they occur? To the best of my knowledge, I would say the, the first part of 1988. Who at Northrop was involved in those misrepresentations? Well, as I heard testimony all day long, whoever is in charge of the corporation of the department is in charge and is responsible, so I had to point a finger at the finance department, vice president. Uh, did you understand that the vice president of finance at Northrop from the B-2 program met with the GAO because the GAO was interested in how Northrop had accounted for the billions of dollars that had been spent and how the Air Force had conducted its management responsibility over the program? Yes, sir. In 19, that was in 1988, is that correct? Yes, sir. At that time, Northrop misrepresented to the GAO, as they had done to the Air Force, uh, on how each... Uh, the, uh, let us say on how EACs allow the Air Force to keep track of the financial status of the program. The EAC, the EAC the estimate at completion is the tool to tell you how much you're going to spend for the next quarter. If you don't give the Air Force an accurate EAC, if you go in low, as I indicated before, you will get okay from the Air Force to go ahead with the project. So what you do is you lure the contract in, and once it's in, and it's cost plus, you can just charge. It's simple as that. Was anyone else at Northrop, in addition to other financial controllers such as yourself, ever directed to falsify information to the government on the B-2 or on other programs? To, be, to the best of my knowledge, through my discussion with other controllers as well, I understood they all being direct, directed to do the same thing. They were directed to misrepresent true program status on the B-2 program. They were directed to report the status of program in a better shape than the actual shape of the program. When did your employment at Northrop end? Uh, the latter part of 1988, sir. And why did you leave? I, I guess I can no longer tolerate the fraudulent conduct of senior management at Northrop, and I decided to leave and, and leave the aerospace as a whole. Would you describe the circumstances of your separation with the company? 
it wasn't a very happy one. Would you like to go into that? <laughs> well, okay. Uh, I basically was told that I can leave immediately, and I was walked out by security after I turned in all my classified information. You were walked out the door by security. Yes. I left some classified information behind with somebody else, another manager in my department, and I contacted the law office here to have somebody who is clear for the program to pick up a document. And I understand that they the OSI, am I correct? If I can, if I can add to the information. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Trong had arranged through another employee um, at Northrop um, to safeguard certain classified documents pertaining to finances on the B-2 program. And he contacted our office. We contacted the, the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office and the OSI and informed them that they needed to get somebody immediately down there because the person who had the documents was very skittish. That person has also subsequently become a client of ours. Um, the OSI and the U.S. Attorney uh, waited for a period of approximately five to seven days before they got down there. By that time, uh, Northrop Security had basically pressured the documents out of this individual. The documents were comprised of a stack about of a foot thick. Subsequently, the U.S. Attorney indicated that they had received the documents and that they had about a half inch of documents that constitute the documents that Mr. Trong supposedly left behind at the Northrop Corporation. Mr. Strong, uh, while at Northrop, how often did you come into contact with the Air Force Plant Representative Office? Never, from 86 to 88, sir. Never? Yes, sir. The Air Force System Program Office was responsible for monitoring activity for a number of activities on the B-2. How often did they come into the plant? I never see a spoke personnel for the two years I was there. They never came to see you and never examined any of your reports? Not personally, no, sir. What about for the quarterly program review? Quarterly, that's the only time I see spoke people, but that's just a proofing chart. You just flipping charts. When you say spoke people, you mean the SPO system program oh, office? Yes. Okay. Did you ever attend any meetings with uh, Northrop and Air Force officials in which the false misrepresentation of information to the government was discussed? I never attended any meeting between Northrop and the Air Force. Well, had you ever had conversations with your supervisors to the effect that the Air Force was concerned only about the fact that Northrop handed in the appropriate reports on time? Well, I think there's a flaw in the systems. The Air Force actually awarded, you, awarded Northrop $500,000 a year just for turning in 12 reports on time. So Northrop management just persistently pressured the controllers to turn in a report on time regardless of accuracy. So therefore, we just want to report on a due date, regardless of accuracy, to be able to get awarded for half a million dollars for 12 reports. Or well, did your supervisors made clear to you that the only thing that mattered was getting the reports in on time, that it didn't matter what they said? They make very clear to me that a report has to be in on a certain time and they're not too concerned with the, the content of it. <laughs> oh, it hurts. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. This is it, with the gentleman, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I yield. I yield to you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Minnesota. The, it, it, it's important to note that the witness, Mr. Trong, just made mention that the management told him, as one of the chief financial control officers in this uh, B-2 program, that it wasn't important to, as important that the uh, reports be accurate as it was that they be in on time. This is the management that still exists in these programs that the Department of Defense finds uh, presently responsible and is uh, continuing to award uh, millions of dollars, billions of dollars in taxpayers' money. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh. Mr. Chase. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I will be brief. I just want to verify, you, you worked at the, the, the General Accounting Office for a period of about two years. That's correct, isn't yes, it? Yes, sir. And, and so you had somewhat a, a, a sensitivity to the way things should be. Is that not correct? Yes, sir. You're absolutely right. Now, you also had, it seems to me, some an advantage in that you had the ability to know who you might turn to with information. Um, 
Is that not also true? Could you repeat your question one more time? Well, it, it, I'm just trying to say that, that you had a recognition that and an understanding that there were people in government you could contact who would be in, interested in this information. Did you try to contact those individuals? Well, the program was classified, so I wasn't sure I was allowed to disclose any information. The B-2 was not even allowed to mention as until a year ago, maybe? That, that's my next question. I just want to verify the only reason you did not do it is because it was classified information? Yes, sir. Okay. Had it not been classified, would you been, have been inclined to contact maybe your former employers and say, I need someone who you Oh, could? certainly. Okay. Um, I, I would like to, to know then, so there was no one in government after you left uh, you mentioned that you had classified information. You went to the, your lawyer suggested contacting the, the um, U.S. attorney and I guess the, the OSI, that's the AF OSI? Yes, sir. Yeah. And, and so that only related to the issue of classified information. Is that not correct? Yes, sir. Did they say, listen, we want to sit down and talk to you about this? Did they want to know your story? <laughs> no. That's important. You're saying that you, you had information that you felt would be important to them. And you're testifying that, they, that the Justice Department waited at least a week, and then by the time they got the documents later on, it had been given to management. And by the time they got it from management, instead of being a foot thick, and you're under oath here, uh, your, your attorney made this point. Was, are you saying the documents were basically a foot thick? Yes, sir. Okay. And by the time uh, the Justice Department got it, uh, your understanding is it was not the full documents? That's my understanding from... And it's also your testimony today that, that at no time did they say, listen, you have a story to tell, we want to know your story, and they didn't interview ex you extensively? Is it You're referring to the Justice Department? Justice Department. I, I was not even invited to the grand jury. No, 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 let me just, I want to be clear on this, and I'm, okay. I'm really asking, you know, you said you had some classified information they should have. They eventually got it. Did the Justice Department sit down with you and say, we want to hear everything you have to tell us about Northrop? They did invite me in one time, sir. How much after you had notified them? About well, a year later. A year later? Yes, sir. Not, not a week later, not two weeks later, not a month later, a year later? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, in terms of OSI, did they interview you? No, sir. Never? N not. May I have one minute? Sure. With OSI there? <laughs> I beg your pardon. At one time, there was one uh, defense investigator who were there. Uh, okay, so this is OSI did. Uh, how much after? Uh, how much after you had notified them? or your attorney's had? The same meeting I had with Howard Daniels from the U.S. Justice Department in Los Angeles. A year later? Yes, sir. So you're saying that, that the Attorney General and OSI collectively met with you a year later? Yes, sir. Okay. Not sooner than that, to the best of your recollection. And DCA was also at that meeting. Who was? DCAA. Okay. At that meeting a year later? Yes, sir. Um, well, there are a lot of questions we could ask you. I just, uh, I'll leave with that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. I'm sorry. Um, I believe it would be useful if the uh, gentleman were to submit questions for the record. That would be helpful to us. Mr. Strong, Mr. Benson, the committee thanks you for your very helpful testimony and for your assistance to us. Uh, you have presented us with uh, a view of the B-2 that is different and beyond anything that anyone has heard before. We thank you. Thank you, sir. Your testimony has been very helpful to us and opens up new interests on thank the part you. of the committee with regard to the B-2 program and some of the wonderful things that appear to be going on in so far as the taxpayer's interest is concerned. Gentlemen, the committee thanks you. If there's no further business, this committee, this subcommittee will stand adjourned until call the chair. We invite you to join us on Monday morning for a live viewer call-in program with Governor Gary Carruthers, Republican of New Mexico, and Governor Richard Celeste, Democrat of Ohio. That's live Monday morning at 8 Eastern Time. Coming up in just a few moments, we'll update our schedule.
From the nation's capital, you're watching C-SPAN. We're taking a short break now to update our program schedule, and we invite you to join us on Sunday for live coverage of the national...